Hello and welcome to Stream Gameplays where I play games stylishly. Today I finally found it in me to work on something that I've been avoiding for a long time. A proper in-depth combat guide for the Greek series of God of War, mainly the trilogy really. Ascension, while deep mechanically in some aspects, it does lack most of the important tools that were prevalent in the original trilogy. Or it maybe has the attributes but nerfed to death thanks to the tremendous multiplayer. And I'm not gonna be talking about the PSP games because they're not really on the same caliber as the main mainline trilogy so yeah this is gonna be focused on god of a one two and three now for all of you who are unaware i have made a quote-unquote combat guide for god of War three before but looking back at it now it's not really the ideal way of playing god of war for god of war three maybe but even then a lot of things in the video are simply flat out wrong and cannot be applied to the main encounters in the game unless you were a really professional player who could fit that playstyle in some conditions, times, and places. To put it short, the video is mainly centered around one-on-one -on -one scenarios and that is almost never the point in main encounters in God of War. You're usually greeted with encounters that are intricately designed to give you more than one problem at a time, and styling can simply get you into bad spots most of the time. The main goal in combat is efficiency. Working with the tools given to you and using enemies on other enemies is frankly your main goal for like 90% of the time while fighting enemies and approaching encounters. This video about God of War 3 has some useful tools that you can use to your advantage in the main campaign encounters, but that's only about it really. The rest was just combat styling shenanigans that would not work on every occasion. I mean sure, you can play on New Game Plus, have infinite magic and items, but then you're gonna be missing out on the deep mechanics that these games have. The beautifully designed combat encounters and rooms and gauntlets that you're gonna be missing out is just... I can't allow that. And that's what I'm here for today to teach you how to deal with encounters, how to make the best of what's given to you, and to demonstrate that the combat system is all about using stuff around you instead of going full on cancel mode. Now, with all that out of the way, let's start the combat guide. Just know that with all the things that I'm gonna be explaining today, it is only expected to miss some stuff cause there's just a lot to cover so, if I ever miss something, make sure to comment it down below in the comments. Now, with saying that, I will however make sure to include the most important stuff in here so that you learn them. And maybe then you can connect the dots and discover things by yourself, cause let me tell ya, it's all about discovery. These games are so open in the combat department that it's simply crazy how people reduce it to being a fuckfest of square square triangle. <laughs> Let's start. Now, now, what is a better way to start this other than God of War 1 where it all started? Let me first start by explaining the most important thing in every God of War that you need to know. Collisions. I know, take a sip every time I say collisions. Collisions are essentially throwing an enemy to another enemy and that causes big damage. That is the simplification of the thing. And now that started with God of War 1 and it continued on to God of War 2 but then it got this for some reason that I'm gonna touch on later. But basically how this video is gonna go is I'm gonna explain something and I'm gonna give examples on every game that has it and I'm gonna of course explain why one game doesn't have it or one game has it and stuff. Collisions scale with difficulty. So let's say if you're playing on easy mode, if you throw an enemy to another enemy, that might not do the craziest damage. However, if you were playing on god mode, the hardest mode in God of War 1 and 2, Throwing an enemy at another enemy destroys the other enemy. It's just, it's pretty clear basically. Now you might be wondering why is that happening? It's because the harder the enemy... What do you mean by that? You know, the stronger the enemy, the better the collision. A basic example would be if someone else threw an enemy at you. You would take a lot of damage on very hard, right? That rule gets applied to the enemies as well, so that's just a basic explanation. Now with that, we don't just have full collisions as I just explained, we also have half collisions. Full collisions can be done by the main grabs in the game for some enemies. I'm gonna go into the encounter right now and explain full collisions and some half collisions as well. Three weeks earlier, okay here we're gonna start, so... I think it is a given that when I explained how uh, on very hard the game is working and how the enemies work on very hard and stuff, I think it's pretty clear that it's shown right now to you that the ideal way of playing God of War is on the hardest difficulty. Yes, you can play on normal to experiment a little as your first walkthrough, you can even play very hard without knowing all these facts, but the main real way of playing, the ideal way of playing God of War, the real experience of playing God of War is on very hard. Now I explained the collisions and all the stuff, right? Now let's just give a simple example of a grab and then an, a, like a toss, look at this. 
See how that enemy simply flew and he just killed the enemy behind him? It is as easy as that and let's, let me just try it out again. Boom. This guy instantly died. This only happens on very hard. Now with God of War 1 we have other ways of doing a full collision as well and it's the Orion Harpoon. And in God of War 1 the greatness about Orion Harpoon is that you can redirect it. So what is Orion Harpoon? Whenever you launch an enemy in front of you, hitting circle, Kratos goes for a yank type of attack. He kind of goes for, you know, slamming the enemy in front of him that is in the air. And he slams him down to his friends down <laughs> below. So, how it's usually done is, uh, you launch an enemy and then press circle to the enemy that is in front of you. Just like this, like, like that. See, and again, another circle slams him again. You can infinitely do it until the enemy dies. Now, in God of War 1, you can redirect it as such. Just redirect it like this. See how that guy behind him died? And let me just do it again just to show you guys. And boom. See how I redirected it? This is specific to God of War 1. Except for God of War 3 that also has one more enemy that you can redirect. God of War 1 is the only game that allows you to redirect every Orion Harpoon. That's what this is called. It is called Orion Harpoon because, you know, you get an enemy and snatch him down. See how I'm redirecting it? So, launch him, circle, boom. See how I'm redirecting him to an enemy? That is also another full collision. It is harder to land and you, you're, you don't have iframes, by the way. You can get kicked out of this pretty easily if you're not aware. So, yeah. So, we have grabs. Basically, full collisions are, you know, are, are a given that, you know, you have full collisions with grabs. Now, they, these enemies are going to spawn, and I'm going to demonstrate something else, and it's a half collision. While a full collision does a full damage of 50 to enemies, now, let me also explain something else while I'm at it. When selecting very hard, enemy health never increases. Rather, your health decrease, your, uh, their power percent increases, sorry. Even your health never uh, decreases. Your health and the enemy health, they stay the same, doesn't matter what difficulty you're on. What changes is the enemy power and like, and like how, how hard the enemies hit, how hard you hit. In here, your power is 50% and the enemy's power is, I think, 400%. That's why the collisions are so strong. See how the enemy power percent is 400%? The collisions multiplier just, it multiplied basically and we have stronger collisions. That's why if you go on easy and if you toss an enemy to another enemy, you might not even kill the enemy behind them. Crazy, right? That is basically the philosophy. If you're playing on very hard, the game gives you your tools. Now remember these words because these stand for every other God of War. Now let me showcase a half collision and it's done with some uh, certain attacks that cause knockbacks. See how these enemies fly to other enemies? How I killed some enemies right now? I'm gonna demonstrate it one more time. Boom. Did you see that? He flew and he killed that guy that just landed down here. I'm gonna demonstrate it one more time and there are other attacks that also cause half collisions so don't worry it's not just this one attack this one causes knockback and they fly towards each other and they wreck each other this is as easy as it can be because you can do it with every enemy like let's say you can't grab a big enemy you can easily you can easily do this last square attack this one and he's he sent flying towards the other enemies and that's basically it and that's how you get a half collision you know, the, the enemy flies and hits the enemy behind him, and that's basically how you can get it. There are a lot of ways to cause knockbacks. Every knockback causes a half collision. Just remember that. Some, you know, the, you, you will get used to the animation, but it's about it that I can explain for God of War 1. It's beautiful how the first room teaches you about the rules of the game. You know, you have your full collisions in the form of grabs. See how these, these instantly kill the guys around you? And, of course, you have half collisions that can be caused with knockbacks. Now, I'm going to demonstrate one more time in the hopes of knocking one enemy to another, just to show you guys. Uh, right now. Did you see? That was a half collision. Otherwise, now this guy is very low, this one that I'm hitting. He is very low on health. Although he got knocked out, but it is what it is. He did get caught in the blast, basically. Like, I sent him flying to his friend. And he did get damaged, but it wasn't a full collision. A full collision is deadly, but a half collision is not as deadly. It is still deadly, but not as deadly. Here is some more demonstration for the full collisions via the Orion Harpoon in God of War 1. Just know that your timing and your uh, positioning has to be right, otherwise you might get wrecked. See how I'm kinda giving myself time and I'm not doing it out in the open to get hit. That is exactly what you need to do to really like be careful with it, so yeah.
and again right here it's like i'm gonna launch this guy i wanted to hit i wanted him to hit me to actually get knocked out of it just to demonstrate to you guys how it works but just know that that you don't have iframes while doing it so yeah now i'm gonna demonstrate a half collision and i'm gonna try to kill this archer by shooting launching this minotaur at him see how he flew and he killed that archer behind him that was a simple showing of a half collision just in action. A half collision is 25 damage and not 50 damage like the full collision. But just know that I simply launched this Minotaur and he hits the guy behind him. This is very important and you need to note it and it can it can make a lot of encounters way easier to you. And here let me just ex uh, demonstrate how a Ryan Harpoon can be redirected even with a Minotaur. Any enemy that you can, uh, a Ryan Harpoon can be redirected, see? And that is special to God of War 1. No other God of War allows you to redirect it. Otherwise, Kratos just simply slams the enemy in front of him on the ground. He is it's like... Uh, he doesn't auto-redirect it, obviously. See, he just slams him. But with the left analog, you can just turn him to wherever you want. Like, you can do a 180 with him. Not a 360, but you can do a 180 with him. And you can, you can just take him for a spin, basically. I just explained it and I'm gonna give one more example of using uh, full collisions in God of War 1 just to kind of demonstrate how really important it is and how it does beautiful damage and how fair it is like you're on the hardest difficulty maybe you have a hard room there are your tools your tools are simply to deal with the big enemies by throwing the small enemies at them and uh, if you can't grab some enemies, you can, as I, as I just demonstrated back there, you can you can kind of launch them with this. Now, this right here. There are other ways of launching enemies, like, you know, holding the square button. You know, y you unlock it when you max out the blades. And there are some other cooler ways with the Blade of Artemis, but I'm going to try to touch on these by showing it on my uh, video while I'm editing. But just know the idea of half collisions and full collisions. It's essentially throwing enemies at each other. And uh, yeah, let me just skip all this. Now, I want to really demonstrate the importance of this. Look how I'm going to make this encounter way easier for myself. I climbed up here to knock this archer down. And he's down. And now I'm going to grab him and use him to damage this guy. That did a lot of damage. A lot more than you think. And again, this archer. See, this is of course one of my favorite encounters. And there's a reason why it is, my, it is that way. So like right now, maybe like I can surely do this and wreck everyone. And by the way, for Orion's harpoon, you can... Uh, see how that guy got damaged before I even slammed the enemy down? If you yank an enemy in the animation while he's in the air, that one also damages the enemies around you. It's not only the slam that happens that damages them, so... There's also that that makes it really, really cool. I'm gonna demonstrate it even further with God of War 2's uh, Orion Harpoon. And how it's just gonna be simply like, while the yank is happening, not even the slam. While this is happening, you can damage the guy. It's not only the slam that works. And again, there's a half collision. It is pretty simple stuff once you learn it. It's just that know that it's easy for you to do this. Even on, like especially on very hard. Other than very hard, you don't get the sweet damage with the full collision. So notice how I'm even still trying to use these guys as ammo. It's like I'm gonna parry him. He falls. Down here, I can grab him and throw him towards the big guys. And they're basically wrecked. So yeah. That's about it. Hold on. Let me just demonstrate this one more time if I can. Like, you might see the slam actually being the, the thing that shows damage, but in actuality, see, that other guy was next to him in the air and he still got wrecked. So it's not only about the slam, the entire animation. That's why that is a big reason why the 360 is very useful because you kind of turn the enemy around even before you throw the enemy, you're damaging the surrounding. Look, like, see how I'm turning the enemy? That whole entire segment kind of damages everyone around me. Let, let me just demonstrate it one more time. If I can get an enemy to their circle dizzy state, I can demonstrate it. Look. What? See? This guy got the circle on top of him even before I threw the legionnaire at him. So that kind of gives you a cool idea of how cool and how powerful you can be with full collisions. And, you know, the grabs. Especially the, the 360 since it's the most powerful. So, yeah, look. This whole turn does a lot of damage. Does a full collision damage. And then you even throw the enemy on top of all that. So, what more can you ask for, really? Now, with that, we come to the end of God of War 1's full collision showcase. I basically showcase how you can throw enemies at each other. 
that causes, you know, either this or the Orion Harpoon. Orion Harpoon is also a grab. Some enemies you can grab in the air and when they slam back down, they damage the surroundings. So there's also that. And I basically explained the half collisions, how they can be done with knockbacks like these. And yeah, now I'm gonna move on to God of War 2, the game that kind of ruined some of this and ruined the Orion Harpoon, but it still kept the full glory of the full collisions in the player's hands. So yeah, let's move on to God of War 2. Now, it is a blessing in God of War 2 that we have a combat arena that I can showcase stuff in and it makes the process way faster. And now, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate how basically everything is just the same or even better in some aspects since we have uh, some cooler tools in God of War 2 that I'm gonna explain right now. So here's just an average encounter again. Let's say this is an encounter. I'm gonna showcase a real encounter as well, but this combat arena encounter is gonna showcase everything I need. See that big Cyclops with a lot of health? Let's say we're level 1. I'm just gonna grab this. Boom. You That just did a full collision damage. This is on very hard, uh, just like God of War 1. And there, I did it again. And this guy is extremely low right now. I can't even explain how low on health he is. This dog, I don't think I should grab him right now because I'm pretty sure he's dead, right? Yeah, he's dead. You can throw... See the dog throw with the grab? That did, of course, a full collision. Uh, like, of course, 50 damage. You know it. And now let me explain the... See that? That's a full collision on that other legionnaire that just happened back there. Let me just uh, kill the Cyclops. Boom. I'm doing a lot more damage than you actually think, but it's just not being shown really. But this is a full collision that I'm doing. Look, see how I got the circle on top of him? Imagine what you can do to a Cyclops, see? You're doing a lot more damage than you think. You can destroy every big enemy having while having small enemies around. And now basically in here, what you can see is I can't redirect Orion's Harpoon. This is basically the same throw, it does full collisions and stuff. But you cannot redirect a full, uh, an Orion Harpoon, which is, it can be sad, but there is a compensation to all that, and I'm gonna explain it. We have stuff in here in the form of alternate Orion Harpoons. Now, these enemies that I have on the screen don't have alternate Orion Harpoons, and I'm gonna touch on uh, alternate Orion Harpoons in just a second. Just know that in here, the idea is positioning yourself instead of redirecting Orion Harpoons. See, like, instead of redirecting this guy, what I'm gonna do is gonna get back here launch this guy position him to kind of be you know in front of the cyclops to make this a lot easier for myself like basically do this see how this dog if this dog gets in front of me he's gonna die see like how i caught him see it's in the animation i'm not even it's, it's before even the slam happens i killed that cyclops simply by having him in the animation of me yanking the enemy in front now, to the untrained eye, people might think you're playing on easy mode when, you, when they see you throw an enemy at another one and they instantly die. That is quite the opposite whenever they learn about the in-depth combat mechanics that these games have. So here's me playing it on Titan. I have two uh, Legionnaires, and this is what I'm gonna do, and this is how it's gonna look on Titan when I throw an enemy at another. Look at this 360 toss. Boom. That's one. That's one 360 toss, that's one toss to another Legionnaire, and that's two, and he's dead, right? I'm gonna demonstrate real quick how it's gonna look on easy mode. Here is a pretty cute little demonstration on how this is gonna look on easy mode. I'm sorry, how many throws was that? 50? Or was it 50 throws that I just did? And it still didn't kill him. <laughs> Basically, the roles are reversed. When we are on Titan mode, the enemy collisions score more damage just because the enemies are stronger than they are on easy mode. On easy mode, you saw the grabs uh, doing like shit, and here we are on very hard, and notice how I'm gonna wreck everyone around me. Look, it's just like one Orion Harpoon is going to destroy everyone around. And I'm just going to sh uh, show it to you guys. By, uh... See? I destroyed everyone with one Orion Harpoon. It's just that cute. If you were on easy mode, it would take way longer than that. And that is a half collision that I just did. Which perfectly transitions to the next thing I want to talk about in God of War 2. And it's the half collision. And just like God of War 1, of course... 
It is the same. It acts like the same. Knockback via attacks cause half collisions. Now, in God of War 2, it opened the gate for a lot more half collisions. See, that was a knockback. Let me just showcase another one if these guys allow for it. Boom. Okay. Boom. And basically, uh, that is a knockback. Like, even this parry. Hmm, let me just showcase this parry. These guys, see? He got knocked back to the enemy behind him, causing this guy to get to the stun dizzy state. And that is basically another half collision that is done via an attack. Of course, the God of All One still remained in here. But this is also really helpful. See how he got knocked back to these fellas right here? Let me just do it again. Boom. They fly into each other and they destroy everyone around them. It is basically, it is not of course as good as full collisions. Come on, full collisions are 50 damage. Half collisions are only 25 damage. Like, look at, look at this. Look at how many people I'm going to wreck with just this. It is the stuff of life, really. So, yeah, it's it's basically about that. Now, with God of War 2, we have the best weapon in, the, in like, the history of God of War. And it's the Spear of Destiny. Now, look at how easy I'm going to score half collisions. Look at how easy these guys are going to fly towards each other. This simple knockback is, of course, causing a half collision. And it's destroying everyone. This is one of the many reasons why this is my favorite weapon. It's like... Other than the cool damage that it does, it is as well just like a nice little half collision tool for yourself. Like you're knocking everyone back to each other. It's like, yes, you 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 did cool damage with this, but that's not it. You, you can also knock back enemies towards each other and they wreck everyone behind them. It's like that. It's like how I demonstrate. Just like this knockback or just like maybe uh, this knockback that I'm going to showcase. You know, the, the, the ender of the light co uh, combo like this one. It's basically the same thing. It's just a knockback with this shotgun blast, as I like to call it. It's, the, it's called the piercing shards. It is so, so useful. Now, of course, you have other half collision knockbacks as well. And it's uh, this one. Just stay tuned for my uh, wings only one that is going to come out either before this or after this. I don't know. It depends on when I'm going to end this. But basically, this also causes a knockback effect. And you can, you can connect the, the dots from there. Just Yeah, these guys fly towards each other and they cause half collisions. And that's basically half collisions explaining God of War 2. Now let me just explain one extra thing that is going to be lovely when you know about it. I'm going to demonstrate a pretty cool detail for you guys since this is on very hard. These cause full collisions. You know this dash, L1, R1. Look how I'm going to wreck this guy with one of these. Look, boom. And he's dead. I think two of these, sorry. So like one to hit him, two again to hit him. Now, this is, a, this is a full collision. This does 50 damage on very hard. On easy mode, this is the shittiest thing ever since the enemy power percent is pretty low. But now, since we are on very hard, it does a lot of damage. So, that is a pretty cool trick if you want to get rid of these guys easily. I mean, the X, this one, is a, this, this is a half collision. But this, this is a full collision, baby. So, any anytime you get into this uh, Pegasus section, just, just try doing this. See, you can, you can even connect the dots on that last uh, bird that I killed. I gave him two half collisions and a full collision. So, it, it was only fair that I got him killed with all that. And Yeah, I just wanted to include this teeny cool little bit. And now I'm going to move on to an encounter that I can showcase a lot of cool Orion harpoons in it. So, basically full collision. So, let's go. Here we are at the best encountering God of War of all time. And look at how I'm going to use this guy for, half col for full collisions. And how I'm going to wreck this. See like? He just kind of gets in front of my Orion Harpoon. And if he doesn't, I try to reposition myself. Now, repositioning can be hard, you know. I have demonstrated it before. But basically, like, you know, this guy takes a lot of damage. He's just a tank of an enemy, right? What you want to do is use this small guy. And to kind of use him with full collisions and the Orion Harpoon and all that stuff. Like, look, I'm, I'm just going to have my chance with him. He's going to approach in just a second, and I'm going to showcase it pretty good. Hold on, let me just... Let's just clear them out for a bit. Hold up. Or actually, even this. Like, this is a half collision. It's not as good as a full collision. And, it, and you, you mainly want to use the hammer here, but we're going to get to that anyways later. For now, just know what the idea of full collisions are. I think you pretty much got it from the combat arena. Thank God we have a combat arena here. I, I showcase a lot more stuff. Basically, if I do Orion Harpoon, this guy gets in front and he gets wrecked. See how I kind of pick this guy up while he's in the juggle state and I throw him and, you know, the lovely 360 doing a lot of damage. That's basically what you want to do. See, they kind of catch themselves in front of you and you and you basically catch them with the Orion Harpoon. It's as easy as that and it's 
I think it's clear for all of you. And uh, that what I did back there was just a shotgun blast to showcase a half collision. Don't worry, it did hit him if you paid uh, atten attention to that. But yeah, that's about it for God of War 2. I think I showcased enough about the full collisions and half collisions in the game. I did showcase the Spear of Destiny having nice knockback. I did showcase the the wings L1 and X in the air also causing half collisions. And that's about it. So it's basically, again, grabs that cause full collisions or attacks that cause half collisions. Let's move on to God of War 3 and... Uh, it's gonna be a little rough to explain God of War 3, but <laughs> let's go to God of War 3. God, I'm gonna have to disconnect all the HDMI and Here we are at God of War 3, and as you can see, I have it on the Chaos difficulty, the hardest difficulty. And I'm gonna show you guys what happens when I throw one enemy to another, and it's gonna be a little iffy, but I'm gonna show it to you guys. So here's me throwing this guy to that guy, and uh... It is, uh, see, even the guy that I threw died, but this guy is still alive and bitching. Like, he's, <laughs> see? And again, he's not even injured. He doesn't even care. And I'm, I'm even going to try two more times. That's another one. And let's give him another one. And he's still not dead. What is happening, Zesty? Why isn't that, why wasn't that guy dying with, like, one throw or two just like God of War 1 and 2 reason being you you don't have collision scaling in God of War 3 like they did in God of War 1 and 2 now I, I know this is gonna come off as you know a little shitty thing for you guys you're gonna be like okay then God of War 3 is not not as good as God of War 1 and 2 now if you talk about the pro players they might say that as well but I, I of course have God of War 3 over every other game but Yes, it does not have collision scaling with difficulty. So this is on very hard. The throw does not change. Whether it's on hard, very hard, normal, easy, very hard. It does not change. It does the same damage. Now, I've talked to God Mode God. And he has said before that the reason being this cool attack right here called the battering ram. See, this thing does a lot of damage. See how I crippled this guy with just a couple of uh, hits from the battering ram? It's the option where you grab him and then press uh, square and Kratos just runs uh, just runs him through like this. This can be very good. As you can see, I just did like 40 damage to this guy. He's pretty low. I think he's dead. Yeah, he's crippled. This does 10 damage every time I hit him. So that's 10. Hit him again. 20. Hit him again. 30. Hit him again. 40. Maybe if you even connect the throw, that's 50 damage. That's basically as close as you can get to a full collision. So why that happened is... If collisions were to scale with difficulty, we would be so overpowered while doing this attack. That would be 50, 100, 150, 200, and you would just basically wreck everyone in front of you, every big enemy. What the dev team did was, instead of just nerfing the collision scaling to just this one attack called the battering ram, they went out and they nerfed literally every single collision. It doesn't matter if it's a half collision or a full collision, everything is nerfed and nothing is scaling with difficulty so they basically got rid of the original rules for god of a one and two where collision scaled with difficulty now everything is nerfed like even this like see how the how i explained uh orion harpoon causing a lot of damage even this does not do other than it being shitty and not connecting most of the time like See, Kratos went for the grab there. It does not do the cool damage that it just did in God of War 1 and 2. Same thing with the grab throws. Same thing with everything. See, this only does 10 damage instead of 50 on God of War 1 and 2. This thing, instead of doing this knockback... Hold on, let me just showcase it. This knockback, instead of doing 25 damage, it just did only 5 damage. Compare that to God of War 1 and 2 where... This knockback would do 25 damage, a f a, like a complete half collision. Wow, what a word, a complete half collision. Yes, in here we have knockbacks, we have multiple knockbacks. Now, all of that is not to turn you off from uh, battering ram. In here, basically the idea is, you need to favor battering ramp instead of throwing enemies and using the same collisions uh, rules that you used in God of War 1 and 2. So instead of throwing him, you just run him through to the Cyclops. And that's basically, 
the equivalent of a half collision in God of War 1 or 2. See, like, I, I may be hitting him for 40 damage right there. Instead of 50. A full collision is, of course, 50 damage. But, yeah. This is the closest you can get. I want you to take count on how many times I'm gonna hit this Cyclops with this uh, small undead right here. And I just want you to take... To look at the hit counter, really. Just to kind of see how many times I hit him and for how many damage. Every hit is gonna count for 10 damage. So, to make, make sure to count that. Let's just see that. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4. That is 40 damage. If you saw the head counter go up, I think it was even 50 damage. So basically a full collision. This is what you want to favor. This is how I'm wrecking the Cyclops. And just in a second, he's going to get in the dizzy state. Of course, this is what you need to favor while playing God of War 3. You can't really go around throwing enemies at the Cyclops. It does 10 damage. And you don't want to deal this shitty damage to a Cyclops. You want to deal a lot of damage. You basically have the same philosophy of using an enemy to damage other enemies, but different. You have to use the battering gram, which is something I like. I'm not going to lie. This is, I like this. I know if the collision system scaling with difficulty was really cool, but this is all right for me. Like, this is still me damaging this guy a lot. And, you know, it's still tools giving to me to damage the big idiot in front of me that just tanks a lot of damage. That is basically what you need to do instead of Orion harpooning enemies into him or throwing enemies into him. That's basically it. So every time I hit him with this, see, there's kind of a little bit of a screen shake. Every time I hit him, it's, it's causing 10 damage. And now you wrap, you kind of sum it all up with the amount of times I'm hitting him. And it's kind of sums up to nearly 40 or sometimes 50 if you're good enough. And that's how you basically wreck big enemies in here. You don't go around for throws and stuff like the older game. You're like, you're like you don't go for this knockback that would co that would cost 25 damage. You know, if it, if it hit the Cyclops behind him, you mainly want to go with Battering Ram because it is the option to go. And I still like it. Again, I want to demonstrate. While this is not as good as, uh, it is not as good as not even not even like crazy good if you really want to think about it. It's not as good as the full collision and collision scaling system, but it is still good. Like, look at how I'm going to wreck this Talos, see? And then you want to just injure another one of these Legionnaires, maybe, and then grab him and then do the battering ram again. It's basically that. This It is the same philosophy, but just a little different. Now, I would have loved for the collisions to scale and maybe only this attack, the battering ram not scaling, like... That would have been a pretty easy fix, but what they did was they went around and they nerfed the entirety of the collision system to a pulp just because they didn't want this move to be broken. Like, that could have been worked around pretty easily, but it is what it is. I mean, it's still fine. Like, the system in here that, that we have, it is still essentially using enemies to destroy big ones. Like, I'm gonna grab this guy and just see. You run through him and you kind of destroy the enemy in front of you. And of course, I'm not gonna lie, this is uh, still like a lot of fun. Like, I can grab him and it causes knockback, so it's gonna be good for a ring out. Basically, you can do this, maybe hit him, turn around and come back to him. It's basically what you wanna do to cause a lot of damage to big fools. Maybe if you're doing a no upgrade run, you just hit him like this. Like, that was low, you could do much better. Like, that was only 20 damage. Like, let's see. And I fucked it up. Whatever. It's basically the combat system in here. You just want to do this. And it causes knockback, which is good. It causes knockback on most enemies. So instead of full... Co See, he got pretty low back there and it's pretty safe and stuff. It is what it is and it's it, it's a change that I that I welcome. Like It, it would have been much better if the collision still scaled with difficulty. But it doesn't and it is what it is. Like I don't really have a problem with this. This is still fun. But yeah. In the challenge of Olympus in God of War 3, there's also something else that demonstrates this and demonstrates for you how important battering ram is. As it is the only way to damage these guys in here. It's like you grab this guy. I know you can throw him at him, right? But this is a very cool, fun little challenge that demonstrates it to you. It's like it, the challenge, the game is literally telling you, hey, favor this thing or you will not, you will not really succeed by throwing enemies infinitely at these big fools. What you want to do is like, this this actually one of my favorite challenges in all of God of War. It's it's pretty cool how you how the game gives you no weapons and it tells you what to use and the viable tool to use. It's like you have a Cyclops, you have two Taloses, and you have to damage them and kill them with the battering ram. That's basically what you have to do. See? Like it, the game basically demonstrates demonstrates all of this to you beautifully. It's like you have a Cyclops that you have to kind of destroy with this as well. It's not just a Talos. I hit him multiple times back there. It's not. It might not be visible, but I did hit him a lot of times. And there's there goes the Talos, 
And again, there goes the Cyclops. I'm hitting him multiple times and he got the circle on top of his head. And I just rang him out with a knockback. It is very, very good. This kind of keeps God of War as my God of War 3 as my favorite, even though the collisions are nerfed and stuff. It is what it is for me. I still love it for what it is, but yeah, and I just failed the challenge. Wow. You might be wondering what am I doing at Hercules boss fight, and this is a pretty nice spot to demonstrate the battering ram. See how useful this is in destroying Hercules, and I'm just gonna demonstrate it in just a second, so you guys gonna gonna have to wait for me till I reach Hercules. Here we are right now and this dumbass is gonna throw some enemies at me and I'm gonna show you just a little glimpse of how useful the battering ram can be when enemies rush at you. So when you have enemies that have armor like these guys, you can run through them and destroy most of them. It's like most of them are destroyed, just look. See? They kinda stop and they don't get the knockback and you kinda ruin all of them. Sorry. Now, Hercules, the main guy, the, the big boss, right? This is what you wanna do in front of him. Just basically give him infinite- Wow, I just got hit. Give him infinite battering grams and you're damaging him to death and it's pretty obvious from there on. This boss fight pretty beautiful- See? It's pretty- It's just pretty saturated with this boss and he even has a battering ram as you guys- See like- See this cool battering ram? Except it's a very heavy battering ram and he's gonna knock me out I think. We're good. Anyways, this boss fight perfectly demonstrates it and perfectly saturates it for you guys so that you know- what tool is kind of, you know, important to him and it's using battering ram on him just like any other big enemy. So whenever you have undead legionnaires now, or not legionnaires, I think these guys are just undeads. You can use the battering ram pretty easily to your advantage as I'm doing right now. See how I'm kind of turning left and right and I don't know what just happened and how he ringed me out. But that is basically the philosophy of this whole boss fight. You just want to do this and till, till the end then you just... Wreck everyone with these battering rams. It's not just Hercules. You're kind of hitting everyone from the surroundings. Look how fast I'm going to get him to his down dizzy state. See? Every time you hit him. Every small little screen shake. Every time the hit counter rises up. That's just a 10 damage. And you, you kind of rack it all up on top of each other. Until you get a lot of damage with him. And remember. Even the throw does damage. Like this throw. This one. It still does 10 damage. So you can... If you if you if you're kind of good with battering ram, you can throw it at, throw the enemy at him, and you just you know, boom, just like that, and you do 10 damage at the end. Although Kratos he automatically throws the enemy, so there's no need. But I just felt like telling you this since I'm here to tell you everything about the battering ram. So that kind of still keeps God of War 3 at the top for me, as it still has depth in its combat. So it's not just a hit enemy, hit enemy. You you do have your tools and. It is pretty beautiful and I thought like, let's explain it to you guys. Like, God of War 3 still has the depth that the other games have, except not the same way. So instead of instead of throws and Orion Harpoons that do a lot of damage, you have battering grams. And that's, I think about it, yes, here we are. It's just like that, it's that simple and uh, yeah, I'm gonna move on to the next subject. I, I, I hope I perfectly explained collisions to you guys and how they work in these games. In God of War 1, you, you just want to, of course, favor grabs and Orion Harpoon redirecting and stuff. In God of War 2, you're going to favor repositioning if you want to get another enemy behind the enemy that you want. So, there's that that you can consider. Or, you know, the usual grabs and throws, just like God of War 1. Nothing really that crazy there. It's, ba it, it's basically the same formula as God of War 1. God of War 3 is the most, da is the most uh, dangerous. I was about to say dangerous. God of War 3 is the most different and it got nerfed collisions. They don't scale with difficulty. The original reason why they got nerfed was because uh, the battering ram. They didn't they didn't want the battering ram to be broken. So if, if it was like that, then every hit with the battering ram would have caused 50 damage. And now that would have been extra broken and you don't really want that. So yeah, now I'm going to move on to the next subject. And it's that even though you have your tools to deal with enemies you're still going to run into rooms that are going to be complicated, to say the least. Now, what do I mean by rooms that give you complicated stuff and don't give you tools, basically? It's essentially just rooms that you're fighting big enemies at. Like, you're fighting major grunts in the game, and you don't have tools to throw them at you. So, remember at the start of the video, I said 90% of the encounters are just... You know, the game gives you tools to deal with the big fools. Like, you have small enemies to deal with this big guy. You can throw him at him. 
you can do a lot of stuff. You can better ram this enemy to Hercules so that you can knock him down, right? That doesn't go for every single room. And as you guys can see on the screen, some rooms you just have to be creative with your attacks and your magic usage. Or maybe if you're doing a pain run, you just have to wail at him for what seems to be minutes. That is just the thing. You're gonna fight. You're gonna have to come across some major grunts in the game that don't have small enemies around them. Just make sure to use small enemies as much as you can whenever you have them. Use them as ammo, as God Mode God puts it. I basically hope I explained the collision system and the difficulty system perfectly for you guys so that you guys can learn. You know, you know the ideal way of playing these God of War games is on the chaos, the hardest difficulty. Just because everything is fair in there. The enemies are hard. You are hard. My dick is... No, for real, seriously. Everything is fair in there. You are weak, the enemies are strong, here you go, you have collisions, but then you have to strategize, you have to know when to use them, you have to know that you are vulnerable while doing an Orion Harpoon. It is basically the stuff of legend, and now I'm gonna move on to something else about the, the, dif the difficulty basically, the, the very hard difficulty of every game, and is that... In the trilogy, of course, I'm not talking about any other game. Although other games do have it, like the PSP games, and it's that uh, this thing that I'm talking about right now is... Attacks that are unaffected with difficulty. Now, as you guys can see on the screen, I'm doing some attacks on very hard. This is on very hard. Now, the amount of damage, the output, the, da the basically everything about these attacks are unaffected with difficulty. I have explained this in my facts about video about God of War 2, I think. There are some magic attacks that are unaffected with difficulty. There are some attacks that are unaffected by difficulty. However, we have stuff affected by difficulty, like the magic attack of the Nemean Cestus, like Atlas Quake from God of War 2. These stuff are affected with difficulty and they do get nerfed, so if you play on very hard, using other options, maybe using, using Chronos Rage is much better than using Atlas Quake. Atlas Quake has its time, it has its knockback, it's good, it can send every enemy flying around you. But when it comes to other stuff, I'm pretty sure using Chronos Rage will prove more effective. Or in God of War 1, you might think that Poseidon's Rage is gonna get nerfed because of the difficulty and it's, hey, it's very hard, but no. Poseidon's Rage still wrecks everyone around you, it doesn't matter the difficulty. I wanted to get this out of the way, and now I'm gonna move on to the next thing about rooms. Of course, this whole section that I'm explaining right now is all about the rooms. I'm gonna explain other categories as well, and it's that knowing your attacks, and knowing your enemies and their weaknesses. For now, these, this whole collision explanation stuff is just... I needed to get it out of the way, because it is the most important thing. And of course, I just explained the difficulties and how things are, are affected with difficulty and stuff. Now let's enter the first category of this... the first, like, you know, original category. So this whole collision stuff that I just explained, let's count it as a prologue to this whole arc. It's just a simple arc at the start, but but you just need to have it as background to understand most of the stuff that I'm gonna explain right now, or to just kinda have it at the start as the first and most important thing. Now I'm gonna move on to the first category of this guide. Rooms give you tools. Hello? Uh, can you guys tell him to stop? Talking about collisions, please. If he ever talks about collision, bust a cap up his ass. Don't make him talk any longer than he is. And if he says collision... First thing I want to get out of the way is collisions and half collisions, and I explained it basically in full detail at the start of this video. Next, I'm gonna talk about... Ring outs. This beautiful son of a bitch ass game introduced literally everything that you know that I'm speaking about right now. God of War 1 was the first game. Wow, what a moment of revelation. Again, God of War 1 is the first in the series. Wow. Anyways, in this first encounter, billions of stuff are introduced to the series as a whole. And you might just not be aware of it. And now I did say that we're gonna move on to ring outs, and here's what I'm for. God of War 1 gives you the treasure of. <laughs> Redirecting Orion Harpoons. Now what you can do with it is this. Boom. He's out. And again. Boom. He's out. It is simply something of legend. That's why... That is actually one of the many reasons Herisos has this as his favorite, I think. It is just a game that gives you everything and... And gives you your tools. Basically, 
Ringing out enemies is sometimes that you want to favor over killing enemies. In challenge runs, it is something that is majorly favorable. Notice how I'm ringing out everyone. There are a lot of spots that allow for ring outs. It's not just the starting room, but I just wanted to demonstrate how it got introduced in the first room. Like sometimes you want to do, uh, you want to throw an enemy out and maybe you, you ring him out as well instead of just throwing him out. It is just simply a thing that you can do with knockbacks and stuff. You can also get creative with it. It is something, as I just noted at the start of this uh, whole category. See how that guy got rang out? It is something that you might want to favor over killing them sometimes. It is very important. Though it doesn't give orbs, which can be something that you can account. But just know that it is something that you want to favor most of the time since it is also useful. Like, basically, some even in the Clone War... You're, you're mostly favoring ring outs instead of killing enemies. That is something that you might have noticed whenever you see someone do their do the clone war. Either no upgrades or with upgrades the vanilla run. It is something that you do. And even it's like look at this clip that I'm pulling up on the screen right now. I'm using the Zeus Fury to use it for ring outs. It is a viable tool to use it for that stuff. And it might not do the good damage that you want. But it does cause this amazing knockback that can give you ring outs. And that's you can even launch them. Orion harpoon his ass outside. Hold on, look. Boom. <laughs> Ring outs are one hell of a thing, man. They're just so fun. It's just beautifully poetic in God of War 1 how you can ring out enemies in a lot of spots. It is very useful. Use it whenever you can. There are other cases as well that I'm going to touch on later when it comes to secondary weapons. Just be patient for now. This guide is very long and we're not in a rush. You can pull up to this video anytime you want. And yeah, that's about it for the ring outs in God of War 1. Let's move on to God of War 2. Now with God of War 2, I want to explain something. It has a lot more invisible walls when compared to God of War 1. God of War 1 allowed you to ring out enemies mostly in like nearly 80% of spots and rooms that have an opening to the outside. God of War 2 does not really have that as much as God of War 1. You do have spots where you can ring out enemies and they are viable, but mostly, I don't know, it's like, it's not as much as God of War 1, so... That is just what I wanted to talk about with it when it comes to God of War 2, but there, there is like one ring out that is very, very important to do. It can be very, uh, good to use, actually, and it's the... In the translator section, you can ring out these satyrs right here, like, maybe, maybe you're finding the satyr, and you can easily ring him out, and it's... It's all a win-win from there. He's staying down and then you instantly move on to the third and hardest wave. So there is that, but then again, you have to get this high in the air to ring out the satyr. I mean, it is what it is. Other than that, I really can't think of a lot of ring out occasions that will happen. Maybe in the, in the Phoenix Chamber, you can ring out some enemies to the fire. And maybe in the, in the Bog of the Forgotten, you can ring out enemies here and there, but that's about what I can remember right now about God of War 2. It just, just know that it does not have as much ring outs as God of War 1. It is just what it is, and I'm gonna move on to God of War 3 where it does have a lot of ring out spots, and it is very, very sweet whenever you hit that ring out, so let's go to God of War 3. God of War 3 has a lot of really nice and creative cases of ring outs, and I'm gonna showcase some of them maybe some encounters but you're free to go ahead and experiment as well there are a lot of ring out uh spots that you can use for your advantage so yeah let's just showcase some of the ring out spots i forgot to mention that in god of war 2 the best case for kind of ringing out enemies is mainly just knockbacks and maybe throws can help as well but mainly it's just about knockbacks and that's what you really want to use it's not like god of War one where you can redirect orion's harpoon or anything so yeah, and here I'm just gonna approach this spot against the wraiths and I'm just gonna showcase how fun it can be with ring out. So it's gonna be a lot of easy, so a lot of easy stuff. So let's go. Basically grab her and throw her like this. That is a ring out right there. And then again for the other one, if she gets close, boom. And that's another ring out. It's just as easy as that. Even for the encounter, after God of War 3 gives you the combat grapple, which is very, very useful. And you can easily ring out enemies with it. See like that one is out. This one, whenever it goes down to the underground, you can combat grapple her and outside and you can you can do a lot of stuff like maybe, maybe you can get one up right like this and then just simply drag her to the outside world by just attacking. See, she's finally out or you can, you know, do your your usual combat grapple. This combat grapple, is, it has many reasons why it's my favorite. So there is that. 
Anyways, this is a ring out spot right here. There are billions of other ring out spots, mainly the Hades one that I... I don't know if I'm going to showcase in this video or not, but there are these uh, Olympus fiends that you can ring out. It is just basically a lot of fun, and you can you can use these guys, and they are optimal for most spots. Like, maybe if you're doing a no upgrade run, this is the optimal thing to go with. Like, maybe you just don't have the time to whale at an enemy for an hour, and you just want to ring them out and be done with the encounter as fast as you can. And that's basically about how you want to go about it. I'm going to go on to the next spot after this that also has a lot of ring out cases. It is very, very good. Here in the labyrinth, I'm going to demonstrate some more ring outs, and it's basically what you're seeing on the screen. Just... I, I, I favor doing the battering ram first, but then again, even these minotaurs can get a huge little knockback by just doing the battering ram, as you guys are going to see in a couple of seconds. It's like this, you can kind of drive them to the edge. Like, basically, if you have one of these guys with you, uh, you can kind of run one to the edge and just kick him out like that. Did you see that? That is an option. There's also other options that are just lovely in God of War 3. So that, that's just an easy ring out back there. There's also the option of combat grapple, that, which also makes things easier. Like, for example, you have a minotaur. Like, this is not a minotaur, I know, but yeah. Basically, just a ring out. And if you want to redirect this throw to anywhere and not even hit an enemy, you can easily just do the battering ram, then X, and you can throw them to wherever you, were, you are looking. So, that also does make things a ton easier if you want to, like, like, hey, maybe I want to throw this guy that way. And it's, it's pretty easy if you want to do that, so. Yeah. And that's about it. Like, I can show off some more spots for God of War 3 ring outs, but this is the most prominent one. Like, this is really, like, the most useful one, I would say. So there is that, and you can use it to ring outs if you're doing no upgrade runs or anything. And if you don't want, if you want to deal optimally with the Minotaurs, just basically you can, you can do this pretty easily and just ring everyone out. It's like this guy. I can easily just, you know, combat grapple him. And if he does not, he stay, he's staying on the ground. Just launch him and then combat grapple. And he's he's pretty easily out. So that's about it. It's like, in here, you can't redirect Orion Harpoons. So you know your, your play. You just bring them out like this. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Of course, there are other spots, as I demonstrate right here, that you can ring out enemies in. I know there are other options in here, but even so... I'm just trying to demonstrate the most useful uh, strats to... Like, like I'm just trying to demonstrate the ring outs and stuff, so... Yeah, there are other spots that you can ring out enemies in, and I just rang out myself. Anyways, let's move on to the next thing in this category. And that thing being... Boundary Exploits. Now, Boundary Exploitation is something that is simple to explain, actually, and I'm, I'm just gonna go through it simply right now. There are some lines that you cross and like outside the combat arena that you're in and the enemies just go stupid mode. In a nutshell, you cross maybe a line, an invisible line of course on the ground and the enemies go stupid tarted mode and that is crazy prevalent in God of War 1 that I even made a video hunting for these boundaries. They are very very useful. Hell, the other day I was trying, I was doing a God of War 1 Artemis only one and I discovered a new boundary to exploit. There's also another Cyclops cake right here. <laughs> No! The stream! We're getting demonetized! <laughs> Look at that long pubic hair. There's a lot of those. Anytime you come across some, just maybe experiment with them. You might find a new boundary exploit. It can be very helpful, especially in God of War 1. In God of War 1, there's a lot of spots where you can break enemies and stuff. In God of War 2, I don't know a lot. Of, I don't know about a lot of, you know, boundary exploits, but... I'm pretty sure there's some out there. In God of War 3, there's this pretty cool one against these bronze Talos right here. I, I guess these are silver Talos. I don't know. Anyways, it is useful, and you can use it to your advantage. And I used it here, as you guys can see on the screen. And in God of War 1, remember, in God of War 1 is the most important ones ever. It can, it can help you safely petrify enemies. It can help you safely just eliminate enemies overall. So, make sure to use boundary exploits to your advantage if you just... If you have problems with some encounters, although I do prefer perfecting encounters, but sometimes when you're just so handicapped in some situations, you're, you're just better off using boundary exploits, so... Yeah, boundary exploits. Now, <laughs> I hope that was clear.
Next up, we have a pretty quick section, and it's gonna be water pools. Now, water pools in all three God of War games that I'm explaining right here, they break the enemies. What you're seeing on the screen is this uh, centaur room, which is the most important one if you want to use the, the water pool near you. It is pretty easy to break enemies, then you come out, and then you hit them, or maybe freeze them, and then kill them, or maybe you come out of magic. And then again, you're gonna have to come out it's from, from time to time to kind of lure them back into you. And then you want to jump back to the pool if you want to kind of bring them back close to the pool. Because if you stay in the pool, the enemies just wander around as if you're not even in the arena. So that's just that. And this works for, with every God of War game. So don't worry about that. Make sure to use it in some spots like the Centaur one in God of War 1. And yeah, that's it. Let's move on to the next thing. Now I'm going to move on to the next thing and it's going to be spawn rules. Now spawn rules in a nutshell again is just about controlling and knowing which enemy to kill to spawn the next enemy. This one is not going to be just as brief as me going through God of War 1, then God of War 2, then God of War 3. I'm just going to give some examples here and there like. Let's instantly go started with God of War 3 and it's that this gauntlet right here near the end of the game. You can really control the spawns beautifully by killing the undead one by one and not killing them in a bulk. Like maybe you want to kill one of them that spawns the next major grunt that you want to fight. You don't want to just go ham and go all out and destroy every single enemy. That is not that is not what you want to do. You want to just kind of strategize and know to kill an undead one by one. You want to eliminate the major grunts in the game, then come back and kill this undead right here. And then it's going to spawn maybe the next one or maybe you're still like one undead. You know, the undead are these normal enemies. You're just one of these guys away from, you know, spawning the next major grunt. Like here, as you can see, I'm going to kill this guy and then the Minotaurs are going to spawn. Or maybe the Siren or the Wraiths or whatever. And that is a rule for most of the encounters. You know, encounters where new enemies spawn in. Like, for example, we have this God of War 2 encounter. Now, you can make this a lot harder on yourself if you just... If you, you know, if you kill both Sirens at the same time, you get... Uh, two Hades Minotaurs and another Siren. So that kind of makes your job way more difficult than it should be. What you're better off doing is just killing one Siren and then having the other spawn in and then killing these two, uh, you know, together so that you only get to fight two Hades Minotaurs. You kind of have to make encounters easier on yourself. You don't want to really make a lot of things crazier. Haristos in this video kind of demonstrates how you can go by this room without having another Cerberus spawning after killing these main Cerberus guys. It is kind of hard and you have to have three Cerberus seats on the battlefield and kill the two big Cerberus fellas. At the same time, it is kind of hard but there are some others that you can perfectly and easily control. If you're ever considering challenge runs or if you want to just have efficiency in your combat encounters, make sure to know about all these, you know, spawn rules. There are other rooms that also demonstrate this as well. If I ever, uh, if any of these rooms come to mind, I'm going to have them on the screen right now, but... Just know that it's, it, it, it also can be pretty easy when you know what you're doing. It's like, it's like you know, some stuff are really formulaic. And the moment it kind of clicks with you, it never leaves you. Like, for example, this whole uh, gauntlet one with killing the undead. It should be pretty obvious. Like, you're going to kill one of them and then two minotaurs spawn in. Instead of killing all the undead and having two minotaurs spawn and a bunch of shieldy boys or maybe sirens. You don't want to clutter your encounter. You kind of have to go by by doing it kind of smoothly, I guess. That's that is basically about it when it comes to spawn rules. You kind of have to basically know, hey, if I kill this guy, then the next guy spawns. If I kill these two together, then I then I'm not gonna have to deal with another one that spawns after. It is simple stuff. You just need some practice with it. I guess it's not that simple, but come on, what's stopping you from discovering these amazing games? So, <laughs> go ahead. And that was it for the spawn rules in these games. Next up, what I'm going to be talking about, and, th and this is the same category as the rooms uh, that give you tools category, and is the taunt exploitation. Look, before knowing about this, you would be struggling in this Cerberus fight. This is infamous for how hard it is, right? Knowing about taunt exploitation, you can run towards boundaries, but you have to have some range between you and the enemy. And you basically get what you're seeing on the screen right now. The enemy keeps on taunting. It doesn't matter what enemy it is. If you have him in perfect range, in this mid kind of range, you run towards the boundary or even attack towards the boundary. Or even there's also jumping towards the boundary that also causes the enemies to taunt. You can do that and you can easily bypass most encounters. This can also happen in the... In God of War 2 as well. I'm not sure about God of War 1, but God of War 2 and 3, this is certain. 
Here what you're experiencing in God of War 3 right now is the Cerberus fight made easy. It's just me running towards the boundaries, attacking with the spirit. This attack is called the spirit by the way. Attacking with the spirit and just destroying the Cerberus every chance I get. I just turn around and do the attack again and just slam him with the slam attack. It is the things of legend. Basically, run towards boundaries, you cause the enemies to, you gotta provoke them to, to taunt and stuff. So they start taunting, and then you can strike from behind, and they just, they of course they're stuck and they, and there are uh, taunt animations, so you can, they're perfectly open for you to go ahead and grab them, or maybe launch them, or do a huge damaging attack, or throw another enemy at them. It is what it is, use taunt provocation, you use taunt exploitation and stuff. That will really make a lot of stuff way easier for you. It's kind of the way to go about this Cerberus fight if you're doing Pain Plus or maybe no upgrade round plus. However, I do want to make sure and tell you guys that this does not work at every spot. As you guys can see, I'm going to be uh, jumping towards the boundary and running towards it. And these guys might not taunt the entire time. So just know that it does not work against every enemy in every spot. So... There's also that, but you can, you're can you always welcome to try it whenever you want, so... Yeah, that's about it for Taunt Exploitation, and I hope uh, you guys kind of learned more about it, so... Yeah, let's move on to the next... Uh, what do I call these? Next up is something that is gonna be tragic for everything that I just explained. And again, I know I explained it at the start of the video, but let's just go briefly go through it again. Some rooms don't give you tools, so... It is basically as straightforward as I just explained. Like maybe in this God of a One room right here, you don't have anything to, to throw at these, you know, Cyclops enemies. Same with God of War 2. You have some rooms where you just have to eat like flat out whale on these Cyclops right here or some other enemies. Same with God of War 3 where you have to fight these Talos guys right here and you just have to whale at them. Just know that basically not every room gives you tools. There's going to be some break from that same formula of hey you have this small guy that you can throw to this big guy. No. Some rooms you just have to deal with it. You just have to kind of wreck enemies and you got you got to have to know your most damaging tools in your positioning we're gonna get to all of those later on so don't worry just know that there are gonna be rooms that are just gonna be like this you're just gonna have to fight big grunts grunt enemies and stuff you can't grab them you can't air grab them you can't juggle them you just have to deal with it and get good and just, you, you you can't come at me with the skill issue okay i'm gonna just flat out tell you it is a skill issue if you can't beat those guys next up we have the camera abuse now the thing is with the God with the God of War enemies, especially God like I'm talking the God of War trilogy. I'm not talking about you know some other God of War games like Ghost of Sparta or anything. Enemies do not attack when they're off screen. Now, how do I demonstrate this? Look at this guy. He's gonna issue an attack. I'm gonna get him off screen. Hold on, let me just demonstrate it better. He's gonna issue an attack. I'm gonna get off screen, and he's gonna cancel his attack. Let's demonstrate it again with these guys. See, he canceled his second hit. See. This is a thing prevalent in God of War 1 and 2 as well, so make sure to use it to your advantage. See, he cancels. Uh, and let, let me just demonstrate one more time. Boom. He stops his attack instantly. He just resets what he's trying to do. I want to demonstrate it way better than this, so just bear with me a minute. See? I made him cancel his attack. He was about to do a big, huge wind-up slam. That's about it. I just wanted to showcase it in here since, you know... Uh, in God of War 3, I, I was on God of War 3, so I was like, let's record it. This happens in God of War 1 as well. Although there are some attacks, some enemies that go behind that. Mainly the Minotaur sometimes attack off screens. And maybe some enemies do issue attacks and you can't let them continue with their attack. Because, I mean, even if you get them to be off screen, they still continue their attack. So do watch out and go ahead and experiment. And especially in God of War 1, I want to note something about the archers. They they don't really break, sometimes not even with boundary exploits. So, I just wanted to add that in here. So, while you can abuse cameras in God of War 1, 2, and 3, there are some enemies that go against the grain and they don't want to do what you what the game's rules have said. So, I'm sorry. Do watch out for that. And I just wanted to explain this camera stuff right here. And it's very good to abuse sometimes. So, yeah. That's about it. Here's a pretty good uh, example of me dividing these two guys and just see how I got that other Talos to off screen and now he's kind of busy over there either taunting or looking at us. He's exactly doing what I want him to do. 
while while he's over there in the off screen, I'm 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 over here fighting this guy. So, just look, I'm gonna get that off that guy off the screen again just to fight this guy alone. It is good to kind of utilize this thing. See, I'm gonna drag him. I'm gonna keep him on screen. When he comes close, I'm gonna see. It's about it's all about dividing these guys. See, like drag one in on the camera, keep him on camera. He comes close enough, too close to comfort, and then you jump off, and then you're alone with this guy. You can even use it much better, like if one of them is sprinting. Okay, one of you guys, not two. As I basically demonstrated in the first uh, example. Yeah, here we are. Now, this guy is over here and I can fight him while the other is off screen. Or maybe I can go ahead and tackle this guy that is uh, uh, on the screen and the other stays off screen. There's just a lot of ways you can have used the camera for yourself. Sometimes there's an archer next to you that you don't want him to shoot you. And so you kind of put him off screen while you're, deal while you're dealing with other enemies. And that's... It's about what you really want to do in those kind of situations. Just get enemies off screen to kind of not have a lot of stuff going on in, in your combat encounters. It is also a thing where you see, like, have you guys ever noticed when you're in a big encounter room? Uh, it is more problematic than an encounter room that is, you know, small or maybe has walls and stuff. It is just the thing. It's like if you're in a big room, like maybe this lever room that you're watching right now in God of War 1. Just because the camera is so zoomed out and everybody is in the clear, it gets more and more problematic and more and more hectic. The harpies start bombing, these, every enemy on the screen can aggro and attack. You just want to utilize the camera for your own advantage, so go ahead now that you know about it. And, and that's about it for uh, this one, and with this one, I know this was, uh, I just said about it. This also wraps up the first category and is that rooms that give you tools. I know I said rooms that give you tools and at the end of that it was just a category of things that rooms that don't give you tools but hey most of the entirety of the encounters that you face give you your tools to deal with stuff it's either ring outs it's either just you know collisions you can deal with enemies in multitudes of ways so go ahead and experiment go ahead and try these games please now we're done with this one let's move on to the next category I'm gonna call this next category knowing your attacks, knowing what you have, knowing what you, what you do, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. But of course, I'm not gonna be going through, hey, know what L1 and Triangle does, know what this and that does. Somewhat obscure things that you might not know, and I'm gonna tap into some stuff that you're not aware of, maybe by some chance. Now, the first category to this know your attacks is some, uh, not category, this first chapter is gonna be something that I'm pretty sure not a lot of you know. And it is the buffered launcher. Now you might be wondering, Zesty, what is a buffered launcher? It is essentially letting go of L1 after blocking an attack. And then le after letting go, instantly hold triangle so that Kratos launches the enemy. It is very, it's much more useful than you think. And it can be useful in some other spots that are going to be coming up later. What you're seeing on the screen is basically it. Now God of War 1 does not have this. Kratos still goes for the little uh, charge up and then launches the enemy. But God of War 2 and God of War 3 have this little thing where, you know, after you block, you kind of punish an enemy. It is very good. It kind of has that fighting game spirit in it where you can, you know, you, you kind of punish the enemy for taking long to recover. So after blocking his final attack, you let go of L1 and hold triangle and you just launch him instantly. Kratos instantly goes for the launch animation. He doesn't go for the bravery and then goes for the launcher. No, none of that. He literally instantly goes for the launcher. It is very useful, just know to use it in some spots, so you know, kind of, if you want to launch someone and then instantly Ryan harpoon him or air grab him or whatever. It is useful, make sure to use it, and it's called the buffered launcher for reasons. Next up, I'm going to talk about something else that is important, and it's called recovery cancellation. You know where you cancel Logan Paul and say, I gotta fuck his joke. Now, what do I mean by recovery cancellation? So see how long Kratos takes from this to kind of go back to running or maybe you want to start doing this again after you know doing whatever maybe you want to do this again and you don't want to you don't want to just go ahead and do this right you you just want to do a complete uh loop of this right you have your magic attacks in every game or I, I guess in god of war 3 it's an item that you want to use and it's the bow of apollo but for now for god of war 1 you have zeus fury that cancels your animations for a lot of stuff and it's not just attacks i'm gonna demonstrate it in a second even rolls so as you guys can see i'm instantly back to action after rolling so there is that but for now look at the attacks look square square l2 square square l2 and you can keep on doing that by the way it is very good maybe you want to square 
Triangle, square, triangle, square, triangle. See? You kind of get the enemy in a loop if you want to damage him purely if you're doing maybe a pain run. Or a no upgrade run. It's just, it's very good. Like, you want to do some damaging stuff. This is how you want to do it. You just cancel it with L2. But remember, don't stand in your place and press L2. You kind of want to... I guess in God of War 1 you can do that. But you kind of want to move the analog and press L2. And I'm going to demonstrate this to demonstrate this to further detail in God of War 2. Just know that for now it's, it's as easy as this. It's basically after attacking, do this. Now the other big use is of course after rolling. Just press L2 then start running. Because there's a long animation until Kratos completely recovers and you can run. This is how long it is. See how long it took? Until Kratos is back to his running animation. See, look. And it is extremely slow sometimes. It could get you killed, of course. So, Canceling with L2, then you're instantly back to action. See? Just after rolling, L2, and then let go of L2. Don't hold it. Holding it, of course, gives you this. His stance when doing the Zeus Fury. You can even get this with the Medusa Gaze, but when you have Zeus Fury, you don't want to use Medusa Gaze for this. I mean, it is still good, as good as maybe the Zeus Fury, but I just feel like the Zeus Fury is faster. Because, like, look at this. You can even fast roll with it. And we're going to touch on fast rolling in a, in a second, but it is what it is. Now you just know what to do, and you just cancel it with the, with the Zeus Fury. You just cancel your recovery animation, and you can, you can instantly, after canceling it, you can get to action. Like, maybe you do this, and then that, and then this, and just attack and get down and cancel it and attack and yeah that's about it let's move on to god of war 2 here we are at god of war 2 and it is the same thing except with the bow of you know the typhon spain sorry and you can do it basically the same just like god of war 1 see how fast this is i think it's even faster than god of war 1 it is very smooth and you're instantly back to your animation of running so after after rolling just input l2 but then again i need to remind you this is uh specifically for god of war 2 i think god of war 3 as well you need to hold the analog somewhere, like the left analog somewhere, while pressing L2 so that Kratos does this. You don't want him to do this animation where he whips out the bow. See, see while attacking, pressing L2 does this. And then you can get back to, at to attacking, so it's not the fastest thing. But if you, have, if you hold the analog somewhere, you can easily just loop attacks back together. Like, it gets way easier when you do that, so... Make sure to not just... Stand in your place L2 while he does that animation. And that takes way, way longer than just basically doing it while holding the analog somewhere. Same with the rolling. Kratos just does this. If you if you want to just, you know, do it just by L2 and not aiming the analog anywhere. So you want to aim the analog somewhere, the left analog, while, while pre you know, pressing, pressing L2. You can even do it with, uh, with uh, Uriel's head. So just like God of War 1. Look at this dude. Maybe we're crazy. Yeah, you can do it with Typhon's Bane and Uriel's head. You instantly recover from animations and it's, it is lovely. So make sure to use it to your advantage. Here we are now on God of War 3. And in God of War 3, we have the bow of Apollo or even the head of Helios that can work. Everything can work. Just after rolling, L2. And again, it kind of gives you a faster animation to kind of get back to business. It's... it's it's really good, so make sure to use it. It's just like God of War 1 and 2 that I just explained, and it's about it. It's like, instead of just doing this and waiting for the animation and then running, just cancel it with a bow, and then you can instantly go back to business, as you guys can see. So, As I noted in God of War 1 and 2, just maybe holding L2 can also be good. Like you can, It is supposed to be just a tap, but sometimes you might just be a little bit off, so that's why holding L2 can also be helpful in here. Look at how slow this is compared to canceling it with the bow. See? You're instantly back to action with the bow. Or even the head. Just know that have, having the bow is better since you get it first. It is kind of, it does kind of speed up the process. It is good. Next up, I'm going to be touching on something pretty simple. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys know about it. But I just wanted to include it in the video. And it's called Fast Rolling. So while you roll in uh, God of War, you kind of have a long animation until you get the second roll after. Well, spamming square or even inputting one square and then rolling is much, much faster. So yeah, it's about it. And that goes for every God of War, by the way. It's not just the trilogy. It goes for every little God, little, wow, little God of War. It goes for every God of War and you can use it pretty simply and it's very good. And 
yeah, just use it basically to your advantage if you want to run away from a lot of attacks, from something, from a lot of hazards that are going on on the screen. You can run away from your problems and your responsibilities pretty easily by executing it. Then again, in God of War 1, doing it while spamming X is much better. I know X makes Kratos jump, but trust me, it is much better. Just spam X and you know, you're going to have to claw grip your controller to kind of get the best effect so that you don't slack off. But it is what it is. It doesn't matter which, you know, way you want to roll or, or whatever. It still comes out fast. You're still going to be rolling way faster than normal. So make sure to use it if you even want to travel faster on this long ass chain in God of War 2. Whatever. It's just use it whenever you want. It is very, very good. So yeah, down to move on to the next thing. Next up, we have deep hits. Now, what is deep hits? Uh, it's essentially hitting an attack and it hits twice and mainly an attack by an attack I mean either the plume or uh, This attack the spirit now, what do I mean by deep hits? It's essentially as I explained at the start. What am, why am I repeating myself? Anyways Notice how I'm gonna hit this attack twice. Look at the hit counter in just a second I'm gonna hit this his, hit this guy with a plume and look at the hit counter So it has to be three hits right one two Three, except with this enemy right here, I'm gonna show okay something. One, two, look at the hit counter. Look, one, two, boom. Did you see it move to four hits and not three? That's because this plume hits twice if you're close enough to a big enemy. That is about it for the deep hits. It said it's the same thing with the spirit as well. Look at this. Boom. Did you see that? I even got three hits. I think it's because one of these attacks hit, but yeah, it is essentially just that. Now, how does that happen? In God of War 2, if the enemy is big enough, you can actually hit him with two hits. Like, you do one plume, but it counts as two. You basically do the, double the damage. It, it is as cool as that, so... Let me just demonstrate one more time. Boom. That That is not a three hit, but it just show, showed like that because I hit him once. Anyways, it is just essentially being close enough to a big enemy and then hitting him with a plume. So you do double the damage of the normal plume. Like instead of this hitting just once like that, that just hit once. It hits twice. See how I got two hits off of one plume? And it happens with the spirit as well. So if you have a big enemy, you can truly destroy him with these attacks. And this is specific to God of War 2. Now, let me move on to God of War 3 to show you something that is kind of misleading in God of War 3. Actually, before that, before I try that, you can try it out with other big enemies as well. So, I don't know, maybe the Minotaur can work. I'm just going to try it out for you guys with the Minotaur. Because deep hits are one hell of a thing. They do double damage, so how cool is that? And it worked. See, I was close enough. Boom. See how it moved to 8? If you look at the hit counter on the right part of the screen. Instead of it turning to 7, it's like 1, 2, 4. Did you see it? You're hitting the enemy twice with the with your thing. Let me just demonstrate it one more time with the spirit. Look at this. And that would have hit even twice the damage. And it would have hit two times if I was just close enough. Now, here's me doing it one more time. And see, the hit counter moved to four instead of three. It is a thing with big enemies and you can try it out for yourself. It does double the damage. It's very fucking nice. It's like when you're facing off against big enemies, just know that plumes can do double damage if you're close enough to them and you're hitting them. It's like, just like, you know, just like this. See, it's hitting twice. Eight. Twelve. Sixteen. Twenty. See? One plume is hitting twice. Same thing with this spirit as well. This one. Boom. I just had to explain this and it's pretty hidden in God of War 2 and it's a pretty nice thing since this thing is fucking so good. And yeah, now let's move on to God of War 3 and let me explain why I said, you know, it is misleading and stuff. Let's just see what all this misleading thing is about in God of War 3. Now here I am in God of War 3 and what you're gonna see is the, look at the hit counter. 1, 2, hold on, let me just do it again. 1, 2, and I missed it, wow. You're gonna look at the hit counter move two times just like God of War 2. See, see how it turned into 4? You might be thinking, hey, that's a deep uh, attack, just like God of War 2. But in actuality, it is just uh, it is just a visual thing. The hit counter does tell you that you just hit this enemy twice with a plume, like this, maybe. See? He's a big enemy, and he just got hit with a big plume. But it is fake. See, again, with that spirit, it hit twice. From afar, it only hits once, but 
from up close it hits twice. Now, in God of War 2, it is legit. You actually do double the damage. Like, this plume hits once, but it does double plume damage. This spirit, it hits once, but it does double damage, right? In God of War 3, however, it's only a visual thing and it's not real. See, it, it does change to 11 and not 10 when I hit him with this. Or maybe the spirit. But it is fake. It is just a numbers thing. It is just on the right side of the screen and it tells you, hey, you just hit this guy twice with this thing. You should be celebrating. You just did double damage. When in actuality, no. In God of War 3, it's fake. It's only a... It's, it only tells you you hit him twice and the hits counter, not in actuality. Like, see how it tells me I, I hit him twice there? It's not like God of War 2 where it's legit and it does actually do twice damage, but... And now the thing is, you might be saying, Zesty, what about God of War 1? Now, with God of War 1, I couldn't really demonstrate it as good as I could with these games, because in God of War 1, it's kind of weird. I'm gonna explain why. See how the plume hits enemies behind me? Like, if I plume from behind, see how that guy still got hit? In God of War 1, you're gonna have to... It, it, see, I attacked away, and it still hit that guy. This is something God Mode God calls the Ass Blast, as in it is really an Ass Blast, as you can see, because you're hitting the enemy from behind with your ass, and it's just... It is, I guess, accurate for what he calls it. In God of War 1, you're gonna have to position yourself weirdly enough to attack from the left side like this. Kinda like, if you're facing an enemy, you can't be hitting him. You kinda have to face sideways to hit him twice. So there are deep hits in God of War 1, if I'm not mistaken. But that's only about it. It's like, it's not as easy as God of War 2, where you just have to be close enough and you, uh, you plume. It's not as easy as that, so... There is that for God of War 1, and uh, that's about it. Let's move on to the next thing. Next up, we have one of the most important things in uh, God of War 1 and 2. Now remember, this is only on God of War 1 and 2. Other God of Wars don't have tricking, for some example, and you're gonna be knowing... You're gonna know what tricking means. What am I talking about, God? You're gonna know what tricking means in just a second. Tricking is essentially just uh, iframes that you gain for, for some moments that you can... He's pulling his cock out! You can basically do stuff in God of War 1 and 2 that allow you to go through enemy attacks. And they just, enemy attacks just don't have an effect on you. And I'm gonna demonstrate it right now starting with God of War 1. Then I'm gonna go to God of War 2. In God of War 1, we have the Blade of Artemis, right? You might not be using it a lot. But there is, there are a lot of uses to it. But today we're just gonna be explaining the... Of course, we're gonna get to the uses of the Blade of Artemis later, but for now, we're talking about tricking. In God of War 1, you can trick by summoning the sword, simply. You know, you, you kind of summon the Blade of Artemis by L1 and R1, and you have it in hand. This animation, while Kratos is summoning the sword, even in the air, you're completely safe. No single attack hits you in the cosmos. You're totally and utterly safe. This is the version 1 of the trick. Now, yes, you heard me. This is just a version 1, like L1, R1. You can even switch back, like, L1, R1, then again, R1 to switch back to this, so you can kind of, kind of loop this trick whenever they try to attack you, so. There's that. So that is it for the version 1. Just basically, you're, an enemy is about to attack, boom, and you're, you're just right there in front of him, and his attack just simply whips. It goes right through you, and you don't take damage. Now, the version 2 is all about having the Blade of Artemis in hand. So, maybe if you have the Blade of Artemis in hand. Okay, what do I what do I do to trick? Do I switch back to the Blades and then do this again, Zesty? No, you don't need to do this. You have Zeus Fury that allows you to trick pretty easily, as you can see. What is happening in here is I have Zeus Fury equipped, as you guys can see in the upper left corner. L letting go of L2, Kratos summons the sword again. That is basically what is happening in here. So while having the sword, the blade of Artemis in hand, you know, I'm, I'm holding L2, not shooting anything. Letting go of L2, boom, he summons it. That should give you a pretty cool idea. And by the way, you can't trick in the air while having the sword of Artemis. Because in the air, pressing L2 does this, and you, you're not tricking. Except you can trick in the air only if you have the blades equipped. Like, you, you approach someone and boom, in the air, which looks pretty cool. Like, you can approach someone, trick and then boom destroy him and you're gonna look pretty cool and then you're gonna go more and then you're gonna die and you're just gonna be looking like an idiot but it is what it is this is the version 2 just basically l2 now let me just explain something else before i go ahead and fight Ares right now the version 1 is about timing so when you gotta time it correctly and it's not very very punishing so it's not like the royal guard from devil may cry for example it doesn't have to be so so fucking strict 
it just has to be timed somewhat good. Like, you maybe have around 15 frames to go through an attack. Or even more, maybe maybe a, a whole last second. Maybe Okay, maybe not that, but you know. Basically, it is not very, very strict. That is the version 1, which is simply summoning the sword. L1, R1, right before getting hit. Same with the ear. It is about timing, and you have to time it before getting hit. The version 2, you know, the Zeus Fury one, while having the sword equipped, is all about anticipating an attack. When you see the enemy trying to do something, it's about kind of doing it way before the enemy tries to attack you. So, when you see the enemy in front of you issue an attack, you kind of go like this, and then you, it's just it just clicks with you whenever it clicks. I'm just, I'm just gonna have to say, go ahead and practice it. That's the only way to get it to click with you. But to simplify it even further for you, the tricking happens whenever you let go of L2. Boom. And now I'm gonna explain it in further detail while fighting Ares. Notice how I'm gonna trick. I'm first, I'm gonna use the version 1, this one. And then you're gonna see what I mean by uh, tricking. So first of all, let's just aggro him. Look at this dude. See, like right before? Boom. Boom. And it's good because you can even do it while blocking. God of War 1 has one of the best uh, tricking ever. See, like, I'm blocking. Boom. Maybe if the enemy tries something unblockable, you can easily trick. And as you guys can see, just L1, R1. And then I keep on blocking. And then again, L1, R1. Just like that. Now, as I promised, the air version is the same. Boom. Did you see that? I basically trick through his attack. See, like, in the air. It is about good timing and you have to time it right. As you guys can see, I just did. Boom. And, and you know, basically from there on, you know what to do. See? He attacks. Boom. And I I basically, that, that attack completely whiffed. Just like this. And then you can, you know, of course, punish all you want. Same with the air one. Like, you can do something funny and maybe beautiful against your enemy. And just boom. Bam. Just for, just for fun. And it's basically very good to kind of demonstrate i just basically demonstrated the tricking and how useful it can get see how, how i'm kind of going through that attack that attack can be dangerous to block with the blade of artemis and i'm gonna touch on that later just trick trick again now let me demonstrate the version two and it usually you usually want to do this after having the the sword equipped and stuff so let's just demonstrate it he's gonna attack i'm gonna do this hold on i want him to do two attacks okay trick l2 and I'm going to demonstrate it now again while letting go of L2. Look. Boom. The moment the attack is about to hit you is when you want to let go of L2. Just like this. Ha. Huh. Did you see? Let's just do that again. I let go of L2 and that is that is pretty good to demonstrate. I just got hit while blocking. Did you see that? I'm going to touch on that later when I talk about the secondary weapons. Basically for the version 2 of the trick, you want to let go of L2 the moment the attack is about to hit. Like this. Did you see that? So it's about anticipating an attack and then doing it. It's not about perfect timing. See how, how late I'm doing it? I'm not doing it as he's hitting me like the version 1. See, with this one, you instantly trick the moment you see the attack, like, nearing you. But with this one, you kind of anticipate an attack. And then let, let go of L2, just like that. It's not about perfect timing. This one is about anticipating an attack. That's, that's the only way I can explain it. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. So maybe he comes in, trick version 1, trick version 2. Boom. That's about it. See? It, it can take a while to click with you, but when it clicks, it clicks. It can never... You, you can never let go of the muscle memory that you have with it. So, yeah. Now, I'm going to just simply move on to God of War uh, 2 to demonstrate the God of War 2 tricking. And, uh, yeah. See you guys there. And I just died. Fuck. We have Typhon's Bane and Uriel's Gaze. Let's go through Typhon's Bane first. So you gotta have it equipped, of course, and right before the enemy attacks, press L2 to draw the bow, and you avoid getting hit. And the timing is not brutal. Like, you can do it even earlier sometimes, and it still works. Really works like wonders if you're aggressive while playing and you just wanna wail on an enemy. Now, do note that you have to be standing in your place to get the iframe. Don't you dare move and press L2, because that, that'll get you hit. What's that? Can I do this in the air, Zesty? Of course you can do this in the air. This is God of War we're talking about. In the air, you simply hold L2 with it. Doesn't matter if you're using the left stick as well. But don't you dare shoot it, though. Because the moment you shoot one arrow, your iframe ability is gone. So watch out, buddy. You, of course, have seen me use this to death against Zeus in my Bullying Zeus video. Really, really good. Next up, we have Uriel's head, which is the same. You draw it just like the bow. 
But now let me talk about how to do all this madness you see on the screen now. So this is really good to avoid two fast attacks coming at once. You might have seen me use it against Zeus of course, where he shoots his two lightning bolts and they simply have no effect. This quick swap from the bow to Uriel's head is very very easy. So of course you gotta start with one of them. Let's say you start with the bow. Now after you just did this parry, keep holding L2 the entire time. When you see the next attack approaching, press up on the d-pad to switch to Uriel's head and voila this whole time you're holding l2 so you just hold l2 and you keep on swapping between the bow and the uriel's head like whenever an attack is coming towards you just swap to the bow you you just got you have to hold l2 the whole time you you, you don't want to let go why would you let go and that's it basically that's how you dodge consecutive attacks with this uh tricking uh strategy right here do note that for zeus you have to really swap fast because them lightning balls ain't waiting on no one this will really change how you approach encounters and will surely change your views about the barbarian hammer this thing is a beast. You're in the face of your enemy wailing at him and if he tries to attack, trick that fool and then just start wailing on him again. I'm, I, man, I'm, I'm starting to love the barbarian hammer within every second of my life. I don't know what to say. So yeah, this will surely change how you approach everything. Like, like you can, you can literally use this tricking against nearly everything. Oh wait, Zesty, nearly everything? Yes, even Percy's flash, even that. It's just so good, man. It's, it's just so, so good. Next up, I'm gonna be explaining AI breaking. Now, this is exclusive to God of War 1, so strap up. Now, I know I did explain tricking in God of War 1 and 2, and you know, I did explain all the shenanigans, but in God of War 1, there's also some other stuff going on for the tricking. It's not just going through enemies attack. You can actually break enemy AI if you just trick. And uh, here's the basic showcase on the screen right now as you guys can see like the the trick kind of resets the timer for when an enemy is about to attack like there's a timer between their attacks right so you could count it as that i'm pretty sure there's some more complex stuff going on but tricking once see how the these harpies in front of me are not going for the bomb you know type attack from it from this from above and same thing with every other enemy not every other enemy i'm pretty sure some enemies are not breakable but yeah i did explain this in my facts about video about god of War one but I, I thought I, I might mention it again here because, come on, this is a combat guy and this is important. This is, this is especially important if you're doing a Blade of Artemis only run. Because with Blade of Artemis, you want the enemies to kind of idle as much as you want because they can, they can be dangerous with all the recovery animations you have for the Blade of Artemis. So, AI breaking, make sure to use it. Like, like just look at this clip, for example, right here. What Haristo is doing is he's tricking twice and then taking two steps with this. And he's, he's basically going to go through whole this whole encounter without... He's going a pacifist. Basically, this is a pacifist run. Yes, he is not killing a single uh, legionnaire captain. He can, go out, he can go through this whole thing by simply tricking twice and just pushing the thing. It's, it's, it's very easy. And it's, the idea is basically in front of you right now. You can even spam L2 with Zeus Fury to keep on tricking and to keep on breaking enemies as demonstrated. And yeah, I just wanted to mention this because it is important in God of War 1. This is only in God of War 1. I don't know if there are some other AI breaking stuff in God of War 2 and 3. I'm pretty sure there's not. But yeah, this was very important and I had to include it. So let's move on to the next thing that I'm going to be explaining. Next up, and as you guys can see, it's still God of War 1, and I'm going to be explaining stuff about damaging tools. Now, when it comes to damaging, I'm not talking about magic attacks. That's going to have to be a whole separate category, maybe, but yeah, when I when I talk about damaging tools, I mean this little hunting knife, as I, uh, as Harisos calls it, I guess. Yes, you can do a lot of damage with this if you if you have access to it, and if you're if you're doing a no upgrade run like I am right now, so as you guys can see everything is level one same with this with the blade of artemis it is a nice damaging tool i'm gonna be going through the through the cool damaging tools in all the games so there is that so in here in god of War one you have the sword of the blade of artemis that does cool damage and as you guys are gonna see right now in a second this thing shreds it literally shreds through enemies and it is very useful as you guys can see i'm just kind of draining Ares uh, health with doing this loop it is a loop that you can do against Ares and you can exploit it for good, like R1, L1, R1, L1, R1, L1, R1. I was about to say Air 1 at the end. But yeah, it's just basically your damaging tool in uh, God of War 1. Like, just doing a lot of this stuff just does a lot of damage. It's better off than using the sword, the Blades of Chaos, if you know how to use the 
Blade of Artemis. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of de demonstrate in here. It is about the only, it is the second, the only secondary weapon in God of War One. So yeah, just use it if you want to have some huge damaging numbers on enemies. Maybe you're fighting Ares, right? So use it to your advantage. But then again, it has a lot of flaws that I'm gonna be touching on later. So don't. And I just died. Don't really kick this horse to death. Just make sure to use it whenever viable. It does a lot of damage. Let's move on to God of War 2. Now, God of War 2 is going to be the only one where I'm going to explain the Rage Mode, mainly because the Rage Mode is pretty interesting in it, so... And I'm not going to be explaining it for the moves that you have and how, how cool the Rage Mode is and how Kratos is covered in fire and the moves are so cool. I'm going to explain it within the category that I'm explaining right now, and it is, of course, damaging tools. So, in God of War 2, it is pretty cool... Uh, uh, cool. It is pretty clear which uh, weapon is your damaging uh, option, and it is, of course, the hammer, so... The Barbarian Hammer does a lot of damage, and I'm going to show you how to kind of... It is, it is also a weapon unaffected with difficulty. Not... not. Hold on. This attack is unaffected with difficulty. I got it wrong. And not the fire that follows. No. You got to hit him with the hammer. You got to kind of bonk him with the hammer first. And then, of course, the fire follows. But we'll, we'll leave that. You know, you saw it in the screenshot. Uh, the screenshot by Heristos. Thank you so much. Anyway, so... Your damaging tool is, of course, the hammer. So, what you want to do is, of course, as you guys can see, spam triangle and cancel it with the bow. We, of course, explained the bow and how you can cancel stuff with it. And that's about it, what you want to do with it. And it's, it's, essentially, it's essentially just a damaging tool to the core. And it's not just, it's not just hey, um, you can damage enemies with it. Like, you got to also know which attack to do. Like, don't do this. This, while looking cool, it is just a very bad and long move. What you want to have is, of course, triangle or air triangle sometimes. It is very, very useful as a damaging tool. As a, It also is very useful as a, as a tool that you can break statues with it. You know, when you freeze an enemy or maybe you reverse the freeze from the Gorgon or whatever. This is the best thing because most of the time only one hit kind of breaks the statue, you know, when they're frozen. One hit alone with triangle breaks it. If not, this certainly breaks it. If you go up to their faces and, you know, hit them, with, hit the statue with this, it is instantly shattered. Like, there's no way out of this. It is very good for damaging. And now, why I explained that, I'm also going to touch on the rage, as I said, I'm going to touch on. So, why am I going to touch on the rage mode? Is because it kind of amplifies everything in your hand when in use. Now, what do I mean by that? What do you mean by that? So I have level 1 blades, right? This doesn't do a lot of damage. But when I activate the rage for the last teeny bit of second, that does level 5 blades damage. Boom, this alone. And same thing with this. The rage mode in God of War 2, as I have explained it before, it has two levels. The first one you get after burning this motherfucker, I don't know his name, I forgot it. This one boosts your blades level to level 3. And it boosts your secondary weapons to level 2. Now again, if you have uh, max, if you have level 4 blades, for example, it's not going to revert them back to level 3. And if you have level 3 secondary weapons, it's not going to revert them back to level 2. No, it's just a buffer. It's not a nerfer. But yeah, that's the level 1 rage. You get another rage mode. Of course, it's identical. You might not even notice it. But the second rage mode is much stronger than the first one. It boosts everything to the max level. So if you have the hammer in hand, like, it is level 1 right now, as you guys can see. But when you activate Rage and you attack, you're doing level 3 hammer. I don't know if it's the max level. You're doing max level hammer damage. It is very, very good. Same with the blades. This slam and every attack is doing level 1 damage, right? Activate the Rage at the last second and then, you know, deactivate it after the slam. And you get the level 5 slam damage. And I'm going to demonstrate it in a little bit. I'm just going to show you guys how I'm going to... I'm gonna wreck one of these juggernauts with simply by attacking him like crazy and you're gonna see look boom 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 not willing to cancel anything just look at this this is all you know my hammer is at level one did you see are you seeing how much I'm wrecking these guys and they killed me again some cool Orion harpoon action going on nothing new and someone another full collision 
Anyways, look at the hammer and how much I'm going to damage these guys with it, even at level 1. I want to really demonstrate it without getting hit, see? You just do a lot of damage with the hammer, man. It's, it's fucking insane. And watch out for these guys. They're really, really annoying, so... There is that. The only takeoff with the hammer is that you can't uh, attack... You can't roll with it. And then you have this attack from a far range. Of course, your damaging tool, as I said, is this hammer. Now I want to showcase this one. This is a level 5 slam. Boom. See when I activated the rage mode at the end? Boom. Again, did you see that? It does a lot of damage. I just activated at the last second. That's why I felt like explaining the, the rage mode in here and only in this game. It is essentially the best rage mode ever and there's nothing that can really change this thought. It is just very, very good. Other than the cool tools that it has for its own, it is very useful and it is uh, viable in most spots. So there's that. See? I'm gonna wreck this guy's ass. This is, this is all maxed uh, hammer that was hitting him. Just because the rage was active, the hammer turns into max level hammer and it just wrecks everyone around it. Even at level 1 it is destroying enemies. But with the rage active, you kind of destroy the enemies even further. So, there is that that you can use to your advantage. Boom. And give him another boom. And grab him and destroy him. That's about it for the damaging tools in God of War 2. Let's move on to God of War uh, 3. Granted, there are, of course, other damaging tools, like the Blade of Olympus can also damage enemies pretty cool, but for now, what, what we want to focus on are the main line, like maybe a weapon that does a lot of damage. In God of War 3, it's going to be different since we also have an item that does a lot of damage, but it is what it is. Let's move on to God of War 3. Now here we are in God of War 3 and I'm going to demonstrate the damaging tool that is pretty obvious and is the amazing Nemean Cestus. I used to like the uh, Barbarian Hammer more than the Nemean Cestus but I kind of changed my mind since the Nemean Cestus for me is a... It's simply a much better Barbarian Hammer if I really want to be uh, serious about this. So it is pretty clear what you want to do. Now you know you know about the animation cancelling with the, with the bow of Apollo so... You know what I'm talking about right now, and it's basically a square, square, cancel. A square, square, cancel. Basically, this is what you want to do to wreck everyone, or you even just complete the combo, actually. Square, 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 destroys everyone. Triangle, triangle, destroys everyone. You really want to use it to your advantage. It is very fucking nice. Like, you're just wrecking everyone around you. Look, even at level 1, this thing fucking wrecks. Like, if you want to go like this, cancel it with the bow, you can also do that. If you don't want the enemy to fly away from you. And it has a nice area of effect damage. This is basically your go-to damaging tool. And there is nothing more that I can add to it. See how I'm fucking wrecking these enemies? It is basically what you want to do. Just square square and cancel it with L2. That is your damaging tool in God of War 3. But it's not it. We have the bow of Apollo. Now on paper it might not look like the craziest thing. But oh trust me it is. Even at level 1, even at level 1 uh, meter of your, you know, your item meter, where you can only shoot 10 arrows, it is fucking OP. It does a lot more damage than you think, so like, it does like, I think it is 2 damage per hit. I don't know, but it is pretty OP, just know that. It's like, maybe you want to retreat and hit an enemy with it, you're pretty safe while hitting it, and you're, you're shooting a lot of arrows into the enemy. And you're damaging him pretty good, so... It can work pretty good against Talos enemies. It can work good against a lot of enemies, actually. Here is this Talos that I'm going to wreck with the Nemean Cestus for a second. And then I'm going to show you guys how to kind of... Uh, of course, I mean, you know how to deal with them with the bow, so... Yeah. See? Spam as fast as you can, and little do you know, the enemy in front of you is just dead. It's just that good. And the Nemean Cestus has a lot of tools. Like, it has this to kind of clear around surrounding enemies. You have this for small enemies. You have... The air L1 and triangle can also work good sometimes. It's a huge slam. Not so much the ground one. I don't. I never really use the ground one, even though even though it does some nice damage. Just know that it's not viable since it kind of takes long and sometimes you miss with it. Anyways, that is it for the Neiman Cessus. I just explained it, and what's left is basically the bow. See how much damage that is doing? It's like this guy is left. I think I'm gonna kill him with a full meter. It's even a level four meter. I think he's a couple of arrows away from dying, and he there he is. There he goes. Your damaging tools in this game are pretty much the Nemean Cestus and the Bow of Apollo. And they're pretty good even at level 1. Like if you're doing a no upgrade run plus, 
you're gonna be pretty you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a lot of fun if you just do this like you know triangle and then spam them with the bow you do a lot of really sweet damage and you build up the hit mirror and it just it, see you just kind of wrecked his ass without even knowing like you do a lot more damage than you think but it is what it is like now you know how much damage it does it's not just there for show and it's not just there to kind of be fast and to hold the enemy in the air and to juggle him further it does a lot of damage i'm not even explaining this which is can all which can also be a pretty nice tool like do this you know for other enemies it does work maybe not for the talos but yeah the bow is also a really nice tool now you might be thinking zesty what about the rage mode it does about as shitty da of a damage as you might uh, not think it does you might think it is pretty op and does a lot of damage but truly this is way too underwhelming like it is, there's, there are reasons for that. It is pretty shitty of a rage mode. It is good to cancel animation. It is, it is good for some other spot and stuff. But really, if we're talking as a whole, it is not as good as, you know, going ham with the Cestus. Especially for a rage mode. It is pretty bad. It's only good to cancel animations and nothing more. And that's about it for God of War 3's damaging tools. It is uh, pretty clear from what I just explained. Nemean Cestus and the bow just do a lot of crazy damage now after being done with explaining your damaging tools in uh all three games i'm willing to go ahead and move on to the next one except i'm not going to be explaining it today so if i sound different in that category you're gonna know why and it's gonna be the secondary weapons of the trilogy it is gonna be uh kind of complicated to go through them and i'm gonna be explaining the flaws and the good and the good stuff that come from the secondary weapons and listen, I'm going to be explaining all of them. Like, for God of War 1, it's going to be the Blade of Artemis. In God of War 2, it's going to be the Spear of Destiny and uh, the, the Barbarian Hammer. In God of War 3, it's going to be this beautiful weapon, this beautiful weapon, and this beautiful weapon. So it's going to be basically, as a whole, the secondary weapons of these God of War games. And yeah, see you guys there in the next uh, category, or chapter, or fuck me, I don't know. And now we move on to the secondary weapons category. Now this one of course we're going to start with God of War 1 and we have the Blade of Artemis that we've explained to some extent so far. Now the first thing that I want to get out the way with the Blade of Artemis is the delayed block. Like you might be saying, okay what is a delayed block? Look, you're going to be blocking and you still get hit. You gotta, you're going to have to block way earlier than the perfect timing for a block believe it or not it's not like the blades where whenever you press l1 that's it you're blocking i know with the blade of artemis it looks like you're blocking sometimes but you still get attacked there are some attacks that are way too bad for this mainly the Ares attacks that i'm going to be showcasing later but for now let me just test it against some some of these uh legionists right here i'm gonna i'm gonna block maybe around perfect timing and you're gonna see how i'm gonna get hit sometimes Notice, see, they just kind of ganged up on me, even though I was blocking. This is basically a pretty good observation. Now I'm going to move on to an Ares attack that, you know, Ares is going to do an attack that is going to completely wreck blocking, even if you perfect block it. Let me just move on to Ares and you'll, you'll see. And, and you still get hit. So whenever it happens, I'm going to show it to you guys. That attack that just happened was very dangerous, but yeah, let's, cu let's kind of cut to a moment where it happens. See? I blocked, and I still got hit with that attack of his. I'm just gonna make sure to for it to happen again. I hope he does it. There, that attack. You really have to block early, or even don't even block. I'm gonna explain something at the end of this, and is that you don't even want to block with the Blade of Artemis. There's also that glitch where, you know, you get hit. Here's this attack that is gonna be very deadly. This million stab attack. You really don't want to block with the Blade of Artemis when this attack is coming, because... See? I blocked perfectly on time, and I got hit back there. That should be a perfect ob observation for you, because I blocked perfectly. If you look closely, I blocked on time, and I still got hit. This is a main flaw with the Blade of Artemis. So, yeah. Now let me just show you guys some footage of the Tormentor hitting me while blocking on time. So, just to kind of... Make sure that it's out there for you guys and to confirm it for you. It is just out there and I perfectly, everyone perfectly recommends tricking instead of just, you know, blocking with the Blade of Artemis. So make sure to perfect that version 2 of the blocking just in case you were doing a Blade of Artemis only run. Like I did a couple of days ago, but yeah. 
it is what it is. Next up, after this horrendous thing that I just explained, I'm gonna explain one of the best things ever about the Blade of Artemis. And it's just how good of a weapon it is in most cases. And of course, I'm gonna explain the most important thing that you can do with it, and it's home run tactics. Now, what are home run tactics? I have explained them in uh, in some length before in my facts about video, but let's just go through them sometime. One more time, sorry. Basically, there's a bug that happens whenever you kind of bounce an enemy in front of you or launch him and then launch him again with L1 and triangle. And the enemy is just sent off flying and this can be very, very useful for a lot of spots that you can ring out enemies in. Mainly the most infamous spot is this spot right here in Hades uh, place. You fight 11 satyrs. Now 11 satyrs is a lot, let me tell you. What you want to do is not fight these guys, rather, I mean it is still a fight, but you don't want to really wail at them for hours. You want to just kind of punt them square, square, circle, and then L1 and triangle, and they're sent off flying. Now granted, you're going to have to kind of perfect position yourself, and you're going to have to learn how to do it with uh, satyrs and how to kind of deal with them with the Blade of Artemis. Which I'm gonna get to at some point when, whenever we get to the next category of this whole combat guide. Whenever I talk about the know your enemies category. It's gonna be a category that's gonna come up next. This home run technique is one of the most important ones. You can kind of ring out a lot of enemies and not just these satyrs, but I, I don't, I might not find the footage, but if I do, I'm going to put it on the screen right now just to demonstrate it for you guys. There are a lot of ways to kind of do this home run technique. You can, you can either go squares per circle where they're perfectly in front of you. It's called the punt. Or you can do double launches like L1 triangle, they're in the air, and another L1 triangle, and they're, they're sent off flying. It is very useful. Make sure to use it in a lot of spot, and that's this kind of this kind of a nice redemption for the Blade of Artemis, if you ask me. Like I just explained how bad the blocking is and how flawed it is. By the way, I even I completely forgot to mention that you can't block in the air with the Blade of Artemis. So there's also that, and I'm gonna explain something that is gonna help you a little bit with that. You know the fact that you can't block in the air. But yeah, let's leave it for the later uh, segment of this video. Anyway, so. That is it basically. The home run technique is very useful. You can punt a lot of enemies in the game and you can instantly launch them again and they're just sent off flying and it is just, it is the stuff of legend. Trust me, try it, don't miss out on it. It is the most important thing ever. I just wanted to mention it. I just had to. This is some quick action that you're seeing right now against the Cyclops, but <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get to that. This is what you what you do when you're good at uh, tricking. The next thing that I'm gonna be explaining right now is the knockback. Now, what is a knockback? Actually, before explaining the knockback, this is just a pretty... Let's just do one more demonstration for this. Uh, boom. Just a setup for, for the ring out that I was explaining. Like that. See how that Cyclops was sent flying? Anyways, uh, I actually, not, I'm not going to talk about knockback right now. I was going to be talking about something else, and it's how much of a setup weapon it is, even without the whole home run technique and stuff. So, you can set up for air grabs or Orion's harpoon, and I'm going to showcase it right now pretty simply, hopefully. So, again, just square, square, circle. Let me just make it clear. Uh, actually, let's get rid of one of these guys. He's kind of making it way too hard. All right. Look at this setup. You can kind of punt him and then instantly switch to the blades and grab while he's uh, in the air in front of you. Or you can jump in the air and grab him. But of course, remember, you have to switch back to the blades since you can't grab in the air with the Blade of Artemis. And it's going to be something else that I'm going to explain in a second. So basically, square, square, circle, switch back to the blades and then air grab. Except these guys are blocking. Of course, you can do it against every enemy. I'm just demonstrating it against these guys because, yeah. And that's about it this is the perfect setup that i wanted to explain it just it is pretty much just a setup like maybe you want to do something like this you know and he got into the dizzy state but yeah you could even juggle him after you can jump and attack after it just you can do anything you want basically it's a good setup weapon you can even have it with this and then you know jumping and air grabbing if he doesn't die i think he's gonna die yeah you can even do this for air grabs but 
I just wanted to showcase that. Anyways, I'm going to move on to the next thing right now. And it's going to be knockback. And I'm going to see you guys right after I get done with these Cyclops guys. I got rid of some Cyclops while you were not watching. Anyways, what is a knockback? This is a knockback. See how good this attack is? It can cause some collisions between the enemies. Like if you're running short on your collisions options. What you want to do is really jump and uh, air triangle. It is the best knockback that you can be. You can do it even against Minotaurs as I just demonstrated. But you do have to be careful while doing it. Because as you just saw. For, for whatever amount of times that I just demonstrated it. I'm getting hit and it's just me being not good. This is about the, I think, the only knockback you have with the Blade of Artemis, as you saw. And these guys are sent flying and causing, I think, half collisions. Yes, I'm pretty sure it's half collisions, since it's an attack, it's not a grab. Boom! See that knockback? And he's sent off flying and hitting his friend back here. This is about it, and I just wanted to explain the knockback with the weapon, so... As I just said, it is a very nice setup weapon, and this knockback works also good against, uh, for that point, so... Just wanted to mention it, triangle, and the safest way is of course launching one and jumping in the air and then triangle. This can also work as a ring out technique, so there's also that if you're if you're really willing to experiment enough with it. So yeah. Next up actually, this transition sells pretty well to what we have next with this weapon, and it is the the damage output that the weapon has. This this weapon just does a lot of damage even on level one, and I'm not I, I'm not even gonna explain how cool it is that you have all the moves from the start. You know you have every single special attack and every single attack, and and with that you also have nice damage that you're gonna do. What you're seeing on the screen is gonna be demonstrated in a second as well, so don't worry. Anyways, now when we talk about damage output, we have some stuff with this sword that you can you you know you can do a lot of damage with. The square finisher is a nice damage output, but, you know, only after doing the R1. The R1, this thing called the thrust, or the shred, or the uh, the tickle, as we, as I like to call it right now, since God Mode God uh, calls it the, the thrust now, I don't know. But yeah, the thing is, it is very nice for damaging. Like, you might see me when I fight Ares, I use it a lot, I use R1. And then R1 again, and then R1 again. That's just a loop that you can get Ares in. But overall, this thing is just a nice damaging thing. You can press R1 and then circle, which does this huge damaging thing. Or the preferable one, which is R1 and then square. I guess Minotaurs is dangerous since they block and stuff. But, you know, when you find the good opportunity, see how I decapitated that guy? It is a very nice damaging tool as a whole. And there's also the circle attacks that are also very good. You know, you're better off just blocking after circles. So it's like doing this, basically. And, uh, and the false grab happened. And I'm going to explain it in a second. But yeah. Now here's another demo. Wow. Here's another demonstration against the Cyclops. Where I'm going to kind of wreck these two guys. with uh, Solely with the Blade of Artemis. If you're doing a no upgrade run plus. You're bound to use this thing instead of the... Wow. Instead of the blades, because your damage output is really, really sweet, and I can't explain it enough for you guys. It is just the stuff of legend. I'm getting fucking wrecked, but yeah. Just R1, square, trick, R1, trick, R1, square. You can even go R1 and then circle, but it is just slower. I prefer... Wow, I just died. I prefer square since you hit a lot more times than the circle one. You know... You might want to uh, cancel the circle one since you might see something unfortunate happening. Like maybe you're, maybe the enemy's about to attack. So you know, hitting the square one is much better. Since wow, since you know you kind of, uh, wow, I tricked through both. You kind of at least get more attacks in, and these attacks are doing damage. Let me tell you, they're not just there for that. And now actually after this, I'm gonna explain something else about the nice damage output that you have with the blade of Artemis, and it's not just for uh, you know just for attacking stuff and it's gonna be for demonstrating how good it is for shattering statues so I'm gonna shatter a statue right now with it and you, you'll see you just you you be the judge on how good it is when compared to the blades at least you know if you're doing a no upgrade run as I just mentioned like you don't want to attack with the blades whenever you want to output a lot of damage you want to use the blade of Artemis you know pain takes that away from you you're gonna you're gonna have to chip away at enemies with the blade of with the blades of chaos but that's a story for another day. For now, we're going to be talking about the Blade of Artemis. And look at how good this thing is for shattering a statue. Just as easy as this, and it's, it's shattered. Now, granted, you can shatter with the blades if you just do this. You know, just one of these, and then follow it with another one if the enemy is really heavy. 
But really what you want to do is, if you have the chance to, like, why not shatter them using the Blade of Artemis, just like this. And then cancel it, and R1, square again, and they're done. It is very, very useful for a lot of stuff. I just mentioned how good it is for when it comes to, you know, uh, damage output and how, how it's good against just enemies, and it's good, and it, everything is cancelable with this thing. While it does some cool damage... I, I, actually, that transition so is good to the next point. It's, it's good how everything's flowing together in this uh, section of the video while I explain. Wow! It is good how, while I'm explaining everything, uh, that fucking lunge. It is good that everything is blending together, and this is what I mean by everything is cancelable. Like, even your special attacks, they're cancelable if you input magic after, you know. Like, maybe you did L1 and Square by accident, and it takes long to finish. You can cancel it by simply uh, inputting L2, like, while having any magic attack. See? L2. Let me just get rid of this guy. He seems very sus. There's another Cyclops cake in front of us. But yes, yeah, see how I'm canceling everything with magic? Even square, I, and I can roll away. R1, roll away. R1, circle, roll away instantly. And the grab glitch happened. I'm gonna explain it later. But yeah, it is very good how after every attack, you can instantly roll away, like, doing this, you know... R1 square, you can instantly roll away. R1 square, switch back to the blades. It is very, very useful. But do remember that at the same time, you have very stupid stuff and long recovery times. Mainly the air triangle. See how long that took me to get up? You really do not want to whiff this one. You really want to make sure this one lands and you're good. Because look at how long it takes for Kratos to recover. I just wanted to mention that. With everything comes responsibilities, and that is the one I guess to mention. Anyways, special attacks, L1 and X, cancelable with L2. L1 square. See how long this takes? Sometimes you want to, you know, input, you know, after a block, you want to do this, right? Accidentally, you might do this one, L1 and square, and it just takes long, and you might get slapped out of it. And if you do that, L2. Just as easy as that, and you're simply kicked out of the animation, and it is very, very good. It, it even happens with L1X, which I don't advise using. It is just a mashup of some of the moves of, of, that the Blade of Artemis has. It's not the most useful thing. It's not good. For your damage output, you want to do circle, circle. If you have time, even land the last slam and cancel it with a block since, you know, you can... Because the recovery is taking way too long. See how long this takes? You're better off just blocking and then coming back to action. But you mainly want to go two times and then block, because it is the best thing. See, like, boom, 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 boom. Or R1 and square. That's your most damaging tool in the, th in the whole uh, weapon. And it is very useful and versatile, and it is good against uh, shattering statues. It is overall a very, very useful weapon with a lot of flaws, but... It makes up for it with the amazing uh, stuff that it has. And I really hope you go out and you kind of experiment with it a little bit. I know it seems like a weapon with a lot of flaws, but trust me, it is much more than just that. It's like, I can't begin to explain how much I love it now. Since I did my uh, Blade of Artemis only run, I started to love it even more. See how long that took to recover? So you got to be careful with it, that's one, but other than that, it, it can help you in a lot of spots, trust me, it does, so. Look at the damage output, look at how I'm wrecking these guys, this is a level 1 Blade of Artemis, like, what secondary weapon is this good at level 1? I guess the Barbarian Hammer is better, but yeah, overall, it just it's just a nice uh, setup tool, damaging tool, uh, a nice everything, it has a special thing when it comes to home run techniques and stuff, you can trick with it. I can go all day on how much I love this weapon now after I did my Artemis only run. It's just that it comes as a flawed weapon and... Yes, it's flawed, but when you can do this, come on, it's so lovely. When you can when you can shatter a statue this easily, you can't tell me it's a bad weapon overall. It's just a very nice weapon and I love it. Wow, this guy's not getting frozen. I said no! Let's move on to the next thing that this weapon does beautifully. The next thing that I'm going to explain about the weapon is going to be the grab glitch. So, you notice how you can't grab, you know, this grab? You can't grab with the Blade of Artemis when uh, when you have it equipped. Kratos does a different attack, which is this one, right? So, the thing is, the devs kind of did something which can be a blessing and can be a curse at the same time. And it's... 
it's a grab glitch that happens with the blade of Artemis. See how this enemy has a circle on top? I'm gonna press circle, aka this attack. I'm not gonna switch to the blades and then grab. No. I'm gonna press circle with the blade of Artemis and you be the judge on what happens. Like, look, I'm gonna press circle. Hold on, let's just... Actually, I think you need to press it twice. See? Uh, I pressed it twice, two times circle. I'm gonna try it one more time and maybe it's a uh, one time press, but... Kratos goes for the grab if an enemy has a circle on top of his head. I would have hated it if it if it was for every enemy. But thank god it's for only the enemies that have a circle on their head when you, you know you get them in their dizzy state. And I'm dead. I'm not dead. Yeah, uh, this enemy right here, circle. Okay, I guess it's, it's pressing circle twice and Kratos goes for this grab. Did you see that? Let's fail this right here just to demonstrate it even one more time. Don't kill me, please. Okay. Oh! oh! Son of a bitch, I haven't seen that animation before. Come here. See? Kratos goes for the grab. Now I'm gonna explain why this can be a blessing and a curse at the same time with the Minotaurs, hopefully. I'm gonna cut back uh, to you guys in just a second. Sometimes you wanna grab an enemy, uh, or, or more like you wanna kill an enemy, and what happens is uh, Kratos goes for the grab even after killing the enemy. I hope I, I fucked it up. Anyways, let's just explain it, because you might run into it while playing, you know, so... It is not a big deal to really not explain or anything, so... Let me just, uh, just explain it to you guys, and hopefully you run into it whenever you play. I'm gonna get... See how I... That's, a, that's another example of a delayed block. I blocked perfectly back then, I still got hit, so... It is what it is, you know. See? I was blocking the entire time, and that attack still hits me. Anyways, sometimes an enemy is low on health and he has the circle on his head. Now what you want to do is you want to grab him, right? And Kratos can uh, really fuck you up sometimes. He's gonna go for the grab, but the enemy is gonna be dead. And that's gonna be when he goes for the grab. And I'm gonna show you guys how that can mess you up. Because you might have some enemies behind you and uh, you, you'll be in the grab animation while they hit you. And by the way, let me just explain something while I'm at it right here. I know I should have explained it earlier, but... You can cancel grabs in God of War 1 by inputting L1. It is the fastest way, because in God of War 1, grabs take way too long to recover. Look at this. Look at how long this takes. If you whiff this, an enemy can kick you out of any animation that you want. But pressing L1 kind of cancels everything instantly. See, oh, I'm, I'm dead. Basically, L1 cancels grabs. Now, let me go get back to business with how bad the grab glitch can be. Don't fail. And sometimes, after the enemy's dead, I can't believe I can't explain it to you guys right now, but it happens, trust me, whenever you play, you're gonna be like, okay, Zesty was right, it does happen. For now, let me just uh, get rid of these. See back there, that that is also another curse, as I just ex uh, I wanted to explain and stuff. Anyways, I think this is uh, perfectly enough for me to kind of... Uh, explain what I'm trying to explain. Next up, I'm gonna be explaining something else. Other than the grab glitch, there's something else that is also a problem, and it is uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit iffy, and it is that you can't block in the air. Yeah, it's that you cannot block in the air with the blade of Artemis. See this block and how important it is sometimes. Like sometimes you really want to block in the air. It is like a thing. Like maybe you want to drop down while blocking on the ground so that you can be completely safe. With the Blade of Artemis, you cannot block in the air. I'm holding L1 in the air and there's nothing. Now, it is a problem because you also cannot trick in the air. So, you're left with one option and it is what you're seeing on the screen right now. Like, right now, the floor is lava. If I fall, I'm fucking dead. See, like, in a situation like this, I do not want to fall, like, until now that I fell. And what I'm doing is, as I'm, I'm, I'm kind of subduing my fall by inputting square, square, circle in the air. Square, square, circle. It kind of takes longer, because if I fall right now into an attack, see? I fell right, in, right into that guy's attack. Inputting square, square, circle will kind of help you to stay in the air longer. See how I didn't get hit with that? It helps you stay in the air longer, and in some instances, it helps you kind of get the enemies off screen, and the AI kind of disables off screen, that is... Something that I'm going to explain later, but yeah. It is something that you should consider whenever you, you, you know, you realize you're with the blade of Artemis in the ear. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? 
square square circle and you stay in the air for kind of longer then you drop and then you roll away safely and stuff like you know with the blades you know what you're doing you're kind of air blocking i mean i can't uh block cyclops attacks but it is what it is with the sword of artemis blade of artemis you want to just do square square circle to kind of stay in the air longer yep we're pretty much done with the blade of artemis and how beautifully beautifully beautiful it is and for the for the damage for a lot of tools overall a really really nice weapon with a lot of flaws but you can get around the flaws if you know how to play with it. Uh, make sure to kind of experiment with it. It's not the end of the world if you do, if you like. I'm, I'm being serious. Like what you're seeing right here is I'm pairing the beam. Like, you know, you can do this and into that. You can, you know, it, the of course the tricking works against beams as well. It's not just attacks. So yeah, the it's a very nice weapon. The Blade of Artemis. I really, really like it. But it, it has flaws. I'm not denying that. And... Uh, that's another grab glitch. Yeah, it has its flaws, but it's a very nice weapon. Next up, I'm going to move on to God of War 2. And man, the secondary weapons in God of War 2. It, of, course, it, of course, it has my uh, favorite secondary weapon. And it is the blade of the sword of... Wow, what is this guy saying? Yeah, uh, God of War 2 has my favorite secondary weapon. And it's the Spear of Destiny. And I cannot wait to explain it. So let's move on to God of War 2. And now here we are in God of War 2 and our secondary weapon, the first one we're going to talk about is of course the Barbarian Hammer. Now where do I begin with the Barbarian Hammer? Oh my god it is so important. It's like the damage it does, of course I used to hate it but after learning about tricking and how easy it makes things, I really don't even need rolling with the Barbarian Hammer. Now yes, I'm instantly coming out the way and explaining the flaw with this thing and is that you cannot roll even though you can switch back to the... Like maybe you're attacking, you can switch to the blaze and roll away, but there's another problem. Maybe if you get attacked, you cannot wake up roll. Like right here, I'm holding the right analog somewhere. See, I just did it back there, but sometimes you can really get changed up in, uh, in most attacks. So it's not going to be very pretty, so do watch out. Like with the blades, you can sometimes roll away faster. Like sometimes two enemies are comboing you and you can roll away after getting hit. With the Barbarian Hammer, it is way more problematic and it can be, uh, it can get you into pretty bad spots. So, I just wanted you to, to watch out for that. And we all know it. It's infamous for not allowing you to roll away. Kind of making me hate it, making a lot of people hate it. But when you learn about it, you're going to love, you're going to come to love it even more than uh, any other weapon. Trust me. So, the Barbarian Hammer, as I have explained before in the damaging uh, category of this video, it is pretty much a damaging tool. Look at this. Now that's a Hades Minotaur that I just took out. It is not as simple as just, hey, let's take this guy out. It is very, very hard. And two triangles take out his statue this easily. He has the statue with the most HP and two triangles take it out. Hold on, I think the, I think the L1 triangle takes it out instantly. No. But yeah, two triangles take his uh, statue out easily. And it's just, it's beautiful whenever you get it and do it and stuff, so... Yeah, that's gonna be besides the point. Let it, let's explain it just like I explained the Blade of Artemis in God of War 1. Let's, let's, go, let's go through it, shall we? Okay, so the first thing is, of course, the triangle spam. Now, this is, of course, much faster with uh, Bow of Apollo. Uh, Typhon spam canceling, sorry. It is much faster with just L2 while, you know, having the analog somewhere. It's basically the one that I taught you after the roll, you know, the Typhon being canceled. Same with the Zeus Fury cancel and stuff. You basically just go triangle, triangle, cancel, triangle, triangle, cancel, triangle, and it's very fast. But even if you don't cancel it, even if you cancel it with a block, it is still very, very deadly to do it. So like, triangle, triangle, even without, uh, even without a cancel, it is very, very deadly if you know how to, how and when to use it. See, like, only four bunks got rid of this motherfucking tank right here, so... That is something I wanted to have an own category for itself only, and it's, it is it is basically lovely how much damage this thing does. It is so good. Next up, we have the Might of the King Shockwave, which is this attack right here, L1 and Triangle. You might not see it have a lot of effects, but I'm going to explain a lot of pretty cool stuff with it. So, first up, it's not effective with difficulty, but when I say it's not effective with difficulty, I don't mean this fire. See that fire that follows after the slam? I, I'm not talking about this fire. This fire is not, it, it stays the same. It's not really like, it does not have the attribute of not being affected with difficulty. So it's still shit. But the actual bonk, when you hit the guy with the hammer, 
that one is unaffected with difficulty and it's going to be pretty interesting when you see the damage that it does look and it's just it's like it's pretty good to use it on an enemy whenever he's taunting whenever you're alone with him just hit him with one of these and he shall just uh shut the fuck up and get kind of knocked back into the dizzy state it's just something that i wanted to explain it does a lot of damage uh it doesn't matter the difficulty it still does the cute beautiful damage it does so yeah, I just wanted to include it as its, as its own tier in this video, just to kind of give you a good perspective on how good it is. Now, other than the beautiful damage it does and it being unaffected with difficulty, this fire can be very useful to use for some zoning. See how I'm kind of... Sometimes if you can get someone in a loop, you can really uh, work your way with it. Hold on, let me just... Boom. If you know how to use it, you can really use the fire to kind of subdue an enemy and keep them in at some range from yourself that can work with normal enemies this guy is uh, however kind of making it hard for me right now but yeah and how you want to do it is that you don't want to be up in the face of the enemy you just you just kind of want to be kind of far from the enemy and you want to be facing away from the enemy and then turning around doing a 180 on him it's like you want to issue the attack like this but then turn around and redirect it kind of to the minotaur behind you. It's just that's what you want to do it because sometimes even in the in the loom chamber maybe you're from you're from another side of the barrier. You don't want to be facing them and doing this because you kind of get sucked into the enemy. And this is gonna be something that I'm gonna explain later. You're gonna get sucked into the enemy's attacks and th sometimes you're just gonna get way too close to comfort. So you're better off just doing it away and then turning around and doing it. So you ju you just kind of take a step forward just just kind of pay close attention here how kratos is going to take a step forward and then i'm going to turn around it is much better like this if you want to hit the enemies from afar with just the fire like like what i'm doing basically right now and uh i also want to explain something else and is the air version of this thing and it's going to be very useful in a second when i explain the other uses of this fire it's not just uh keeping the enemies away or maybe just kind of chipping away at an enemy from afar it, it also has some uses for some spots that are going to be very important in a second. And let's just skip right over them. Now, when somebody tells you this thing has range, don't pull the cap card out of your pocket. Matter of fact, it even has a uh, height other than range. As you can see, as I'm demonstrating on the screen right now, these guys right here, these lords that are down there, they are getting hit with the fire, even though the fire is above them. I'm gonna be showcasing a lot of footage on the screen hopefully where I can showcase this fire hitting enemies below it and not just enemies you know that are in front of the fire or above it a little bit. This thing both has range as seen in this clip right here where it shatters the you know the kind of rocks and stuff ahead and it has height where you know it's, it's killing these enemies below. Moral of the story the might of the king's shockwave let's just, just make sure that the name is the Let's make sure I'm not fucking up the name. Yes, Might of the King. Might of the King is very good. The fire that follows, it is very good. It has range and it has height. So <laughs> there is that. And whoever tells you this has range, just say yes and just handshake and kiss each other. Now, I think I explained how good it is for shattering enemies. But I really want to demonstrate how really good it is. Like these big gigantic enemies. See like that Cyclops. He died with one triangle. Now, now look boom it is very very useful like whenever you see a statue in front of you just pull out your hammer bonk it and then roll away just like like this just casually hit it and run away it is very very fucking useful i cannot stress how useful it is just make sure to use it whenever you have the the time to or you have it in front of you just does this guy die with one yes these uh juggernauts the most annoying enemies in the game ever known to humanity Oh my god, he did not... Okay. One L1 in Triangle, Might of the King, breaks them. I just basically want to say it is very, very important if you want to shatter statues. It's much better than wailing at them with the blades and pluming them as a lot of people do. Uh, it is much better to just simply beep and go about your business. It is as easy as that. Just like pull up your hammer, boom, and then just run away. I think even the Air Triangle can be good with this thing. Like, just going ahead, boom. And just shattering a statue. Now the next thing that I also want to explain is that it gives rage orbs when you kill enemies with it. See that rage orb? 
And I don't mean shattering, like, like just, hold on, I think even shattering works as well. Yeah, I know, shattering doesn't work. But anyways, this thing gives rage orbs whenever you kill an enemy with it, so... Whenever you have an enemy- wow. Having any magic attack out and killing enemies with magic while having the hammer equip gives you rage orbs. This is gonna be something else that I'm gonna explain with the Spear of Destiny. But just know that for the hammer, it gives you rage orbs. And the whole thing just- it's, it's a rage farming simulator. See, like, you hit enemies with it and you get orbs and- it is, it is simply beautiful, like, it, even this attack um, that I'm not talking too much about, it can be good. You know, you do this and you get the army of Hades, and it's good. It sets up some enemies, oh, I switched to the blaze, that's why I turned off. It sets up some enemies for air grabs, which is very good. Like, sometimes you have a minotaur that you want to grab in the air, and you can do this easily with him. So, there's also that that you might want to have to use. I'm not going to explain a lot of it, because I haven't really used this a lot. I mostly use the hammer at level 1, but... It is still a viable tool, and just know that this category was about how it gives you rage orbs. Doesn't matter if you got, if you like kill one with a with a magic attack, you're still getting uh, rage orbs just because you have the hammer equipped. So I just wanted to mention that. And now that we're done with the hammer, I'm gonna move on to the best secondary weapon in the history of humankind, in the history of humanity, the spear of destiny. Come here. Boom, come here, boom, come here, boom, come here. Now, the Spear of Destiny is purely and utterly a setup tool down to its core. It is just a setup tool. Like, whenever you hear anyone mention anything about a setup tool, just make sure to tell them something about the Spear of Destiny and how good it fucking is. This thing is a setup tool down to, down to its core, but that's not going to be what I'm, what I'm going to explain right now. I'm going to explain something else right now, and it's going to be the damage. Now, th this thing damages heavy, as you can see pretty clearly, like, boom, and you're fucking up, fucking up enemies. This thing, the piercing shards, is uh, this shotgun blast, as I like to call it. It is not effective with difficulty, so you can do it in the air on the ground as well, it's very beautiful. It is not effective with difficulty, it does the same damage, doesn't matter the difficulty, so if you're playing on very hard, it, the damage does not get nerfed. It is very, very good, and you can use it to your advantage in most spots. This is the piercing shards that is not effective with difficulty. Now, I just wanted to explain it. Now, you might see it do some beautiful damage, like, hey, you're killing some of these guys pretty fast, right? That's not about it with the with this beautiful setup of a tool. There's also half collisions that you should count up for. Now, I'm gonna kind of entwine it with the uh, with two of the categories that I'm gonna explain. See how that guy behind him died. I'm gonna entwine this whole half collision thing in with uh, two categories that I'm gonna explain about the Spear of Destiny. First is gonna be this damage uh, category that I'm explaining, and then it's gonna be the knockback that I'm gonna also explain in a second. Just for now, know that half collision. It's just lovely when it happens. Anyways, so other than this piercing shard doing beautiful damage that, it, that, it, that, you, that I just demonstrated for you guys. It also does a cute knockback to the... I'm sorry. It also has some pretty nice knockback to the enemies that can really cause some nice half collisions. Now, I'm gonna also count that towards damage to enemies because you're still damaging enemies, right? Like, let's say this guy, boom. He sent flying to hit the enemy behind him, and I'm gonna demonstrate in a second. Boom! See how he sent, he's, he got sent flying, and he hit this guy right here, this sentry. So, other than the beautiful damage that this thing does, which I think it's 30 damage, which is 20 damage shy of a full collision. By the way, if you forgot, this is a full collision. Except it is kind of different for the sentries. For the sentries, you're gonna have to be far away for this to do the full damage of a full collision. See that did a full damage. That was a good demonstration. Anyways, so this does 30 damage if I'm not mistaken. But other than that, the knockback causes a half collision to the enemy behind, causing just giving you more damage basically. See like how that guy behind this guy died? It is just a setup tool down to its very, very core and I can't express my love enough for it. It's like, look at this. You're kind of fucking up hazards and crowds with it, and it, I can't explain how much lovely it is. And I'm going to come back to this in a second, this whole knockback effect, both the air and the ground. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to it in just a second whenever we get to the next category. So, yeah, let's move on to something else now that we explain damage. Of course, we also have other tools for damage. Let me, let me just, just briefly go through them. And it's this. 
Now that damaged them quite a bit, but then you have him turning purple and then exploding like this. We also have this. This also causes a minor knockback and then leaves a bomb like this. See how they, they're sent flying a little bit? So you can have that and then just this bomb exploding around them. So I just wanted to explain this as well. There are other damaging tools with it. Like maybe you have this and then the finisher that just vaporizes some enemies. It is still considered a nice damaging tool, but of course, when you have the Barbarian Hammer, you don't need anything else for damage, but just know that you have this spear that also damages people, and it also has this beautiful attack that is not affected with difficulty. Just an observation. Now, let's move on to something else about this weapon, and uh, yeah, let's go. The next thing I want to talk about is, uh, is actually going to be a nice transition to this uh, next thing that I'm going to talk about, and it's the knockback. Basically, this that causes the half collision that you're watching on the screen, like... Let me just demonstrate with that sentry. He has more health now. Boom. And he's sent off and he killed this guy that, that died right here. It is basically the idea of knockbacks and how they cause a half collision. See, like, I only hit this guy that was in front of me. And he got sent flying and hitting the, his boyfriends behind him. It is very, very useful. It can be very useful with uh, crowds. Because you kind of cause a lot of half collisions when they're all crawled up to with each other. So yeah, now I'm going to demonstrate something else that can be helpful with this. This knockback does not only work on these simple enemies, it works on a lot of enemies. Let's move. This next showcase is going to perfectly showcase to you guys how good of a weapon this thing is. And it's... So I did talk about the beautiful knockback. Now look at it knock down the sister of fate herself, Lachesis. Now... That should perfectly sum it up on how wh how and why this weapon is my favorite. It has this beautiful knockback, not only against normal enemies, but also against this uh, boss fight. You heard me. It's a boss fight that I'm knocking down. So how much more useful can this thing get, man? It's basically what I wanted to showcase right here. So the knockback is not only on normal enemies, it's also on this boss fight, this Lachesis that I'm fighting right here. So yeah, after blocking something, maybe after blocking or maybe tricking through one of these, you can knock her down easily if you if your timing is correct. If, if she attacks, please. See, so, like you block some of these and then boom, and then you switch to the uh, whatever, the hammer, and then go to town with her and destroy her. It is the stuff of legend as I explained again and again and again. This is just to further emphasize how important the, the knockback effect on the piercing shards is. Why am I using the hammer? This was just to emphasize how important it is to have this knockback effect, you know. Just to kind of showcase it. Even, and this is the same. It's, it, whether the air or the ground version, it is the same. They both knock her down. And let me just showcase it one more time. Boom. She's knocked down. Go to town with her. Do whatever you want with her. It is just the stuff of legend. And now I'm going to move on to something else after this. Let's move on to the next thing great about the Spear of Destiny. Or maybe bad. Or who knows. Now we're back here again to the combat arena. This combat arena is a blessing in its own, honestly. Thank God we have this. Anyways, uh, now what I'm going to be touching on is, other than the damage that I explained back there, I'm going to be touching on how good of a setup weapon it is and how much stuff you can do. So I did explain the awesome setup of half collisions. You know how I sent this guy flying and he hit the enemy behind him? I did explain that, right? Now, there are more other stuff that you can do with it, and it's mainly revolving around the triangle of this attack, so... See this launcher? It is slow, right? It is not the most optimal thing, and uh, you, don't want, you don't really want to do this a lot of times. Like, like you might want to favor this, but... We want a cool, fast little launcher that launches even heavy enemies, right? This enemy perfectly gives you that with the triangle. Look at how good this is. So, it is fast... And then it leaves the enemy vulnerable for multitudes of stuff that you can do. Like maybe you want to do this. Maybe you want to launch him and then juggle him for some stuff. And then Orion harpoon him. Maybe you want to do billions of other stuff. Just know that it's a nice little uh, launcher that is just, it just launches enemies fast. And other than that, you can cancel it with the bow to use it for other ring out stuff that I'm going to talk about later in this video. So... This is a long video, so I'm pretty sure you are you should be comfortable by now watching it up to this part. So yeah, you have this and then cancel it to another one where you launch the enemy that high up. And you can ring him out in, in some spots, but... 
it is what it is i just wanted to explain it how good of a setup tool this thing is and then we have this as well and then we also have this as a nice setup tool like maybe you subdue them in a place and then see how that bomb went off it is just the stuff of legend again everything with this weapon is the stuff of legend boom you can you can easily launch one of these guys and vaporize them or maybe launch them towards their friends again Maybe you're facing a Minotaur and, you, and you're you're not feeling safe doing this instantly. So you're better off just launching him, boom, into his friends. And it's a half collision. It's cool damage. It's a nice setup tool. It's everything you ever want in a, in a damaging tool. So you can even go like this, boom, and I just vaporized him. It is perfectly just the best setup tool. And I cannot explain and stress how good it is really. So I hope I demonstrated how good of a setup tool it is. So... Go ahead and use it. Go ahead and do your stuff with it. And just use it, man. It is the best secondary weapon ever. Like, look at this cool little shit. How cool is this motherfucker can be? What am I saying, man? Honestly. Yeah, let's just move on to the next point. Alright, so now here we are in this narrow hallway, which is where this thing shines. This uh, piercing shard uh, just shines. Look at how I'm gonna just deal with the two dogs behind this guy. Just by launching a dog to the guy behind him. It's just easy half collisions that are going to be scored pretty easily. It's like you can even do it with the wing, but we're not going to talk about the wing today since it's not really. When you have this, you don't really need the wing that much. Just know that half collisions can work pretty good in narrow hallways. And it's going to be pretty, pretty well demonstrated in just a second. I'm going to show it to you guys. Boom. Again, see these guys are flying even if two enemies fly together, it still is a half collision and they do still touch each other while in the air. So, do keep that in mind. See that guy's flying towards his friend? It is basically the idea of half collisions. We're basically returning to that, so. I'm gonna skip to one more clip where I showcase how good it can be against the first two waves of the translator. And I'm gonna be right back. Now, here we are at the very first wave and just... Pay attention at, at all these half collisions that are going to be occurring in here. So maybe you're doing a no grab run, right? So what you can do is, of course, and this parry is also a half collision. You know, it sends enemies, knocks them back. And you seen this? If you can shoot and aim these guys towards the outside, and of course, don't launch them towards the translator because he takes damage with collisions. You can work hallways pretty good and just knock enemies into each other and it can work pretty beautifully. I'm going to demonstrate it even better uh, later on with the wave that's going to come after this. So just stay tuned until I reach that. Now here we are. We just spawned the two, the second wave, sorry. And the best strat, let me just showcase it in this video right here. And it's the safest one. Just get the translator back behind this rock. Stand right here. And this is going to be a pretty good showcase of half collisions. Boom. No, not the translator cross. See, I'm going to hit this the satyr and he's going to fly towards his friend. See, I did not hit this guy. This one right here, I did not even hit him. I just hit the satyr. You pretty much get the idea of half collisions by now, but I just want to make it completely clear for you guys. It's like half collisions can work like wonders in uh, narrow hallways. And let me just demonstrate it one more time. And this is, of course, demonstrating the Spear of Destiny. And yeah, it's like I'm going to launch him towards, see? This one got this uh, circle on top of his head purely from the half collision. And it's fair. Wow. And it's just wow. Overall, you pretty much get it. This thing is the best thing in the world. Now we move on to the next thing that is uh, literally the best thing about one of the best things about the Spear of Destiny. And it is the ring out case that, it, that you can uh, cause with it. So in this uh, second wave of the translator, there's a ring out case with this satyr that you can do. And it's pretty easy. You just launch him. Uh, launch him. You cancel it with the bow. You got to be aiming the left analog somewhere. You don't want to get this. This is very slow. See when he does the drawing animation? You get this if you're running and press L2. So he skips the drawing animation. So you can ring out this satyr by sending him flying towards the outside back there. And I'm going to demonstrate how. So you just launch him, launch him, fly, L1 in the air. And let me just position myself better. Just kind of give yourself some range with him so that you kind of hit it and you don't miss. Like this. Boom. And he's sent out uh, to, the, to God knows where, okay? Anyways, you're not going to get orbs because he's still not dead. And I'm pretty sure even if he dies, you're not going to get orbs. 
but that easily allows you to move on to the third wave if you ever are trying to do this of course you're gonna want to uh have the checkpoint glitch right here which i'm not going to be showcasing this is a combat guide it's not a glitch and stuff but uh yeah you can do it for yourself but that's just one ring out case there are also other ring out cases that you might want to try mainly there is this uh legionnaire captain that you reach right here before reaching uriel but i i don't have the footage for ringing him in, for rigging him out but you can do the same thing near the save data in the back so go ahead and do use it to your advantage you might want to do it hold on let me just see if i can do this translator section imagine if i can just get it with this low health and uh unpreparedness boom imagine if i can get it that ought to be really good i can give him another one whatever can i do it and i just wasted one of my boom boom is he dead I think he's dead. I think I'm gonna get the translator no upgrade run without the checkpoint, right? This guy. <laughs> Imagine if I can get it. Imagine. How far? How how far this translator section have fallen for me to beat it casually on a combat guide? There you go. How how much better can this combat guide get? I don't know. But this shit served. No! 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 Look, look, okay. A funny moment in the combat guide. It is what it is. It's still better than having a dry. I don't know how long this video is. It's better, right? Just have a have a funny moment. At least I at least I at least I cleared the hard part of the That was just an honest mistake. And I kicked the dog to the translator. The translator takes Collision damage for whatever reason. The translator takes collision. The translator. Now the next and last thing I want to talk about is that it gives you magic orbs just like okay, not just like the barbarian hammer, but in contrast to the barbarian hammer, the barbarian hammer gives you uh, rage orbs. This one gives you magic orbs whenever you get kills with it. So let's say you ah oh, have infinite magic. Whatever it gives magic orbs doesn't matter even if you kill with a magic attack. You get you get the magic orbs just by having the spear equipped so there's also that that i wanted to mention and now uh we're done with the spear of destiny this was the last uh thing that i wanted to talk whoa this was the last thing that i wanted to talk about with the spear of destiny and uh i feel like this is it but now that i'm already here in the combat arena i want to talk about the blade of olympus and there are just some stuff that i don't understand about it it's actually a lot of stuff that people don't understand about it. okay now what does this weapon have? It has this thing that I'm using. These lasers, L1 and Triangle, same with the Air L1. Uh, the, these are very, very good. They're unaffected with difficulty. They have cool range and damage, so there's that. But the thing is about the Blade of Olympus is that you can only use it in New Game Plus. And uh, I still don't understand why. I wish like we could maybe get it at some point in a second walkthrough. Like, just to use it in a vanilla one and not a New Game Plus run because it can be f a fun weapon to use. Same with these lasers. See these lasers when I'm doing these light attacks? Also, they're the same way. They're still not uh, affected with difficulty. They're, they're actually pretty good. Same with, like, the air triangle if you want to go crazy and then end it with another triangle like this. You can wail at an enemy just by doing this, basically. And it's, it's, it's lovely, honestly. I love this weapon. And then you have, of course, this drilling tactics that you can go with that also wrecks enemies. And on the right part of the screen, you can see Mutilation that I spoke of with the Blade of Artemis PS2 version. Yes, you have Mutilation with this that gives 10 orbs. You have a move that is specifically designed to farm orbs, red orbs. Like, as you can see, it's not killing the enemies. It's just farming red orbs for me. Right? It's cool, huh? The thing is, it's useless. Look, when you're playing on New Game Plus, this thing is the only thing that is unupgraded. Everything else is maxed out unless you finish the game in a no upgrade run, which is, come on, why? At that point, I mean, why would you even bother with the Blade of uh, Olympus, right? It's like, you finish this and this thing has a Red Orbs farming simulator. 
Why would I need this when everything is maxed out in a new game plus? Am I right? And it's like, again, I, can, I come back to the point of why it's only on new game plus. It's, it's, why? Even though, like, I can't find a good, okay, come on, sh I'm always bad against this guy. Anyways, I can't find a good reason for using it whenever you, like, you have the barbarian hammer for your average, bonk, damage. So you're like, you're like, bonk, bonk. You have your damaging tool, and then you have your setup tool. I might be asking myself, like, why would I need to use the Blade of Olympus? I guess at this point, I just want to say for a challenge run, maybe. Or maybe just for fun. But the thing is, you only have it in New Game Plus. Like, why? And that's about that's about how much I want to touch on the Blade of Olympus. And, uh, yeah, the main two weapons for me are, are just the Barbarian Hammer and the Spear of Destiny. Like, other than the Blades of Athena, of course. But, yeah. With that, I come to the end of God of War 2's weapons. Now, we're done with God of War 2's secondary weapons, but there's also something that I can't leave out. While you're having all this fun mobility in the air, boom. Come back down with the T-pose, boom. You might be having all of this amazing mobility, but just remember one thing. This takes away your option to block in the air. Now, I'm gonna also explain something that this is not that much of a turnoff, just like maybe the Blade of Artemis, maybe, you know, air block. Because in here, you at least have tricking in the air. Like, you hold L2 with this. I'm gonna touch on tricking later. But uh, I, I think I have touched on tricking. What the hell? Yeah, you can help hold L2 in the air with the bow and you get iframes. Or maybe with the Uriel's head. See, like, like that. See, I didn't take damage and I took damage back there. But yeah, the thing is, I just wanted to make it clear, it's like, yeah, you have all these amazing tools with the air L1 attacks, but just, this is just to remind you, you don't have air block while having secondary weapons out. That's just to kind of throw it out there, I guess, I, I didn't want to forget this because it is important. But yeah, just, just a side note, you don't have air blocking in this uh, game while having your secondary weapons out. Now, we're done with God of War 2. Wow, why did I scare him like that? Now we're done with God of War 2's secondary weapons. I explained uh, about everything that I know and that is important with them. You can find other uses for some stuff, but I think I said what I needed to say now. Uh, now we're gonna move on to God of War 3, where we have three secondary weapons that are accessible at the same time. Like, you don't have to access a, a menu to access them, right? So, there is that. Anyway, see you guys with God of War 3. Boom, bitch. Now here we are with God of War 3, and let's go through the secondary weapons, shall we? First of all, I want to take one thing out of the way, is that I'm not going to count uh, items as secondary weapons. Yes, the bow is very good. If we're, if we're counting secondary weapons, if we're counting items as secondary weapons, I guess the bow is one of the best fucking things in the world since you can charge it, it, you have infinite amount of it until the meter runs out and it has to recharge. It does cool damage, it can uh, hold enemies in the air for setups and stuff. That is only if you count it as secondary weapon, I'm not gonna count it as a secondary weapon, but yeah, it, it can be counted as that, I mean, come on, it's a... It's very fucking fast, look. You literally can shoot as fast as you can spam square, so come on. Other than that, the head, I don't know, it, it, ha it does have an attack type thing like this. It does have this as well, but then again, this is just this is just an item as it's written. Like, there's also the boots that you can count as weapons and, you know, it's a, it, it can work as a nice setup for some stuff. Like, maybe you launch them, you wait for them, you Orion Harpoon them, which is very useful, useless in God of War 3, sorry. Yeah, you can even charge it so that you can do more damage with it, but I never find myself using it. I guess it is there, and it does... I, I guess you can count items as secondary weapons. Yes, why not? It's just they're not, I guess, original secondary weapons. That's the only thing that I can say about them. Otherwise, if you want to count them as secondary weapons, you can count them. It's your call. What I'm going to speak of right now are the original, the real secondary weapons and are what are being seen like like right here. We have the Claws of Hades, we have the Nemesis, the Nemean Cestus, we have the Nemesis Whip. First of course, of course I'm going to start with the with the Claws of Hades. Now, 
What do we have with the Claws of Hades? We have wide fucking attacks. Wide and reaching attacks. Everything you do with this thing is very fucking wide. I mean, look at the area. Look. Boom. 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 Did you see that? While the sound effects sounded like shit, the other uses for this weapon aren't really that crazy much. You can use it for some setup stuff like the air triangle is actually pretty good for, you know, grabs and stuff. It is very fluid, even against Zeus if you want to grab him in the air. It is good, so there is that, but I can't really find a use for this thing other than actually the soul summon. Yes, the launcher is good, it's fast. Uh, yes, the plume is also pretty good because it hits multiple times. Yes, this game did it before God of War Ascension. See? That plume is gonna hit the enemy uh, multiple times even after it hits him. So please hit him, please. I don't know why it's not doing it, but yeah. Other than that, it has access to Orion Harpoons by the Enders of, of the Square combo, but I'm not gonna touch on that because it's not really that important. What else? The combat grapple that it has is not that useful. Yeah, I mean, it could be good to kind of keep enemies behaving, but that's about it. The launcher is good, as I explained, and that really is about it. I mean, nothing else really that I can go over with this thing. L1 and triangle is a nice damaging tool in the air. You can even launch yourself after the ground L1 triangle, like, you know, L1 triangle, spam X, and you're, you're just launched with the enemy. That is about it for what i can talk about for when it comes to you know attacks with this thing other than that the main real uh you know useful stuff with it other than the plume being really good at, at most cases we have soul summons a total of one two three four five six seven eight nine amps in my bank account you have the soul summon and it can be good that you can you know you're attacking and you have your magic attack coming out so it is good. If you have spots where you can ring out enemies, this can come as a very nice tool because as you can see, it is knocking the enemy back. It is knocking him way back, actually. It's very good. So you can ring out some minotaurs with this if you really... If you're trying to be creative, maybe. Like, do this. See how, how far he's going? And yeah, that's about it. The, the one that I can really talk about for a long time, other than the centaur general, because look at this fucking, look at this, look at this unit! Look! He vaporized him! Other than that, the real one that I want to talk about is the Gorgon Serpent. The Gorgon Serpent, sorry. Now this one, the more I think about it, the more it pisses me off that it is just a flash of the Gorgon instead of, instead of the beam. Now look. I, a homie can only imagine how cool it would have been if we had the beam instead of this flash. This flat. Oh my god. You see, the problem with this flash is that it takes up half of my magic meter just to petrify some enemies in front of me. What I would have perfectly rather having would be holding R2 to get the beam instead of just having, like, okay, maybe give us the, this, you know, this flash. This is the Gorgon flash. Maybe give us that, but why take away the beam? Imagine if the game allowed us to hold R2 to get the beam that we had in God of War 1 and 2. You know, the one where Kratos just holds up the head and it slowly freezes them. This flash is good, but it, see? If the enemy's close, it fucks up and your magic is gone for no reason. And it takes up all of this magic. Like, why? I still don't know why. Imagine if they gave us the option to kind of hold R2 with it. Now, just, just imagine how cool that would have been. Then we would have had Medusa's gaze and, you know, basically the gaze, the beam, for the entirety of the trilogy. Why do they have to butcher it like this? I still don't get it. Granted, it is good. It can, it can freeze a lot of heavy enemies as well. Like, it can freeze the satyr and kill him. You see, you see, it's just... It's just... I don't know. It's like, it's, it takes a lot of, a lot of my magic. It takes a lot of my time. It's good, it freezes enemies, but why not just, why didn't they implement the idea of holding R2 instead of it being the flash? It can freeze up big enemies pretty good, like, as I just noted, it can freeze the satyrs when you're fighting the servers, that's gonna be pretty useful, I know, but it's like, having it as a beam would have worked billions and billions times much better than as a flash, because... With the beam, you kind of know what you're doing and you're not wasting all of your magic. It's kind of, I mean, it's pretty clear which one is better. Like, come on. This one just takes a lot of magic. It just does. It just does take a lot of magic. And that's, 
I'm sorry, but that's actually about it for what I can talk about for when it comes to, you know, the Claws of Hades. I should probably move on to the Nemean Cestus next, and it's just a tragedy that the, the petrification got fucked up like this with God of War 3. I wish it stayed in the game, honestly. Because it's just weird how we don't have a, like, an optimal, good petrification system in the game. It's just weird. Anyways, next up, we're gonna move to the Nemean Cestus. The best damaging tool in the history of humanity, as what I think that is. So, uh, where do I uh, begin? So, first off, I'm gonna talk about the magic, since I mentioned magic, uh, magic. First off, I'm gonna begin with the damage, since I started with mag with damage uh, talks and all that. This thing is a beast. This thing is literally a beast. Every time you hit an enemy with it, you hear a lion roar, if you can hear it. <coughs> But that's besides the point. This thing damages, and if you cancel it with the bow, you know, one, two, cancel. Boom, 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 boom. And you just, you just wreck every enemy around you. As you can see, it's pretty clear the amount of damage that you do with this. Just block every now and then, of course. Like, against this guy, you can wreck his ass by just square, square, and canceling it with the bow. You can just destroy him. See, this is what I mean when I say it's the best damaging tool. Now, why is it better than the Barbarian Hammer in my opinion, huh? It's because as you just saw back there, how fast you can evade with it. You can at least evade, like, evade, boom, boom, dodge again, boom, boom, dodge, boom, 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 boom. And in the air, you have just a barrage of punches, or you can hold square where you get this, and you can triangle that slams him down, and you have triangle that does some nice area of effect damage that does a lot more than what i'm showing right now let me just showcase it let's say we're fighting three minotaurs right now it's uh it's not often where you fight three minotaurs but look at this boom boom it not only does it do, does it do some sweet damage it also launches everyone how cool is this and look at the area of effect it's like it, it reaches it has reach it does cool damage it fuck it it fucks that's basically what i'm trying to kind of report to you guys there are reasons on why I have it as my favorite damaging tools. Like, you have some stuff that literally just wreck enemies. Like, boom. Boom. Or, you know, triangle and then square can also do good business. Like, look at this. If you go ham with square on these enemies, it's just... It's a whole different story. Look. Boom. 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 And the, the launcher is fucking good. And then you can go to town with enemies. Like, after launching an enemy... You can kind of even juggle him with it, see? It's fucked up. It's fucked up how good it is. Or, you know, holding square where he destroys the enemy. Everything about this, and it's even viable other than it doesn't doing a lot of damage. Like, look at this. You have an attack, L1 square, where it knocks everyone around. And other than this doing cool damage, it also knocks them away from you. So, it is everything viable and useful and a damaging tool. It is amazing how you can even evade with it in the air, on the ground perfectly. While the evade is the worst evade between all the other weapons since you have much better evades with other weapons, it is still an evade that gives you iframes and you're still at least evading and you have more mobility in how good it is. I'm gonna touch on this later in a second. Just know that this is a very nice damaging tool, and it's just fucking, it, it just fucks. Holding square is just, hold on, let me just boom. Look at this. Look at this. Uh, you can't look at this because I'm trash at the game, but yeah, just basically holding square, look at this. You destroy everyone. Now, let me talk about another, uh, another damaging strat, and it's quick swapping from the claws to the... Nemean Cestus. This is something that I explained in my old God of War 3 guide. Now, of course, you don't want to watch that guide, but... Uh, what I'm doing is I'm swapping from the claws to the hammer, to the to the Cestus, and then inputting one square attack. Hold on, let me just make it easier. This thing that I call the Nemean Barrage, it's about pressing L1 and X with the claws, where you get this. Kratos switches to the Nemean Cestus. And then with the Nemean Cestus equipped, you press square... And then, you know, after pressing square once, you switch back to the claws and L1 and X again. What you get is pretty much the most demolishing move ever. Hold on, let me just, let me just make him behave. Boom, 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 boom. It is the most damaging tool that you can use. If you're doing a no upgrade run, make sure to use this because you'll wreck everyone around you. It's like, look at this. 
Whenever something goes south, you can either launch the enemy or do whatever you want with them. This is what I this is why I call it the Nemium Barrage. You're literally fucking everyone. Now this is also good for uh, mobility that I'm gonna also explain in a second. It's something that I used to call advanced dodging, and I'm still gonna call it that because look at the look at how mobile you can be with this. If you're if you're good enough, you can really use this and not even evade. Like you can. Maybe this guy's gonna come at me. Look what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna evade with this and then come back and strike him with the with the Cestus. It is actually that good. So whenever you have it, you can use it whenever you want. Like, boom. And you're instantly out of the scene with it. It's just that good. And it's about it. You, you can learn to go slow with it. Like, L1 and X, square, right. L1 and X, square, right. L1 and X, square, deep at right. L1 and X, square. And you can get much faster with it with practice, so... Make sure to practice it because it's good. It's there's an argument for this being also like I don't know which is better. Maybe square square canceling with the bow can be better in some spots, but from what I've seen, this Nemean barrage is uh, much crazier. It's faster and uh, does more damage, I think, because because this thing does a lot of damage. It also has better reach, but yeah, the Nemean Cestus, to put it short, is a nice damaging tool, but it does have one flaw, and is that the magic attack gets nerfed with difficulty, so you don't want to have this, so... You see this? It might look powerful and all that, and it is powerful. Granted, it does get nerfed with difficulty, but it still does cool damage, but just know that... Using this is a much more viable option, or maybe using this, the Nemesis Rage, is a more viable option. Just know that this is getting nerfed with difficulty. This is 75% of its original strength. So just in case you wanted to know, I, I, I'm i just going to leave it here. Also, there's also another uh, cute little tips and tricks for this magic attack. And it's that you can cancel it with a jump after the first slam. So you do this, jump. Do this, jump. If you want to for some reason cancel the second slam. See, like the second slam that comes after, you can, you can perfectly cancel it by just jumping like this. Now that I'm done with some of these sections about talking the, the damage output with it and the magic getting nerfed with difficulty, I'm gonna move on to the next thing. The next category, I did explain it uh, lightly while I was explaining damage output and stuff, and it's just how lightweight and how mobile you are while having these. Instead of with, with the hammer in God of War 2 where you were always, you know, kinda heavy and stuff with the hammer, so you were doing a lot of damage, but you would sacrifice mobility, of course, like being unable to block in the air, being unable to dodge on the ground. With this one, you can perfectly block in the air, you have a lot faster moves, and everything is faster, and you're still outputting a lot of crazy damage. You have crazy AoEs that are also fast, like you can... The launcher is also here, so... Billions of other really beautiful tools that make this my favorite damaging tool in all of God of War. Yes, I love it more than the Blade of Artemis and the Barbarian Hammer. It is what it is. And it's just that, look at the mobility, like, the fact that you can dodge with this, it just it says a lot, even for how shitty the dodge is, when compared to these, of course. It is good, it's a nice little sidestep that you can, that you, you, you at least have a sidestep that gives you iframes, like, isn't that all you wanted? It's a sidestep that gives you iframes, that's what you want in your evade, that's literally every evade, except these just have better range and overall better movement to them than the Nemean Cessus one. Other than that, the Nemean Cestus just has some of the nicest fucking... How can I explain it? It's so nice. You... The point is for this category is that you're so lightweight. Like, you, you can dash in the air. You can dodge like this on the ground. It is just something that... I don't know how to explain my love for it any more than this. I just hope you use it. And you... I, I'm pretty sure you do use it. Just the fact that Kratos is punching the fuck out of his enemy is everything you need to know. Like... Like, have you, have you held square with this thing? I repeat, have you held square? Look. Don't need to show you. You pretty much know what happens. But look. Boom. The fucking damage. Or oh, the combat grapple where he drags an enemy towards him. I'm gonna talk about the combat grapple in a second more. Because it has more important stuff going on for it. Other than just dragging enemies towards. It's like, this Minotaur is getting dragged. Even for a little bit, he's at least getting dragged. Hold on, let me just showcase it. Even for a little bit, boom, you do drag him towards you and you do some beautiful damage. It can also work for ring outs as well, so there's also that, just like the, the normal combat grapple. 
Basically, this whole point was about how mobile and lightweight you are while using it, how fast you are, and you're outputting damage. Like, look at look at this fast launcher. And look at this nice juggling action. Look at this nice knockback. This nice everything. It's like, especially this barrage that I just explained a second ago. You're just broken whenever you use this thing, and I just love it. I fucking love it. That's all that I can say. I love the Nemean Sisters and how, and how lightweight it is. Now that we're done with this one, I'm going to move on to the next beautiful strat. And let me just look at my notes. All right. Now you might be saying, uh, Zesty, what are you doing against the most annoying enemies in the world? Now here's something pretty pretty uh, great that you can try with the Nemean Cestus. And it's, uh, of course, you all know that you can break shields with it, right? It's the only way to kind of damage these Onyx shields with. It's like the only way basically to damage them, right? If you're doing a pain plus run or maybe... Uh, yeah, may, yeah, a pain plus or maybe a pain run where you can't use other weapons other than the blades and you don't want to accidentally hit anyone with the with the cestus and you just want to break the shields. There are some pretty cool strats that I'm going to teach you right now and it's and it involves of course the claws of Hades as well, but the main thing is about the Nemean cestus breaking them. So, let's first start with pokes. What are pokes? This is a poke. Boom. Uh, actually, hold on. Let me do it on the ground. It's much better on the ground. Boom. Did you see that? You kind of uh, damage him. The game just gone. The game just went stupid. The game just. The, like I'm just trying to God of War three, please. All right, there is something in the form of pokes, as you can see. So just if you wanna kind of poke an enemy and take away his shield by simply uh, from a, from a far range. You can do it easily with the combat grapple, L1 is circle, and Kratos just kind of taps the enemy's shield, and he somewhat damages it. It is very good, so as you can see, this, this is a very safe thing if you want to do a pain plus run, and you're running through that one gauntlet. Boom, it's like a bullet, it's very, very cool. And when the shield breaks, don't worry, you're not getting disqualified, you're not hitting the enemies with the Nemean Cestus. Just know that it's good from afar to kind of use it, but... It, it can be very specific. I mean, why do that when you can just go ham on shieldy boys? That is, of course, if you don't want to uh, control the spawns and if you don't know the spawn rules and you just want to go all out. Now I want to explain something that you can do that, that can also actually make the... Make breaking shields like a lot of boys maybe are spawning in front of you and a lot of them have shields, right? Now, I did explain how good the plume is with the Claws of Hades, right? Or was it... Wh what's it called? I think it's called Sorrow, but anyways, you might be saying, Zesty, what do you mean? What are you talking about? How can this break shields? You would be right. It cannot break shields unless you try one thing, and it's uh, switching to the Nemean Cestus the moment you... Wow, the moment you die. Anyways, here I'm gonna demonstrate it. Boom. See? After you drop the plume, press down on the d-pad and just walk around or even stand in your place actually, whatever, see? It's just about pulling out the Nemean Cestus and then you see the magic happen. Now why is this happening? You're pinning the damage, like see how this plume does damage even after you drop it as I just explained with the claws section? Now when you switch to the Nemean Cestus, the game is gonna think you're attacking them with the Nemean Cestus. So you're kind of buffering Nemean Cestus attacks on the shields, boom, see? This can be very, very useful in your runs. And if you don't want to take damage, this is the most useful thing. Instead of getting in their faces and risking getting hit, like, see, that guy attacks? It is very dangerous. Instead of doing all that, you can zone them out pretty nicely by doing this. So, like, plume, switch to the, uh, to the Nemean Cestus. Just like that, boom. And it just breaks through the shield way too easily. And... You kind of have your distance with them. You're completely safe. I just wanted to explain this because it is important. And that's what I'm doing in this video. Explaining important stuff. And uh, that's about it for the Neiman Cestus, I guess. That was the last thing. I just explained the pokes that I hope will help you in your pain and pain plus runs. And I just explained this thing that is very important against uh, shieldy boys. If you want to take him out from a distance. If you want to be safe while doing it. And I explained everything about how being mobile with it and how uh, much damage you can do with it. You can air block, you can air dash, you can ground dash, you can fuck dash, you can do everything. That's about it for the Nemean Cestus. We're gonna move on to the Nemesis Whip, but not against these shitty ass uh, enemies. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Nemesis Whip. 
Hold on, let's do a better whip out animation. The Nemesis Whip! Okay. The Nemesis Whip, just like the Spear of Destiny, is a setup weapon and it is very, very nice to use. It is very useful, it is very good, it can farm rage orbs for you if you hold square. I'm not I'm gonna I'm not gonna get to that any longer. You basically know the basics about this weapon. What I'm gonna explain are gonna be the setup stuff first. So since I started with setup and talking all the setup stuff, look at this launcher. Now, the problem, the one small problem with this launcher is that you cannot switch to another weapon for another Orion Harpoon. Even though you wouldn't really need it, like, you can instantly hit circle after launching one with the Nemesis Whip itself, so that, you know, you might not need to switch to another weapon. But there might, there might have been some uses to do this kind of sometimes, with, like, if you needed an alternate Orion Harpoon, which I'm gonna touch on later, against the Harpies, but it is what it is. The thing is, this thing is a very nice setup tool. Like, look at this launcher. It is much faster than the Spear of Destiny, but I guess the Spear of Destiny's uh, launcher is better since the enemies don't keep flying away out of your reach for the Orion Harpoon. Like, you know, I did it back there, but I kind of delayed it a little bit. But then again, you also have it for... Uh... Actually, I still don't know, honestly. Right now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know which launcher is better. Is it the Spear of Destiny or the Nemesis Whip? Just know that it's good. This one is very good. Like, it is very fucking fast. Boom. You can instantly get to action and destroy anyone around you. So, that is just to keep in mind. The triangle is very fucking fast. You can instantly, you know, press circle to get an Orion Harpoon. As you saw back there. Boom, boom, boom. It is very, very fucking useful. Or, uh, you can do a billion stuff stuff with it. It sets up the air for, you know, air damaging stuff or anything really. It launches every enemy nearly every enemy of course enemies that aren't launchable of course they're not gonna get launched with this but as you can see i'm canceling it with the bow and it is just the fucking best honestly right now that i'm thinking about it it is a better launcher than the spear of destiny the spear of destiny is my still my favorite weapon but this is just a better launcher as a whole like you can even send enemies to death ceilings which can happen in some areas but not every area but just know that it's a setup weapon. And now that I explained the triangle and how useful it is, of course, you know, let me explain it with the Minotaur, which it can be very useful. Like, maybe you're fighting uh, some normal enemies and a, and a Minotaur, for example. And you want to take advantage of uh, the situation and kind of beat these guys up and not fight the Minotaur. What you can do is launch them, subdue them with an Orion Harpoon, which is very good, and then get busy with these guys. And then again, like, you can try it always. You can always try this. It's... It is the best setup for Orion Harpoon, because the moment you launch an enemy, you can instantly Orion Harpoon him, and it can't get any better than this. Just wanted to mention, it is the best uh, setup tool in God of War 3, and it is actually, I think, the only setup tool in God of War 3. Just know, how, just know that it is, it is very fucking useful and to use it in your combat scenarios. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is also another setup tool that you can use for your advantage, and it's L1 and uh, Square. Now, this launches everyone around you. It is very fucking useful. See how everyone is around me in the air? And you can switch to the blaze to kind of get more damaging stuff in instead of the... Instead of keeping on attacking with the L1 square of this. Or you can even attack with triangle in the air like doing this. This can also wreck some enemies sometimes. And then mixing it up with L1 square. Because this thing does some nice damage. It's not just... It's not just for show. See? It kind of wrecks enemies. But yeah, this is another setup tool that you can use for your advantage. It's uh, it's cool that you can, of course, quick swap to other weapons. And it's cool that you can grab an enemy and attack him in the air. It's basically another setup weapon, is what I'm trying to say. See, like, let me just make it, make it clear one more time. It's a nice AoE that launches everyone in front of you. So, yeah. Next up, I think, yeah, after this, I think, what I have in my notes is I wrote that Orion Harpoon, and yes, it is good with every single fucking enemy that can be launched, like, you launch an enemy and you have billions of stuff with it, it is truly one of the best setup weapons ever, it's like, this you can even cancel it with triangle, with, uh, with the bow, sorry, what I'm doing is, of course, not that, it's much better to be used as this, you know, where you can, you can get a minotaur maybe down, hold on, let me just, let me just demonstrate it, after launching him, Orion Harpoon him, and, you know, go to town with them. You can also do this, but it is what it is. You can try whatever you want with uh, with the with this amazing weapon. So, yeah, his head is stuck on the ground. Wow. 
And yeah, that's about it for the setup stuff with uh, with the Nemesis Whip. There's also this that you can use to your advantage, but it is not really that useful. I mean, there's this for ring outs that I've seen Haristos use it sometimes, but it is not really the best thing, and it's not that good of a setup tool. It's not even that good of a damaging tool. I don't know what it's good for. Other stuff is, of course, holding the, the button. I don't know how much that how much useful that can be for setup stuff, but... Just know that it exists. Uh, I, I just wanted to include it in here. And that's about it. Now, the next thing I also want to explain is that it is good that it kept the same combat grapple. Yes, it would have been lovely to have a new combat grapple, but just having the original Blades of uh, Exile, uh, yeah, Hyperion grapple, Hyperion Ram, sorry. It is good, honestly. It is the best uh, grapple, of course, in my opinion. And it is the most viable one, so there's a reason I included it here. It is very useful, and thank god they kept the same uh, thing with it. It's the same combat grapple, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Now, next, what I want to talk about is the magic attack of this weapon, and it is little, do little does nobody know, I guess. It is unaffected with difficulty. So, this basically a shittier version of Chronos Rage, in my opinion. It is unaffected with difficulty. It may... It, like, the reason I like Chronos Rage more than this is because... Uh, the only reason I, I like Chronos Rage more is because it has a huge explosion at the end. And I think it does more damage. This one made up for the huge explosion with the range. Like, it reaches from every fucking where. It just... I have described it before uh, and I've called it a sniper bullet. And it literally is that. It's very fucking fast. It's so good. That is it. I just wanted to explain how it's not nerfed with difficulty. The next thing I want to talk about is the pure damage this motherfucking thing does. It's like, it's like, I don't even need to get to how much damage it does since it is pretty clear. I like, it, like, just the fact that you can hold square is alone to showcase how cool of a damaging tool it can also be. It's like the L1 is square. You can wreck enemies with it as I just showcased back there. It does some nice damage. The magic does some nice damage. Uh... You know, holding attacks like this does some cool damage. And then the last one, of course, wrecks everyone. See? It even causes knockback if you do it like this. Yeah, I just wanted to explain that it also has nice damage going for it. It's not just uh, fast and electric and all that and stuff. It also has some nice damage. And I wanted to include it in here. Especially like, you know, when you do this and hold triangle. L1 and triangle after the ear. You hold triangle and you build up rage orbs and it is it can be good sometimes but i don't advise using this but it can be good but anyways you have holding even with triangle of course you can hold everyone in the air the more you want see like this it, sh it, it is basically a shredder in the air see boom and here we are Alright, now I'm gonna move on to the last thing, and it's uh, a misconception, I think, about the weapon. And I just want to explain it, actually. Let's take off the Minotaur just to kind of ease off a little bit. There is a mis misconception about this weapon, and it's that it doesn't have a slam. So, what we know from God of War 3 weapons is that every weapon has a slam type attack. Like, the, of course, with the blades, it's the plume. Boom. With the claws, it's the... I don't know if it's called Sorrow or Plume, I don't know, but it is Square Square Triangle, basically. With the Nemean Cessus, we have Boom, Boom, either the Triangle or Square Square Triangle. It is a slam, right? A major misconception with the Nemesis Whip is that it does not have a slam attack, and that is kind of far from the truth, since it does have it. The third hit of the Square Combo, it counts as a slam, and I'm gonna demonstrate it right now. See this? Look at the last one. Look at the enemy reaction whenever I hold the last one. Did you see that? Not just pressing it, of course, holding it. Square Square holding the last one counts as a slam. This can be very good for both being a slam and an infinite slam at that. You can hold square and you get this effect. See how the enemy kind of bounces? And so that completely disproves the point of it not having a slam attack. There it is. And, it, and it's kind of very good when it comes to... Like, the liability, like, you, you're kind of always juggling the enemy non-stop while having this, so. Yeah, you might be saying, where's the square square triangle? Well, square square triangle only gives you this. You can't really, like, this only happens after every attack. Kratos just does the launcher. 
The third square hit is a slam. Proven by the enemy reaction to the hits and boom, see? Hold on, let me just demonstrate it. Hold square, boom. You want to hold square to get the slam effect. And that's about it. I just wanted to explain this since it is a kind of a misconception for everyone. Thinking that it doesn't have a slam. It does have a slam attack and I just wanted to demonstrate it for you guys so that you guys know that it does have a slam attack. Although it's not that viable. I don't know why would you want to use this inf instead of any other tools that you can use for your advantage. I just felt like including it in here honestly. So yeah. With this, we reached the end of God of War 3 secondary weapons. Of course, I'm not going to count the rage because that's a rage mode. And I'm, I only counted the God of War 2 rage mode in this combat guide because it is really the most important rage. So God of War 1's rage has a lot of problems that I'm now willing to go in. It's basically a damaging thing in God of War 1's so like nothing to go in too deep about. And in God of War 3, this is supposed to be a damaging tool, yet it is the shittiest tool ever in the game. And you can only like cancel animations with it and stuff and nothing more so there's that to your knowledge and also one more thing that i want to slide into here with the nemesis whip this evade counts as a jump kratos is kind of jumping between places and so activating the rage mode after evading gives you this boom see boom like i evade and i activate the rage it because you know the evade counts as a jump for some reason see like boom and I can't... Okay, they're activated, whatever. Yeah, that is just a simple little thing I wanted to include, but... Yeah, it's about it for the God of War 3 secondary weapons. Now we're gonna move on to another whole other category. We're finally done with discussing secondary weapons. Oh my god. Woo! This took way too fucking long. I hope you guys like and subscribe. There is still a long way to go. But th just know that this is taking way longer than you think. <laughs> Let's move on to the next category. Next up, this is something exclusive to God of War 3 and it's Jet Dash. Now, in God of War 3, you can dash with the right analog after getting the Boots of Hermes where you can, you know, with the wings, you can kind of go in, in all four ways. Now, just real quick, I, I wanted to get something out of the way before explaining the jet dash, and it's that this does not give you iframes. So, while this looks like an evade in the air, an evade option in the air, it does not give you iframes like the ground rolling or evading. So, just wanted to throw this out there. Now, the thing is, with the air dash, you can only do it once with the right analog, normally. But thanks to Findlestick, we can do this. Now, how is this achieved? You can hold L2 and uh, the right analog, uh, while having the Bow of Apollo equipped, of course, you can't do this with the Head of Helios or the Boots of Hermes. You gotta have the Bow of Apollo equipped, in the air, hold L2, and aim the right analog to wherever you want. This is cool, but we even have a, a fucking crazier and more insane one. We have the full glory of the Jet Dash, and by having the... Of course, even with the previous one, you gotta have the Blades of Exile equipped as well. So you had to have the Blades of Exile and the Bow of Apollo. With this one, is the same thing. But, except you hold L2 and L1 in the air and aim the right analog to whatever you want. And you get this madness that you're seeing on the screen right now. So, yeah, this was just the, the Jet Dash and it's of course exclusive to God of War 3. We don't have anything like this in God of War 2. Just wanted to explain it and let's move on to the next thing. Next up, another God of War 3 exclusive thing and it is the Infinite Tartarus Rage. Or, I like to call it this. It's not like this actually. So with the Blades of Exile, you can actually ride big enemies in the air if you kind of can balance yourself on top of them. Hence why I call it Infinite Tartarus Rage. You just hold L1 and Triangle in the air with level 5 blades, maxed out blades by the way. And you can kind of, as you guys can see, uh, you can balance yourself on top of an enemy and stay on top of them. And Kratos does this Beyblade move where he just keeps on spinning. This motherfucker keeps on spinning. I just had to include this in this video since it's a really nice damaging tool and uh, it's a nice DPS. Like it's crazy. You can stay on the on top of a Cyclops and wreck him. I've used this multiple times in randomizers. Every time I meet the Tartarus, this is instantly this instantly comes to mind. So yeah, this make sure to use this instead of what square square triangle or whatever they call it. These these kits, man. These kits. And that's about it. Let's move on to the next thing. Now next up, what I want to talk about is, of course, the Gorgon uh, 
the Gorgon head or Medusa head or Uriel's gaze, Uriel's head or whatever, yeah. So Medusa's gaze in God of War 1 is actually one of the best tools in the entirety of all God of War. So what do we have here? You know that you can, you know, freeze enemies with it and uh, shatter them pretty easily, right? You know all the basics of the whole weapon. Now, I'm just going to go over some stuff that are going to be kind of vital for you to understand. Hold on, let me just... I want to be left with one uh, Cyclops to kind of explain it. The thing is, we all know how it does and what it does and stuff. I'm just going to be explaining some extra stuff that you might not be aware of. Okay, so one thing being... Don't try to freeze an enemy when they're close to you. Don't you ever try that because sometimes you might lose, uh, actually hold on, let me just, the beam as I'm gonna show right now is pretty, see it's pretty wide if you do it like this, you know, from a far range. It is much better than doing it from a close range where the enemy might be, might keep turning around you and not allow you to do your thing with him. So it's like, hold on, like doing this maybe, the enemy's gonna start turning around you all the time and it's not gonna be, see? And if he's even closer, it's even worse than that, than, than what I just showed. It can be pretty, pretty bad, so. There is that. Now, I just wanted to explain that you have to know your range. Like, you gotta try it from a far range first. So, don't go ahead and do it however you want. It's not gonna work beautifully. From a far range, the beam is kind of wide and it freezes literally everything that is in wow. You see, from a far range, it is the safest thing to use. Not in, even mid-range, really. Just make sure to not use it when really in a close range or anything because you don't want to miss your... You, you want to use it efficiently with your magic and stuff, so... That is just a thing to keep in, in the back of your mind. Now, there's also something else I want to explain that you might not have known about the... Medusa Gazing God of War 1. And is that you can actually do the Gorgon Flash while beaming, so... While I'm holding square, I can press triangle and Kratos just does the flash. You know, the flash kind of... It is the one that takes a bit out of your magic and it's not just a beam. One quick note that I want to leave right here and it's a it's a really beautiful detail that really tells the player to not go st stupid mode and waste all their magic. Notice how the targeting is red with Medusa's head in here. This is basically the game telling you do not waste what's left of your magic because you cannot get this enemy. This happens even when the enemy is out of range. So if the enemy's out of range or if you don't have enough magic to freeze the said enemy, the game tells you that by kind of changing the color of the targeting to red instead of the usual blue. Just just thought I might leave this here because it's very, very useful. Let's go back to the video. See, like, let me just demonstrate one more time. Instead of this beam going on, I'm doing this while the beam is happening. So like that and then boom, boom, boom. You can do it while beaming, basically. So if you want the fastest way to freeze an enemy, sometimes maybe the enemy's in front of you. You want to really have the most optimal ways of freezing him. Like sometimes you can even do it with one flash and while freezing him and stuff. So there's also that. But if you really want to be the safest, just go ahead and beam him only. If you, you know you, you have your range with him and stuff. Why not? Just go for the safe approach. It is the best thing you can ever ask for. And so, yeah, I want to talk about these two things. Now, I have made a video before about, you know, how you can gain a lot of red orbs with the Medusa's Gaze. And that can also be useful for God of War 1 if you really... If you are really greedy but other than that it is just majorly a good thing to use it is good in crowds and stuff it is good if you know how to kind of i guess organize it and how to have it you know if you have some like not some like even a lot of enemies you can have them lined up perfectly and just freeze them pretty easily like this and then go to town with them it's either this or that it doesn't matter at least you just kind of froze them all and shattered them just know that you gotta have all enemies in a bulk to freeze them all in one go. It is much better. See like how the beam is kinda... It's not a still beam like God of War 2 and I'm gonna get to that. It's kinda moving around so... It can be very wide when enemies are standing in front. Now there's one more thing that I want to talk about God of War 1 and then I'm gonna move on to God of War 2. And it's the Gorgons. Medusa's gaze has no effect on Gorgons. This is something important that you need to know in God of War 1. Doesn't matter how much you flash them, they will not get frozen. I wanted to do the uh, beam so that I can showcase the way to punish. Roll, square, square, triangle, whole triangle, boom. And grab her infinitely in the air. Except you don't want to really ascension your way to her in the air. Just simple jump. Boom, boom, boom. And you can infinitely air grab uh, this Gorgon. I'm going to get to it in a in a next category. And that's about it for the Gorgon. Medusa Gaze in God of War 1 now. 
there's also one more move hold on let me just showcase it to you guys it is a it can be useful sometimes oh wow the checkpoint fucked me up it is the l1 in circle now that one i don't really advise using it because i mean it can be a good move sometimes but you don't really want to use it you want to just use the medicine gaze optimally and not just go all out crazy with it like if i can make it to the other end of this arena i'm pretty sure i'm gonna showcase it but so far hold on let me just see how i took him off screen and he's not attacking he's willing to attack then he cancels it notice how the archer is gonna cancel his thing look see as he was trying to shoot it i go off screen and he stops I did explain it in earlier segments of this video, so there's that. Anyways, uh, L1 is circle. L1 and... Okay, fucking stop. It freezes everyone around you, it's not just that. Let's try it on the Minotaurs right here. It is an area of effect freeze, and you don't really want to use it, like, at all, in my opinion. Let me just showcase it. Here it is. Boom. It literally freezes everything and everyone around you, but you really don't want to use it. It's like, it takes a lot of magic. It's like the God of War 2, the God of War 3 Soul Summon of the Serpent. It is, it just takes a lot of your magic and it's, it is much better than the God of War 3 one, of course. This is an area of effect, but yeah, it just takes a lot of uh, magic and it's much better off to use the beam, so... Yeah, I just wanted to drop that at the very end of this segment. Now, let's move on to God of War 2's Uriel's head. And oh my god, where do I begin with that one? Let's go. Now, I did forget to mention one thing about God of War 1 is that you can do this in the air, but I just forgot to mention it. But it is what it is. Basically, in here, and it's basically all, already showcased how good the Uriel's head is in God of War 2. Let's go through it and just... Uh, explain the amount of great things that come from this thing and yeah hold on ashley all right now we're back with no infinite magic so the first thing of course is tricking and i have explained tricking to full effect in uh earlier in this video tricking is basically going through enemies attacks even if it's unblockable so yeah other than that let's just get that out of the way the fucking thing is just so good so the usual beam just like the god of war one beam but there's a little bit of difference that I want to ex uh, explain right now. See how the beam is not... It's a still beam. See, it's like it doesn't flow around. It's a still beam on one place, but it is still wide. So, again, doing it from, from a farther range is much better than a close range. Now, other than that, in God of War 2, as you can pretty clearly see, you can move around while holding it. You don't know how much that helps. Sometimes you really want to back off while, you know, while trying to beam someone like this. It is so much more important than you think. It might not be the most important thing because in God of War 1, you can still ma manage without uh, moving. But it is what it is. It is an important thing and it's, it is here. So why not? I should, I, I have to mention it. It is a nice upgrade that you can move with Uriel's head in hand. And you can beam, and you can flash, and you can do anything. Now, this thing has everything the God of a One uh, Medicine Gaze has, but better. It's like, it's literally the perfect definition of everything you do, I can do better. So, you have a beam, of course the same. You have a flash. Uh, and in here, you cannot flash while beaming like God of a One. But it is what it is. I mean, come on, you can just, you can just simply beam like... Boom. Freeze, bitch. And it is what it is. I, I keep saying it is what it is. Other than that, it has one more attack than the God of War 1, you know, Uriel head counterpart, which is the Medusa Gaze. L1 and Circle. Now, this also freezes them, and it does take more, a lot of magic, but it does instantly freeze them, so there's that. I think it's area, it's an area of effect. I'm going to test it in a second. Boom. Yes, it is an area of effect, so whenever you drop it on the ground, so can even do it on the floor so let's just demonstrate it real quick boom it uh it kind of yeah it, it is an area of effect uh, attack and it kind of freezes everyone around it so it is very good that is something i actually just learned about it so there's this and there's also another attack another 360 attack that happens if you hold circle i'm holding circle right now l2 and holding circle boom everyone is frozen around you 
It is literally Medusa's gaze from God of War 1, except better in nearly every kind of ways. Like, God of War 1 does have the 361, but this has an extra attack as well. Boom! Everyone is frozen. Bam. Bam. And it does not take as much damage as the God of War 1 um, Medusa gaze does when you do the 360. In God of War 1, if you, if you do the 360 thing, you're just taking half of your magic bar, while in here you can even do maybe four times so that's three yes you can do it four times with a full magic bar damn that is such a nice thing to know so you can do it four times uh and it's <laughs> i don't need to explain it any further now again just like god of a one having all of the enemies in a bulk then beaming them is the best thing like having them all crawled up in one space like from this range right here, having them all in a bulk in one place, just see you freeze kind of all of them. And I did demonstrate it in God of War 1 as well, hopefully, so there's that. See, from a farther range, it is much better. Let me showcase what happens when you're in a close range. Like, sometimes the enemy, see? The enemy took way longer to freeze than normally from a far range like that. See, sometimes he turns around and he kind of fucks up with your beam. And especially in God of War 1 where the character switches automatically if the, if the enemy turns around way too much. Now, there is one downgrade when compared to the God of War 1 uh, petrification, and is that the red orbs gaining. So in here, if you kill an enemy by shatter, boom, you get 15, the crushed metal. If you kill him by ruined, you also get 15. See, it's a ruined metal. It's even a different metal. I don't know why. In God of War 1, the air shatter, you know, when they... See, that's why you don't want to do it when you're close. This is what happens when you're close. Did you see how long it took to freeze him? When in fact it should take only this bit. And he's frozen. That was a pretty good demonstration on why it's bad to freeze when up, when up close. Anyways, back to where I was talking about. Uh, in here there is this thing where you freeze an enemy in the air and they drop and shatter, right? Except it gives 15 orbs instead of the 30 that it used to give in God of War 1, but... It is what it is. I mean, there are still billions of other tools, like you have grabs that you can work in God of War 3, but that is the one thing that the God of War 1 Medusa Gaze is superior at, so just wanted to include it. My god, do I need to explain this even more. It's just so it's just so good. The fact that you can move, the fact that you even have a new one and you can do it in the air. You can do all you can even do the beam in the air, which is something you couldn't do in God of War 1. It's everything you could ever ask for in a petrification. And I, I cannot believe that God of War 3 just botched petrification like it did. Like, imagine the possibilities they could have went far enough for if they, if they had it as a soul summon with the, with the Claws of Hades. Instead, they just went with the route of having it as a flash that takes half of your magic bar. Whose call was that and how did it get greenlit? I still don't know, but it is what it is. It's in the past now. It's no problem, but... God, do I wish we had a we had a proper uh, petrification system in God of War One. That God of War Three, that would have worked wonderfully. But it is what it is. The best petrification is God of War Two by a by a fucking okay, not not a not a wild mile, not a far far mile. I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's not crazy crazy better than God of War One, but it is for sure. Like I would even say much better than God of War One's petrification. So there is that, and now uh, we're done. I don't think I need to cover God of War 3 specification, because I did when I was explaining the Claws of Hades. It is just a beam instead of... It is the Flash, sorry, instead of the beam that we that we all know and love. So there is that. Now let's move on to the next thing that I'm going to explain, hopefully. Guys, 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 one small little detail that I'm glad I did not forget, and is that you can literally petrify every single enemy in this game. Yes, even the Gorgons that you couldn't do in God of War uh, 1, you can petrify them easily in God of War 2, as you can see. Uh, hold on, let me just use the 360 one, you know? Hold up. Actually, let's just, let's just reverse one of the beams. Boom. Everything can be frozen in God of War 2. Maybe not the Titan Minotaur, but I'm going to try it in a second. But just know that you can freeze literally everything in God of War 2. Unlike God of War 1, where you, you couldn't really freeze... Uh, See? You can freeze everything and everyone in God of War 2. In God of War 1, you couldn't freeze Gorgons because for some reason the game felt like not allowing you to do that. But in here, you can perfectly freeze them. And uh, yeah, and these red Gorgons, I'm going to showcase it. These ones, 
they break out way faster. Did you see that? She broke out way faster than normal. She even gets petrified way too late. But yeah, anyways, you can freeze every Gorgon, and thank God I did not forget. I did not forget that. I I had to mention it because it's an important. Uh, it's a it's a very much more uh, important upgrade from the God of War One petrification. Petrification as a whole, because I'm not talking about Uriel's head or Medusa's gaze or anything. I'm talking as a whole, like petrification in its own is much better in God of War 2 since you can even uh, freeze Gorgons, so yeah. As you can see, I'm beaming the hell out of this Titan Minotaur and he's not getting frozen and uh, it is a bit of a shame. I wish we could kind of freeze him secretly even if we had, in wow, even if we had infinite magic, but as you can see, it's not possible to freeze uh, the Titan Minotaur. I just, I tried everything and nothing is possible, so just wanted to test it out, so. Yeah, let's move on to the next category in this video. The next thing I want to discuss actually real quick with this whole category stick that I'm going with. Uh, and is that while I'm at God of War 2, I want to explain something very important. And is that air block. Air blocking is of course doable in God of War 2. You can easily air block in the air and it's done, right? When you drop on the ground, uh, there is a problem, however. You're gonna notice how Kratos get, turns away from the block, like turns off the blocking stance and then comes back to the blocking again. And that can be a very big problem. That it, This problem wasn't even prevalent in God of War 1. I don't know how it's prevalent in God of War 2. I don't know how it went past testing, but it is what it is. So it is dangerous and you need to watch out. It kind of makes aerial combat way more strict. You kind of have to be more careful. So yeah, so you see, with blocking in God of War 2 in the air, it is dangerous. Look, I'm going to drop, and Kratos is either going to appear or I'm, I'm going to get hit. Look. I'm going to try to fall in, uh, while blocking. Of course, I'm holding L1 the entire time. You're going to see me kind of parry something instead of just... Hold on. I, I just, just the timing has to be very strict. See? Back there. Oh, even in here. Did you see how I parried instead of blocked? That's because the block turns off for a, for a split second and then comes back. And let me tell you, that one split second can determine your death. It has happened before to me and I cannot believe that it, it just, it's a thing in the game. It is just that the, the block turns off a second for, for like a split second when you drop from the air. And I can't believe it happened. And it's still a thing, even on PS3. Did you see that? I parried instead of blocked when I was holding L1 in the ear. Kratos drops and just blocks again. That's what's happening in here. Instead of, you know, keeping his block stance like God of War 1 and God of War 3. Did you see? Again, he parried. Just an observation that I needed to include in here in the midst of all this uh, category explanation shit. I just had to explain it. And uh, again, did you see? I dropped while blocking and Kratos just parries. It's like he lets go of the block and then blocks again. And sometimes I've gotten, see, again, he gets hit sometimes instead of just, instead of even parrying. So do watch out for that. And I don't know how, how, how you're going to bypass that because not even tricking can really help you. Because even with tricking, there's a split second where you fall and the bow is no longer active. See, I got hit while holding L2 in the ear. So I don't know how to combat it, really. Maybe rolling can work, but even then it's like... Even while well, the rolling, I'm not sure it's gonna work because there's there there will still be a split second where you're vulnerable on the ground. Just wanted to include it because it's important to watch out for. So, yeah, let's move on to the next category. Next up on the list, we have something called alternate Orion's harpoon. Now, what is an alternate Orion harpoon and what is a normal Orion harpoon? I'm gonna demonstrate it in just a second. So. It is essentially something that you can do to some enemies, so instead of just pressing circle to really have them, you know, have the original Orion Harpoon animation, you hold circle and what you get is something different. This can happen with uh, multitudes of enemies only in God of War 2. I'm going to touch on God of War 3 later, but for now just know that it's the most prevalent in God of War 2 and I'm going to showcase how. So, just a circle does this, right? Like he only, uh, Kratos only, I was about to bonk him with the hammer. Okay, why is the Right, so with Circle, Kratos only does this, the, the original Orion Harpoon animation, right? Holding Circle, however, for some enemies is uh, different. It's kind of a, di 
a whole different move that Kratos does, especially it's especially good against Harpies. And I'm gonna showcase it on the screen in a second. Here's me pressing circle, and here's me holding circle. See how he gets him into the uh, to the option select, where you can you know press four buttons and do whatever you want with him. This is for the Fate Sentry. Now, for other enemies, it's different, of course. Like every other enemy has different animations and. Make sure to work it through your uh, for your advantage because some rooms really require you to go with it instead of you know other options because let me tell you those seeds orion harpoon they're gonna be very very helpful or maybe the the harpies orion harpoon as seen on the screen right now can be very very freaking helpful so just wanted to throw it out there it is very very important to utilize it in god of war 2 because sometimes you really just want to do that like i mean here on this video with me playing as General Kratos, I eliminate all of these uh, Cyclops using these uh, boars only and nothing more. Like only the boars. Granted, with General Kratos, your uh, your collision damage is increased, of course, because enemies are stronger. But that's 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 not really that relevant right now. So, yeah, just know that uh, alternate Orion Harpoons exist in God of War 2. They kind of make up for being unable to redirect orion harpoons which still i would have much preferred to re, re redirect orion harpoons especially this one where you know you don't have uh iframes so that should have compensated for it by you know allowing you to redirect it but i guess god of war has god of war 2 has a different idea for that so it is what it is god of war 2 still at least has the alternate orion harpoon now, in God of War 3, this is kind of irrelevant because Orion Harpoons only cost 10 damage thanks to collisions not scaling with difficulty, but it is still good to sometimes cause hazards with this thing. I have used it from, from time to time here and there, as you, as you guys can probably see on the screen right now. Uh, it is the same thing, but there's a catch to it. You could only do it with the Blades of Exile. You cannot do it with the... With Nemesis Whip, the perfect setup weapon for Orion Harpoon. Yes, you cannot do it with that. You can only do it with the blades, and it's kind of a bummer, but... Look, I, I was excited when I learned about this at first. I was like, yo, this is a really cool tech, and it's even for God of War 3, but no. God of War 3 only has it for the Harpy, and it's specifically this one Harpy that is very low on health, but it is what it is. And of course, unlike God of War 2 and God of War 1, collisions are not scaling with difficulty, so this is not going to be the most viable option to really damage everyone around you and destroy them. Granted, I, as I said, it can be good to cause hazards and stuff, but not really anything more, I guess. But yeah, just wanted to throw it out there. You can only do it with the Blades of Exile and only on the Harpies. For some example, they removed this beautiful option select that you had in God of War 2. You know, you have it for... For the legionnaires as well that were prevalent in god of war one it is what it is uh i just wanted it i wish it was the same as god of war 2 where it had it for like what 10 enemies it has it for a lot of enemies in god of war 2 but unfortunately god of war 3 doesn't so it is what it is you have billions of other options so yeah this whole portion i want to explain something else and it's that how uh, orion harpoon got kind of changed throughout the games you see, starting from God of War 2, Orion Harpoon started having other animations. Now, while these animations are really cool and amazing, having a redirect would have been much better just like God of War 1. But then again, even without redirecting him like God of War 1, in God of War 2, they're just different. Like, you still have your stuff to deal with them. Like the Minotaur spawn, for example, the normal Orion Harpoon. You don't have an alternate, but yeah, I just wanted to mention it. Like in God of War 2, the, the Minotaur got a new uh, Orion Harpoon. It's not like God of War 1, where it's just a normal one. And it's still good, because Kratos still yeets the enemy to his uh, friend behind, and it's still the most useful thing, and it still causes a nice little half collision. Then again, you have these other wraiths and uh, sirens and stuff, and you can just easily align them in front of each other. It is still very, very viable in God of War 2, even though you cannot redirect it, so... And if you have Harpies, of course, just hold circle whenever you do the Orion Harpoon. Don't just press circle. You want that redirect, and it is very important. God of War 3, however. God of War 3 does not really... Uh, you don't want to align enemies and cause half collisions and full collisions, because they are irre irrelevant, as I said. Uh, the damage is nerfed, of course, because the, the collisions are not scaling with difficulty like God of War 1 and 2. Like in God of War 1, a full collision does 50 damage. Same with God of War 2. In God of War 3, it only does 10 damage. Doesn't matter if you go to very hard 
very easy it does not matter it is it does 10 damage in god of war 1 for example it does uh 10 damage on normal and uh it scales up the harder you go with the difficulty because you know enemies get stronger and that's why i'm basically explaining collisions again but you get the point god of war 3's orion's harpoons are more about the uses of them like for example the minotaur one is actually one of the most important ones in here because you kind of stick his horn down to the ground and you can go you can wail on him at him sorry you can go around and beat other enemies up but it is all about the uses it's not really about you know hey i'm gonna use this for damaging the surrounding enemies no it's more like I'm gonna use this to kind of subdue this minotaur and then I'm gonna deal with the other enemies around me. Or maybe you have a wraith and you can infinitely pop, you know, spam circle to get the infinite Orion harpoon. Like you always keep on snatching her off the ear and she keeps on getting in position. And you just kill and you just keep on doing this until it's dead. So it is all about uses in God of War 3. Now that can be, of course, equipped for, for the other God of Wars, but just know that Orion's harpoon in God of War 1 is redirected. You can redirect every single Orion harpoon. Not every enemy uh, bounces back up, but I just wanted to mention that you can redirect everything that you can Orion Harpoon. Unlike God of War 2 and God of War 3, where you know you have set amounts of things that you can do. In God of War 2, you have none, actually. You can't redirect any Orion Harpoon. But you have alternate Orion Harpoons for it. And in God of War 3, you only have one enemy that you can redirect, which is not important. It's irrelevant. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Let's... Let's finally move on to the next and last chapter of this whole combat guide. This is also very, very, very important and it can be as important as this long arc that I just explained of, you know, knowing your moves and know your attacks and know your stuff. And this next chapter is going to be Know Your Enemies. Now, what do I mean by know your enemy? It's essentially just know what the enemy's weaknesses are. Like, hey, this guy's bounceable, and then I can infinitely grab him in the ear safely until he's dead. See, like, one, two, and then I, I could have grabbed him one more time in the ear, and he would have died. Just, this is basically the idea of knowing your enemy. And then you gotta know something else that I'm gonna explain in just a second, and it's the grabs. Like, what do you have for a grab? Like, you grab this enemy, and then you successfully kill him. What does a Minotaur give when you kill him by a grab? Of course, we all know it gives health. Now, this stand, this stands in all God of Wars. God of War 1, 2, 3. Uh, this is basically the idea of knowing your enemies. Know what they do. Know what they're weak to. Know their weaknesses is basically what I'm trying to explain here. Now, I'm going to start off with the first category in this chapter of know your enemies. And it is, of course, one of the most important and... Uh, yeah, it is it is just something that is supposed to be played out while you're playing the game if you're really going for optimality in encounters and that is grabs now grabs can vary now when i say grabs i'm not talking about what they give you in red orbs and ruthless skills that is a whole other video that i have made before you know where grabbing a normal enemy starting from god over 2 gave you brutal kills for five orbs and then grabbing heavy enemies gives you ruthless kills and then in God of War 3, it, got, it introduced some new ones like the mutilation on the heart piece. While grabbing them, you get mutilation for 10 orbs. Or some heavy enemies are, again, ruthless kills. Some normal enemies are brutal kills. I'm not going to be talking about that and what the red orbs are giving you. I'm going to be talking about some other stuff, that some other uses for the grabs. Just know that grabbing some enemies are important. Like, we all know, and it should be a standard for you to know, that minotaur grabs give you health orbs. Except for this fight right here with Theseus where it's set to give you magic orbs now it is it does give a little bit more magic orbs than killing them normally without the grab so that is just a quick info to know about the about grabbing this specific minotaur right here these specific minotaurs the formula is set pretty beautifully i would say like killing wraiths in god of war 2 gives you magic orbs killing sirens does the same thing killing uh killing the gorgon of course uh it gives you blue orbs and again Killing a Minotaur still gives you green orbs, just like God of War 1. God of War 1 kind of, set, kind of set the standard for what these enemies give you and what they don't. Now, it is pretty basic and simple as I explained it right here in God of War 1 and God of War 2. It's like, kill this enemy to get that, kill that enemy to get this. In God of War 3 though, everything kind of changed and you get more stuff when you grab an enemy. In God of War 3, grabs were taken to a whole new level with multitudes of stuff that you can do with them. Grabbing a Cerberus that you can ride and you can kill other enemies with, making you just crazy with, with the damage output with the Cerberus. 
grabbing a cyclops to control him grabbing a gorgon you know the the uh, the this is the same snake that petrifies enemies right this is just a uriel knockoff and basically you know you get the point anyways grabbing her kind of you know freezes everyone around you when you get the qte done it is just stuff like this that makes god of war 3 a better god of war than any other god of war for me but that's besides the point point is you gotta know your grabs and you gotta know your uses just know that in god of war 1 this air this air grab of the satyr does zero damage and it's confirmed by the devs so don't don't use it because it does zero damage literally or just know that ground grabs do this and that to the satyr and it does some nice damage like for example in god of war 3 a satyr has 300 hp ground grabs are 100 uh take 100 damage Air grabs take 50 damage, so three ground grabs can really take out a satyr on very hard. The big point is grabs are very important. Someone sometimes for killing a single enemy, like maybe you want to focus on one enemy, like the grab against the fates and the fates priest in God of War 2. Those are on, on um, you, they cannot interrupt you while grabbing a priest like this. So if you want to take him out pretty easily, that's your pretty easy way out. Most of the enemies you can grab in all, all of these games, really, to just easily grab them and use them for your advantage. Like maybe this God of a One Legionnaire Captain. You can grab him in, the, in his first grab and then launch him instantly for an Orion Harpoon or for air grab or for anything. He's perfectly set up for you to be launched. Except you have to hold triangle after you grab him and stuff. Really, just go out and experiment with the grabs and, what they, and, and their uses, basically. Now, air grabs and their uses really changed when compared to God of War 1. Now, you know, starting from God of War 2, air grabs also changed. For example, in God of War 1, air grabs were the most OP thing you can ever try out on any, uh, on really any enemy. Like, you had the Minotaurs and you could easily take them out by just grabbing them three times in the air. They instantly bounce back up to the air. Well, that was taken out in God of War 2 and grabbing a Minotaur in the air just simply smacks him down and he stays grounded. He does not bounce back up. In God of War 3, they took it to a whole new level where Kratos just simply headbutts the Minotaur and his, his horns get stuck to the ground. God of War 1 allowed you to destroy a lot of enemies with infinite loops of uh, air grabs. Mainly the Gorgons was very, very important since you can easily take out a Gorgon and the grab animation is very fast. You can just spam circle in the air with a Gorgon, she keeps bouncing back up. Something that changed in God of War 2 and God of War 3, as I just mentioned. Or the Minotaurs, which is, I mean, come on, that is the most important thing. Every Minotaur dies with three air grabs in God of War 1. You basically get the point. Like, you have the Centaurs in God of War 1 that might be considered a hard enemy, right? Well, you'd be surprised to know that you can infinitely air grab them and you even gain momentum to the air. You even rise higher than what you were in your natural, you know, in your neutral, sorry, jumping position. So you can keep on spamming circle against Centaurs in God of War 1, which is, it is good. It keeps bouncing them back up for your face. You basically get the point. Air grabs are very, very important in God of War 1 and you can have... You have infinite amounts of them, like, for some enemies that you can do until the enemies die, so... There is that. I'm not even gonna touch on Harpies, which Harpies did not really change from God of War 1 and 2. Grabbing them in the ground, even 3. Grabbing them from in the air keeps them, you know, they bounce back up to you and stuff, so, yeah. God of War 2's air grabs are kinda damage-based stuff, so, you know, you grab any enemy in the air, really, and they just stay grounded now then again there are enemies like the normal enemies that you can grab in the air and they do bounce back up but it is not really the most important thing since kratos is losing momentum in the air for some reason just know that they are not as viable as god of a once air grabs where you could you know you could uh, air, infinitely air grab a, a Gorgon, for example. You cannot do that in God of War 2, the Gorgon stays grounded. Or same with the Minotaur, same with uh, other enemies. Like the, maybe the Legionnaire Captain had the same treatment, just like just like the God of just like any other weapon in, enemy in God of War 2. In God of War 1, you can infinitely air grab a Legionnaire Captain. In God of War 2, you cannot. Some enemies, though, do get back some of this infinite air grab shenanigans, like God of War 3 Sirens, for example. If you grab a siren in the air, you can infinitely grab her until you get the circle in the dizzy state on top of her head. So there is still hope left, but just know that it really dynamically changed from what was given in God of War 1, where you could infinitely air grab an enemy, so... Yeah, I just wanted to pull that up for you guys, it is very important. Getting tired yet? Don't get tired because there's still billions of other stuff that you can learn about the enemies. For example, this transition sells perfectly to the next segment and it's gonna be infinite Orion Harpoons. 
Now, Infinite Orion Harpooning is something that is, of course, again, introducing God of War 1. See, you, you can infinitely do this however many times you want until the enemy dies, so... You can really use it for some enemies, but not every enemy, just like, just like, kind of... I'm gonna demonstrate, as, as you just saw, I could have in infinitely spammed Circle back there, and I could have always gotten him, but the Minotaur sticks to the ground after one Orion Harpoon. That is something that you should really account for if you're going for Orion Harpoons, and you should know which enemy bounces back up, which one stays down, like the... For example, we have the Legionnaire Captains, and they do uh, bounce back up. Or maybe, right now, as I'm showcasing right here, the Minotaur does not really bounce back up. He just stays to the ground, unlike the Legionnaires, where you can infinitely Orion Harpoon them until you get the Dizzy State, or maybe kill them. So that is another aspect of knowing your enemies, is you should really know which enemy bounces back up after an Orion Harpoon, which enemy stays down. This is of course very important against the Medusa, that, that you can Orion Harpoon and then hold triangle after you get the grab. You, at the moment you press the grab for the Orion Harpoon, just hold triangle. And you can kind of loop her in this loop that you can launch her and Orion Harpoon her in. Hell, the normal Gorgons, you can easily just infinitely uh, Orion Harpoon them, just like the infinite air grab. Just spam, circle, and Kratos infinitely Orion Harpoons them. God of One has a lot of that thanks to the all uh, Orion Harpoons looking the same, and it, it all, it's all one smooth animation, so... God of go ahead and experiment with which enemy stays down and which enemy bounces back up, so... There is that for God of One. In God of War 2, every simple and small enemy bounces back up, but don't expect the Legionnaire Captain to bounce back up because it's a whole new animation. A lot of enemies, even the normal ones, got new animations. As you can see, these cursed Legionnaires right here that I'm fighting, they have a whole other Orion Harpoon that has iframes. It's different. It does cause full collision. I'm not talking full collisions. I'm just talking, like, you can infinitely air grab them, but it's different, so... It is actually much better than the normal Orion Harpoon, since with this one you have iframes, but it is what it is. This is gonna be a pretty cute demonstration on what you get for Orion Harpooning a Gorgon in God of War 2, and it's basically not even the ground one, I forgot. It's a whole new animation where Kratos just throws the Gorgon like this, and it causes a half collision. I forgot to mention that, sorry. Uh, so that is all the more a reason for you to realize what you're doing here, so... And I, I, I kind of got it mixed up with the air grab, and as I just mentioned uh, a, a, sec a segment ago, so here's the air grab and how it keeps the Gorgon grounded. Yes, even if, uh, if you don't get the dizzy state on her, even if she's completely healthy, like you grab her in the air and she does not bounce back up, which is a thing with a lot of enemies in God of War 2. See, it stayed down. Now here's another demonstration for the Legionnaire Captain and the Minotaur, which is something else. But again, all of this makes up for it, and I'm gonna explain it in just a second. See, they replaced uh, optimal air grabs for some fancy stuff. This does do great damage, and it looks better than God of War 1, but mechanically, God of War 1 is much better. They keep on bouncing back up. Granted, you don't have iframes, but it is better that you can, you know, he bounces back up and you grab him again. And it's the same thing with the Minotaur, and I'm gonna showcase it in just a second. Here, boom. He sticks to the ground instead of bouncing back up like God of War 1's Minotaurs. And again, I just showcased it again. Uh, let me just do it one more time. I, I think it's the same, and it's the same health, just like the same Minotaur from God of War 1. But it's just that he does not bounce back up after you grab him. And here is basically a pretty good uh, demonstration of what happened to air grabs and Orion Harpoons as like a whole. It's like... It's like this guy's Orion Harpoon was a normal Orion Harpoon in God of War 1. In God of War 2 is this fancy little thing that you just saw. Even same for the Minotaur, see? This is good, at least it still gives you a half collision, but... It's not- I can't imagine it being better than the God of War 1's Orion Harpoon, which is... Which kind of proves that God of War 1 is mechanically better in this aspect. The aspect of the grabs in God of War- that, See, that's, a, that's still a full collision, as you just saw, but... It is not clear, and with God of War 1, where you could redirect it, it was billions of times easier and uh, more clear, I guess, but it is what it is. It's still not all lost or anything. It's just that they kind of fancied being fancy in God of War 2, if you kind of catch my drift. They wanted to look cooler and better and stuff, and God of War 3 takes that to a whole new level, so now I'm going to move on to God of War 3, actually. Now, with God of War 3, since collisions are not scaling with difficulty, you have different tools that you can use for yourself, and it's that... Not different tools, sorry, but it's just that Orion Harpoon is kind of more of a use for one enemy at a time. 
so it's like right you can maybe redirect this guy as i'm gonna demonstrate right now see like like this maybe hold on let me just demonstrate it you can easily redirect the uh, the olympus fiend like this and, and it does do damage but it is not really the most optimal thing to go with it's like same with the with the uriel knockoff let me just showcase it to you guys the gorgon serpent it's kind of to subdue the enemy that you Orion Harpoon. Like, look at the Minotaur. He, his horns get stuck to the ground. Wow, what an animation I just got. And you kind of go to town with him and destroy his ass. Or maybe with this guy, you really don't even want to... You don't even want to launch him to really do this one. It's not useful. It does cause hazards. See, it does kind of cause a stir while playing. But it's nothing that useful. Maybe the Wraiths where you can infinitely uh, Orion Harpoon him. I'm going to showcase it in just a second. See, like... She's perfectly set up and you can just spam circle. Hold on. Here's a wraith demonstration. After you launch her, boom. And again, just circle. It is kind of a Rhine Harpoon and Goddard with 3 is more of a use for a single enemy and not really to help out with other enemies around you. So there is that that you should consider. God of War 2's Orion Harpoons, as I just explained, is like they are fancy and beautiful, but then again, you have alternate Orion Harpoons with the Harpies and stuff, but... In God of War 3, it's a complete fuckfest of just, hey, you, you, you're you like subduing this Minotaur down to kind of deal with him later. You're doing this to this Uriel knockoff to just kind of keep her grounded for a bit. The only one that really has death that can damage surrounding enemies would be the Olympus Fiend. And as I demonstrate, uh, you can get some good uses out of him and redirect him. But then again, you only meet him twice in the whole campaign, which is basically the most important thing that I'm talking about. It is the whole combat guy that I'm talking about right now. And that's about it for God of War 3. I can't say much. Like, it looks fancy. And some of them are actually very useful, other than just looking fancy. Just like God of War 2. For example, the Minotaur one. It is very useful. And others are also useful, like the... Like the Wraiths one, but... I'm not having a good chance of showcasing it. Basically, you're seeing on the screen right now from the gauntlet how I infinitely Orion Harpoon it. It is what it is, and it can work with a lot of enemies. But as you guys can see, even that slam that I'm doing with the Uriel knockoff is not damaging the surrounding enemies. It's kind of like uh, it's damaging the, the Uriel knockoff only. It's like this does, see? It does damage the surrounding enemies, but that's about it really for God of War 3. So yeah, that's about it when it comes to Orion Harpoons and how it works and stuff. As I discussed with God of War 1, you can redirect every one of them. And every single Orion Harpoon can be redirected and it's good and it does a full collision. Except for some of them, like the Wraiths do not do a full collision, but it is what it is. And from God of War 2, they started looking fancy and they changed it. It's not, not every Orion Harpoon is one animation in God of War 2. But they still had their uses, like... You had, hold on, let me just demonstrate in God of War 3. It is basically the same as God of War uh, 2's uh, Orion Harpoon for the Sirens. But I just wanted to showcase it again. I guess for the Wraiths as well. And it's basically this one. And it's a full collision in God of War 2. And here's just a normal 10 damage. But you get the point. In God of War 2, it, this looks fancy and it transferred to God of War 3 as well. But it also has uses. Like even the Minotaur in God of War 2 as I demonstrated. While it looks cool and it is, it might be one of my favorite animations for Orion Harpoon. It is still useful and it does cause a half collision. It is basically what you want to go for if you're fighting uh, Theseus and his Minotaurs. While this one in God of War 3 is useful, I still wish... Actually, no. In God of War 3, I'm good with these only being useful for the Minotaurs. He's like, he's subdued down and you can beat his ass with your damaging tools, basically. Uh, in God of War 3, it's actually good that it looks fancy and it is still useful. Granted, a full collision just like the God of War 1 uh, Minotaur Orion Harpoon would have been better, but it is still fun what we got at the end of the day, so... Let's <coughs> I'm sorry. Let's move on to the, to the next category. Now, this next category, I decided to make it a wiki for the entirety of the enemies from God of War 1, 2, and 3. I'm going to be saying something at least somewhat useful for every single enemy and you're free to go ahead and discover more stuff that can be weaknesses for the enemy that can work for your advantage in combat. So let's just start with God of War 1's uh, Legionnaires. Any Legionnaire basically. You can Orion Harpoon any Legionnaire and redirect it and you have infinite Orion Harpoons for every Legionnaire. 
Harpies. You can perfectly Orion Harpoon a Harpy and it's, it's gonna score a nice full collision for you. And you can air grab it and you can ground grab it for a quick little kill. Minotaurs. A very easy way to kill them is by doing three grabs in the air. They keep bouncing back up to you and you can keep on killing them. Also another tip for them, don't keep on attacking because if you keep on attacking them, they will start blocking. So don't keep the attack in your, you know, offense. So what you want to do is kind of bounce them, especially with the Tormentors where you can't really launch them. That is another wiki that I'm going to chop about them. You only can uh, bounce them or you can launch them if they just started spawning. Yeah, and don't keep on attacking them. Attack away and maybe then get your bouncing attack or your launch attack or whatever. Don't keep on squaring, attack square with them. They're gonna stop blocking and they're gonna pair you in a second. The Cyclops, easily abusable with square square triangle as you all know, but then again, you, you really wanted some damaging tool. Easily killable with the Medusa's Gaze. Granted, it takes time to freeze them, but if you can position yourself nicely, you can easily Medusa Gaze them, but then again, Let's, let's speak about something else that is not Minister Gaze and is just simply hitting them. Their attacks are perfectly, you know, telegraphed and you can easily dodge whenever they, they try to go for an attack. You can, you can dodge away or you can iframe away by dodging and stuff. That goes for every uh, Cyclops in God of War 1. Next up we have Gorgons. You can infinitely Orion Harpoon them for full collisions or you can infinitely air grab them for an easy kill if you want to. And make sure to grab them and... One little note about the grab that they have, you're actually vulnerable the first couple of frames when you grab enemies, so you can get knocked out of the grab if the grab just started, so I just wanted to drop that in, but yeah, overall, infinite air grab to kill them easily, or infinite Orion Harpoon. Next up, we have the Wraiths, and you can grab these guys on the ground, or you can grab them in the air, or you can Orion Harpoon them, literally every single grab works against these guys, and they can be very useful, they can get launched into an Orion Harpoon, and that can be... And that can be an easy half collision and remember wraiths are a half collision they're not a full collision so i just wanted to drop that here and let's move on to the next enemy also i forgot they can be easily frozen and broken so their statue hp is very low and they can be frozen pretty quickly so you can also use that to your advantage next up sirens now you might be saying these guys are breaking out way too fast well to your surprise they can also break way too fast as you guys can see on the screen right now one simple square can break their statue. They have a they have a statue HP of one. That is very very low. Any attack can literally shatter that statue. So you just got to be quick with it. Like the moment you freeze her, you kind of have to shatter the statue. So you can use that to your advantage. Next up, we have the Cerberus. In God of War One, you can bounce the Cerberus pretty easily. You can like kind of punt him, and he's in a juggle state, and you can infinitely juggle him until he dies. You can even launch him and grab him in the air. This is specific for God of War 1, you can't do this in any other God of War, so go ahead and use this for your advantage. It can be very good to bounce him and to knock him out and to do a lot of stuff with him. It's very good even for ring outs, so yeah. Next up we have the Cerberus Seeds in God of War 1. These guys can be grabbed for a half collision, you know when you throw them to other enemies they cause a half collision in God of War 1. They do cause a full collision in God of War 2, but in here it's just a half collision, but it is still very, very useful, so use it to your advantage whenever you can. Next up, we have the Centaurs. These guys can be infinitely air grabbed if you really, uh, yeah, if you want to wreck their asses pretty easily, that's a pretty easy option. Next up, we have Satyrs. Now, the easiest way to take these guys out is with the Blade of Artemis. You can launch them whenever they're trying to stand up and get up. I'm going to get to that in just a minute with, uh, with another chapter of this whole Know Your Enemies category stuff. It's going to be about, teach, I'm going to be teaching you about how, when to launch an enemy, and when the enemy is vulnerable and all that. And I'm going to touch to the satyr, but just know that for now, launching him with the blade of Artemis and then wailing at him with your damaging tools, like mainly R1 and square, and then launching him again. You can do this infinitely, or you can even ground grab him if you're that insane, but it takes a while to kill them with a ground grab, so it's your call, I guess. Next up we have God of War 2 and we're starting with the first enemy and is the boars. You can use them for alternate Orion Harpoons to cause a full collision like this. You can easily kill surrounding enemies if you have these guys so make sure to just launch them. Orion Harpoon but the alternate one. Don't just, don't just press circle. Pressing circle only does this uh, simple one as I'm going to showcase in just a second. Kratos only does this and you don't really want this since it's not really like what is this. Hold circle to get this that also gives you iframes and rakes everyone around you so. Yeah, that's what you can do with the wild boars and is the most important thing that you can do with them. Next up, if you see a dog, just grab them and shoot them towards each other. Just It causes a, a really nice and fast full collision that you can work for your advantage. 
or in some other instances you can even use them for a different type of different type of full collision sorry and it's the air grab like like this see how it rigged the puppy in front of me you can use these guys pretty well if you know how to use them just easily shoot them to each other this is the most optimal thing to do against them so yeah next up we have the server seed you can alternate orion harpoon them just like the boars that this again causes a full collision as you just see like one simple throw kills the next enemy next to you it's very very powerful so yeah you can use that or there's also other uses for it and it's the ground grab this ground grab unlike god of a one cause it's a full collision in god of a one it's a half collision in here it's a full collision but it does have something where it pushes the enemies away a little bit but it is what it is you can use it a lot of times and it just it causes a really sweet full collision for your own advantage as you can see like no not this one i want them to one more time boom that's a full collision easy or you can do the alternate orion harpoon by holding circle Let's move on to the next enemy. What you want to do with Harpies in general is not jump, I guess. Because sometimes you want to drop with this and then uh, you're going to get attacked because these guys attack a lot. See, I almost got hit there, but I parried. In God of War 2, there's the bug with the air block that I explained a while ago. So, yeah. Against Harpies, it is what it is. Alternate Orion Harpoons for the win. You literally wreck everyone. Like, the Phoenix Chamber Room can get pretty simplified if you know what you're doing with Alternate Orion Harpoons. Just easily, you know bounce them and then grab them while they're you know like this you, you know orion harpoons right basically another alternate orion harpoon case see this is the great thing about god of war 2 is that you cannot redirect orion harpoons but you can you can have the alternate orion harpoon that can work as an alternative still granted not as good as the god of a one orion harpoons but it's still very very good take a sip every time i say orion harpoon Whenever facing off against nymphs, I'm not going to be explaining a lot, of course. Of course, you know, like, freezing them is going to be pretty easy since, you know, if you have a, if you have a Uriel's uh, head maxed out, it is actually as easy as you can see. See how how fast they're getting frozen? Which is something I forgot about God of War. One Harpies as well, you can easily freeze them in the air and that when they fall, they instantly die just like these guys right here. Except in here, Uriel's head is the best fucking magic attack in the history of humanity, so... That's why it's ruining everyone around me. Anyways, if you don't have Uriel's head, of course, just uh, grab them. That is literally the best thing you can do. They have an alternate Orion Harpoon that drops them to the grab kill. Like this, see? Kratos kind of drags them towards himself for the grab kill. Like, this is the normal grab kill. So, you can use it to your advantage. No point in really, like, try to grab them. They, they're not going to help you with other enemies. But, it is still a good thing to grab them. Like, you know, you want you want them out of your view, so go ahead and use. Next up, we have the spooky, scary skeletons and sh skeletons. I'm gonna t show you a pretty neat little trick against these guys. Keeping your distance at mid range against them causes them to kind of taunt. If you stay close, they start attacking. If you stay far from mid to far range, they start taunting and taunting only. See how they taunt, and you can use this to your advantage by doing something. And I'm gonna explain it in just a second. Launch one of them. Orion Harpoon him, boom, he wrecks everyone behind him. It is very useful, there are multiple spots where you face off against skeletons, and this can be very, a very nice uh, thing to use against them, since, you know, a full collision wrecks every single skeleton, so there is that that you can use to your advantage. And another tip that I'm going to drop on them, whenever they get to their uh, dizzy state, as uh, of course it's called, Let's just uh, injure one of them very much that he gets to his dizzy state. See, when they drop down, they come back up and they heal a little bit. So you can never kill these guys truly if you don't grab them or if you don't kill them while they're dizzy. See, like that. So that is something I wanted to drop. Also, the air grab is the most useless thing. This literally does nothing. Even if the enemy is one shot, this does nothing. Yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. Oh no, what am I gonna do? Oh no, boom, bitch. No, for real, what you do against archers is just pretty clear. Grab the asses. Undead archers, and every time you actually see these types of God of a 1 enemies, these legionnaires from God of a 1, what you want to do is, of course, uh, capitalize on the moment and basically just throw them with the 360 toss. Like, there is, it literally cannot get any better than this. You, anytime you see them. You also have a new option, which is pressing X, which does this, which also causes a full collision. Let me just demonstrate it. Boom. You wreck the guy behind him. But the 360 is of course better and it takes uh, it, it, it has better range and it wrecks enemies when, whenever you're in the animation and even before throwing an enemy. So yeah, anytime you see a legionnaire, legionnaire, not just the archers, not just the normal legionnaires. Every time you see them, try for grabbing. 
and then either the 360 toss or the normal X toss like this. Uh, yeah, that's about it. That's that's about all that I can say for legionnaires. The barbarian mercenaries are pretty simple. Of course, he's gonna fucking grab me. Yeah, that's a full collision. Nice. Anyways, you just want to grab them since the grab kills them pretty easily with like one grab. Next up is the Beast Lord. Now, these guys can be very dangerous when facing off against them. See this guy that is hunting me to infinity and beyond? He keeps on hunting you to infinity and beyond, literally, until he stops with a block, thankfully. Anyways, how you want to stop him is not by blocking because he has an attack that opens you up. It does not take damage, it just opens you up from your blocking state. And uh, you kind of don't want that since sometimes if two of them run away towards you, see, you can get clapped pretty easily because the other one starts hitting you. The best thing against them is grabs. It's pretty simple. Four grabs kills a uh, lord, one of these. I don't know their their names. Is it Night Lord? I don't care. Anyways, the fourth grab instantly decapitates his legs and fucks him up on the back. And that's what you want to do every time you face off against them. So, yeah. Beast Lord, that's his name. Now, when faced off with Cursed Legionnaires, these guys that are, you know, tanky and stuff, what you want to do is, of course, align them with the enemy behind them to get Orion Harpoon damage. So, either that or uh, drain one of them so much that he gets to the dizzy state and you can easily, you know, capitalize on that. Like, basically, what you want to do is this. Launch him in front of you. Orion Harpoon. See how I'm going to wreck the, the enemies next to me? And when you get him to the dizzy state, of course, again, a 360 toss is the best thing that you can do. And yeah, just basically with these guys in here in God of War 2, you can uh, infinitely air grab them as well. Fuck me, I'm killing all of them. You can infinitely air grab them and you even have iframes as you can pretty clearly see. And you wreck everyone that gets caught in front of you. You can even reposition yourself. That's right, in God of War 2 it's about repositioning instead of redirecting. You cannot redirect? Easy, just reposition. Well, it's not easy because you know how it is. You know, in the juggle state, you just touch him one time. Let me just show you. Just a simple tap. I'm going to show it to you guys. I mean, this is a pretty good thing that I'm going to show you. See? I wrecked him. Just a simple tap into a circle. Did you see that? I get him kind of positioned in front of the other enemy. It's all about uh, repositioning in God of War 2. So, yeah. That's what you want to do whenever you see a cursed legionnaire. Just basically infinitely Orion harpoon them in front of other enemies. The Wraiths of Athens. These guys are kind of buffed in here. They're stronger than God of War 1. But again... The easiest thing is to align them in front of each other. Launch one of them. Hold on, let me just demonstrate it pretty quick. Align them in front of one another and just grab one. When it's perfectly ready, just Orion harpoon it, except I got kicked back there. Just block this. Be completely safe. Do this and Orion harpoon to the enemy behind it so that you can get a full collision. That is sweet. So It's at least still good that it gives you a full collision and... Instead of God of a 1 where it gave you a half collision. So there's that. And I'm doing a poor job demonstrating it. But what you want to do is of course as I demonstrated. Just just align them in front of each other. Just like casual God of War 2 Orion Harpoon stuff. Just like, just like this. Except I'm doing a poor job demonstrating it. But yeah that's what you want to do against these wraiths. And the other wraiths as well since they're dangerous. And they're just like God of a 1. They're grabbable everywhere. Like in the air, on the ground, Orion Harpoon. Everything works with these fellas. They're they're really generous. I'm gonna showcase it and here we I just missed it Whatever fuck it point is you can grab them in the air there. I'm not gonna miss it this time Let's go the wraiths asphodel is the same thing You just launch them into an Orion harpoon that sends them to the enemies behind so That's what you want to do. These guys are extremely dangerous. They can be extreme gameplay is dangerous Boom, this is what you want to do. Just keep on causing full collisions until the ones behind it is dead So just to be safe boom I'm gonna do it one more time just so just so that I can showcase it basically. Uh, these guys uh, do go underground and they are more deadly than the others. But I just want to demonstrate a kill with this. Just so that I can prove my point. But I mean I don't need to prove my point. You guys basically get the point. You just have to grab them on the ground or in the air or anywhere. They, they're grabbable everywhere. They are more deadly than the normal wraiths. As you can see they have a lot of tanking and armor and stuff so... And the enemies that attack you while grabbing can be dangerous. So after every grab, you're better off to just block instead of continuing your your shit, basically. See, like, I'm gonna block here, because that attack that goes on the ground is very dangerous. This enemy and the juggernauts that I'm gonna explain later are very annoying, so let's move on. Next up, we have Hades Fiends. Now, with these guys, you can uh, kind of get them in an Orion Harpoon loop. You can actually get them in that. When you do a, a normal grab, mash circle and you get this. 
this is this can damage surrounding enemies as well like i'm just i'm just doing a poor job you cannot redirect this you don't even have an alternate orion harpoon for this but it's good you can trust me you can actually wreck enemies behind you except see see how i hit that enemy behind me with the animation of the orion harpoon you can actually really uh, uh capitalize on this if you have bigger enemies around you so there is also that that you can account for like look if i can be just lucky enough or maybe whatever you get it basically grab them and infinitely orion harpoon them and you can damage surrounding enemies with it as well it is as easy as that like i can't explain it better than this so yeah let's move on now the fate sentries is a very interesting case this uh this throw did you see that guy behind him die and this one actually didn't die the reason being the the throw the toss that you do with these guys is is a full collision but is determined with the range with how long the guy's been traveling like see when i'm very close the full collision does not work to full effect look at this damage look it doesn't even kill this guy it doesn't even come close from killing him but if it travels for a long distance of time it can wreck the enemy pretty good like from this from this distance it's not going to be a full collision it is a full collision but it's not going to act like a full collision it's going to do way less damage but if you have some good range with him like maybe if you do this let me just demonstrate it from this range you toss one of these sentries and it can actually kill the one behind let me just uh make sure to demonstrate it one more time hold on just need to freeze one of the one or two of these guys in here so that i can demonstrate it come on see like right now boom and, and i still didn't get him now this can be also useful sometimes with other spots if you if the enemy is cornered i'm gonna showcase it if i have the footage for it but if the enemy is cornered and you somehow get to throw the toss the sentry at him, you can sometimes be very lucky and you know, you're kind of trapping him in the corner. It's going to give the effect of the, the sentry. See how he keeps on flying even when he hits the wall? He doesn't die. He keeps on flying. That can, that can work sometimes if you're lucky or if you can set it up perfectly. But yeah, overall, see? That guy behind him died with a full collision while this guy didn't die. So basically, the full collision of these guys when you toss them is just determined with the range. Like if he's been traveling for a long distance, he's going to kill the guy with a full collision. If he's not, see, he didn't kill him. That's about it. Now these next guys, these Fates Guardians, they're kind of different. They have armor. See, when they go for that attack, you cannot interrupt it with... Uh, you, you can't even launch them with this when they're going for their attack. So a good thing would be, you know, punting them with this, with the plume, of course. And then just doing the same thing you did with the legionnaires and it is just this they kind of destroy them with the orion harpoon this is the same orion harpoon that the that the cursed legionnaires had and it's very very good because you know you have iframes while doing it so you can't get knocked out of it and it does of course the, the sweet damage that it does and if you want to get get a repositioning next a little bit just to kind of deal more damage but yeah overall anytime just like the face sentries and the legionnaires and stuff every enemy that has the four option you need to really kind of work towards that four option select because it can be very useful and you can always use it and uh yeah it's about it with these guys just another four option enemy wow nice half collision next up we have the fates juggernaut now these guys are very important because very hard and annoying sorry because they have a lot of health they are literally a tank of health and they have a stupid attack that i want you to watch out from and it's a sprint attack that hits you like he has a hitbox or I'd like to call it a shit box that happens. So usually, let me just show you this thing. When he sprints like this, this sprint does not damage. This next sprint where he holds his weapon behind him, it's beautifully telegraphed, nothing bad, but just know that the next sprint that happens, see this one? He hits you while running. His whole his whole body becomes a hit box and it just hits you while he's running. So watch out for it. See, he hits you once and then with this one again see he interrupts your attacks it is very very annoying again with these guys it's of course just nothing but wailing at him with uh with the hammer if you have if you know what you're doing and then again you have to kind of spread out your hammer shots you really need to be aware of his uh his sprint attack you know it is very very fucking annoying so yeah and another tip for them is that you can lure them in by shooting an arrow at them so when they're at far range like this maybe they're at mid range like here they're attacking and stuff Shooting them with the arrow once makes them sprint towards you and they hunt you to the ends of the earth. 
You can use this to your advantage in the loom chamber and drag one of them to your side and just, just to beat their asses like this, but... Overall, make sure to block mid your while you're going with your attacks because it can be dangerous what these guys can do with their sprinting attack. Uh, again, I want to demonstrate. See, I got hit twice. Once while he was sprinting and uh, the second when he swung his weapon. So, yeah, you best just watch out when he does that shit. So, yeah, let's move on to the next one. These Hades Juggernauts are sweethearts that don't have as much health as the Fates Juggernauts, making them way easier. And they don't have this stupid uh, sprint attack that the others do, you know, where they sprint and have a hitbox while sprinting. So, yeah, you can do the same thing by shooting them. But then again, see, they don't have an attack that kind of makes them makes their sprint have a hitbox that can hit you and stuff. So, yeah, the weapon is also somewhat uh, different than the other one. But yeah, overall, this one, this one, as I mentioned, is a sweetheart. He just allows you to fucking wail at him and it's. He's kind of lovely with what he does. He's easy. Again, just wailing at him with the hammer is the best option. So, yeah. If not, of course, just chip away at his health with square triangles. And, yeah. That's about it. Next up, we have Legionnaire Captains. And something great about these guys is that you can use the buffered launcher pretty good against them. As you guys can s just saw back there. You, it's the idea of, you know, blocking his last attack. Because this guy has some long wind-up combos. And you're, you're going to see in just a second. Like, like this. Boom. I did explain the buffered launcher at the start of the video, so there's no need to go over it again, but see this long combo, just block it all. After the last one, just launch him and you know go. His Orion Harpoon does a full collision to enemies in front, but the range isn't the best thing. And uh from there on you can even air grab him and break his spine, which God over two Kratos has something for breaking spines. I don't know what it is, but yeah, the air grab is good. And then of course this grab. This is the most beautiful grab in the game. So yeah, overall, just blocking his attacks, let go of L1 and just do the triangle, but of course after getting hit so that it gets buffered, so that... You can even do it after that one, before he lands the last hit, but it, it, he seems to block, like, see? Just like that. And uh, you can easily get him, it's his weak spot, so yeah. You need to be careful with these guys, they're not like the God of War uh, 1 Orion Harpoons, where they keep on bouncing back up. And it's the same thing with the air one, it's, it's a whole different animation, so yeah. Now, I know I'm not explaining what to do against satyrs, which I'm not going to explain everything with, hey, just Uriel's head the enemy. I know you can do that. You know you can do that. We're going to be talking about something different with the satyrs, and it's, of course, the ground grab. Now, other than the ground grab, their wake-up attack is not like God of a one where it damages you, see? So you can be totally safe with them, but there's also something else, and it's their launcher. Their uh, Orion Harpoon, sorry. See how it kind of launches them forward? It causes a really nice half collision against the enemies, and it, it can be very, very helpful. Now, something else that you can do against them is, of course, the buffered launcher as well into a Ryan Harpoon. It can be very, very useful in the, in the loom chamber as well. Uh, or you can even grab them if you if you have the energy for it, and if you're left with a one-on-one -on -one scenario with the satyr. You can always grab him on the ground until he's dead. So, yeah, these satyrs are nerfed. They're not like the God of a one satyrs, but... I just wanted to kind of explain some of their stuff and yeah there's also something else that I need to that I need to talk about about satyrs in God of War 2 and it's that you can kind of you have a huge punish stuff with it I don't know what I'm talking about but yeah you have a huge punishing window against them just like some other enemies so whenever they attack or even if they don't attack just casually launch them but the best thing is launching them like this hold on I just forgot it just you know after after a launch Switch to the hammer, boom, and then just go go to town with him. And I kind of make, bit, fucked it up back there, but if you if you're even at level one, you can easily launch him. And uh, let's just demonstrate it one more time. You can easily launch him. Switch to the hammer, boom. One, two, and another Chronos Rage. One, two, and he's dead. It can be very easy. It can be it can even be done against the priests of the Fates. So there is that that you can try for your advantage. And let's move on to the next enemy. Now, the Sator Champion can be a very tough enemy, but then again, just like the other one, you have the same Orion Harpoon. The ground grab is different, but it is kind of the same thing. It's just you mashing circle until he's dead, so there is that. But the main strategy with these guys is, again, the, the buffered launcher. It is the best thing after all, so there is that if you want to use your advantage. And the air grab in here does damage for all Sators. It's not like God of War 1's uh, air grab. 
And uh, yeah, mainly you want to kind of position him in front of enemies, even though you don't really face this guy with other enemies a lot. I think you face him only twice in God of War 2, and it cannot really do the craziest of things, but... Yeah, just basically his Orion Harpoon is good, as I mentioned with the other Seder as well, and uh, you can grab, gra ground grab him to death, or you can launch him with anything you want, really. It's just overall just another Orion Harpoon enemy that you can use to your advantage. Or grab him to death until he's dead, but I'm not willing to do that right now, so yeah. And the, the two times you meet him is once you meet him with his friend, and you can easily petrify both of them and just uh, wreck their asses, even with level 1 Uriel's head. But I don't want to talk about that right now. For now, let's just move on to the next enemy. We're done. I'm not going to talk about Uriel head shenanigans because it can be very broken. Sirens are other enemies that don't just spawn in as singles, they always spawn with someone else with them, like maybe another siren that follows them and stuff. You're never gonna face off against these guys where they are alone and stuff, so you're gonna always face off against multi multiple ones of them. And again, the strategy is of course, Orion harpooning them into each other. See like this uh, nice little, I think, I think it's a full collision, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure it's a half collision, not a full one, but yeah, just... The Orion Harpoon is good with the with the Sirens, honestly, it's like, boom, you launch it towards the other one. And you can use it pretty good in some spots, some spot you get Sirens alone. In the Loom Chamber, you can use them if you're doing a Pain Plus, and you can't grab, you can't, you know, switch to other enemies. It can be pretty good to kind of launch them and Orion Harpoon them into each other, like, as such, like this. You can even have Triangle if you're against a wall, so you can always loot them, just like the Gorgon from God of War 1 until they get the circle on top and killing them gives off magic so there's also that and yeah the air grab is nothing really to talk about that much see you can always infinite air grab them I think I did mention it with God of War, 1, God of War 3 sirens but yeah you can infinitely air grab these guys until you get the circle on top as demonstrated the siren widow has the same Orion harpoon and you know what goes boom just keep on knocking them into each other. Actually, I think these guys die with two Orion Harpoons. Uh, if you With two full collisions, sorry. Not two Orion Harpoons. But yeah, I'm, I'm demonstrating uh, an Orion Harpoon by launching them with the spear. But in actuality, you want to, of course, launch them with the blades. Like I just did. But Because the, the most... Like, at the start, you meet them near the start. Not at the start, but... You meet them at the temple before reaching Theseus. And of course, you want to just launch them and... Uh, do your thing with them like align them first and then Orion harpoon them into each other like this thing I'm pretty sure they die with two Orion harpoons or two full collisions again. Sorry Like this one is very low right now And I can I can kill the one behind it with I if I don't whiff it like an idiot And uh, yeah, you can't ground grab these guys. They're not like the wraiths remember you can air grab them You can Orion harpoon them and the Orion harpoon is nice, but that's about it So let's move on to the next enemy now, with the Gorgons, there's going to be something that I'm going to be explaining later, and it's going to have to be a whole category in its own, you know. Of course, parrying their thing after getting the Golden Fleece can be a thing, but the thing that you want to do, if even if, that, if you're like on Pain Plus, is of course, align them and Orion Harpoon them into each other, just like, just as such. Hold on, let me just, it's going to be perfect to showcase it, actually. Just align them and Orion Harpoon them into each other, just like the Seder, just like the Minotaurs, just like everyone else. See, that does damage. You might not see it pretty well, but it does do its thing, so don't you worry about any of that. Let me just showcase it one more time. Anyways, I couldn't get it because this arena is way too open. In the Loom Chamber, you can get them pretty easily by, you know, launching them. Because it's it looks like a 2D fight in the Loom Chamber. That's what makes it very good. So, yeah, you can easily deal with them with Orion harpooning them into each other. There is also something else that you can do if you can corner one of these guys in a obviously a corner. So let's just try it out for a second. And it's infinitely Orion harpoon into a launcher just like the God of War 1 Medusa but except this time you don't have uh, the normal Orion harpoon. It is the one that launches them forward. So what you want to do is, of course, if you have them up against a wall, after the Orion Harpoon, after pressing circle, hold triangle right now, so that Kratos gets this out. And then circle again and hold triangle again. Then again. You kind of, you can kind of loop it. You can do this with a lot of enemies, like the Minotaurs, the Satyrs, everyone that has this kind of grab, you can do it against the wall easily. So, yeah, just thought I might include it in here. There's also another trick, and it's the false grab that causes them to do the beam, but... I'm going to talk about this in a whole other uh, category in this video, so just stay tuned. 
Now, next up with the Minotaur, the air grab is not like God of War 1 where they bounce back out. See, they stay down and uh, it kind of stays there, but... There are other stuff that can be very good with the Minotaurs in God of War 2 and is that they are kind of flexible to launch us. See, when they're down, you can always launch them. They're not like God of War 1 where they always block or, you know, they get armor when they're down or stuff. You can launch them at, frankly, any point uh, that you want, except for there. I got blocked, but yeah, see, I'm always going to block, uh, launch them. Sorry. See? Pretty easy stuff. So, other than be the ability to always launch them, they also have a pretty, pretty nice Orion Harpoon that I'm going to explain right now. And it's one you've seen me use, of course, a lot, this one. In the Theseus fight, you really want to keep on Orion Harpooning these Minotaurs to death. Because you can align them both perfectly in front of each other. And it's, it gets pretty easy, especially when they first spawn. Minotaurs are a big enemy that you can easily uh, hit, a, hit them with a full collision from a Orion Harpoon. And of course, grabbing them gives health, but I'm not willing to, to showcase it right now, so... Yeah. Hades Minotaurs. These are actually one of my favorite enemies for when it comes to design and attacks, because the attacks are beautifully the telegraphed, kind of. And I love beautifully telegraphed attacks. These guys, you just want to wail at them for until they're dead, because they are actually very fucking dangerous, and I can't, I can't stress how much. And again, with these guys, the weakness is something that is going to come up later in this video. And it's a whole other category, but just know that it's a false grab again. See this? You can always cancel him out of his animations. Boom. Doesn't matter if he's doing the any other different. Like this one, you can ring him out of it by just grabbing him. I know you can't grab him, but yeah, you can just easily do the thing with him. And these guys are not launchable, so you want to use the hammer more a little bit. So <laughs> more a little bit. Wow, what a word. And uh, that's about it with these guys. I can't really give you any more tips, but just know that they're fucking dangerous. But the attacks are beautifully telegraphed, so I mean, what? There are reasons why they're this good, so. Yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. Next enemy, we have the High Priest of the fucking Fates. Now, how to deal with this guy is actually pretty clear and stuff, but you can grab him. And you're not going to get interrupted. It's not like the satyr scrap that people can kick you out of it. You can do this into an Orion Harpoon that can do some decent damage to him. And then grab him again until he's dead. Or you can follow up to the air with him. But I just killed him. You can follow up to the air with him and grab him in the air. But really the best thing is something I learned from Haristos. And it's completely just wrecking his ass with the hammer and Kronos Rage. It is a pretty, it is a pretty nice combo. Like You can't, you can't uh, not admit that. See, like, he, he's spawning enemies, son of a bitch. Who told you to do that? Anyways, what you want to do is have the hammer equipped, grab him, launch yourself with him, triangle Chronos Rage, and then in the ground, just fuck him up. See, I have, everything is maxed out in here, so it's kind of problematic to showcase anything, but what you want to do is, after grabbing him, you know, when you ascend with him into the air, you do triangle and then L2, and then triangle, triangle, L2, triangle, triangle l2 this until he's dead see how he's kind of on the ground and he's dancing like a fucking dead fish that just got out of water this is the animation that you want see you're kind of chaining him into stuff and this happens with level one chronos rage as well so make sure to use it to your advantage and it can be very good so let's move on to the next enemy this guy is fucking annoying and you want to target him especially in the translator like you want to target these guys because they can spawn enemies even off screen and i fucking hate what they do it's like look who asked who fucking asked now with every cyclops my main strategy is welling at them with the hammer of course and trick between these attack trick attack trick attack trick this is the enforcer i think and he has that thing in his hand that club that he can swing around whenever you want now, other than petrification being a really nice tool, although you get it way later and you don't really face off against a lot of Cyclops after getting the the Uriel head, I truly believe we should have gotten the Uriel head way earlier and stuff, but it is what it is. Anyways, with this guy, you want to trick. You want to be up in his face and you just want to be constantly tricking his attacks because, you know, his attacks are not blockable. And this tricking is a blessing because look, look at what happens if you block. You're getting fucked. You want to just uh, trick instead of blocking, of course. So that's what you want to do against every single uh, Cyclops. And of course, tricking in the air is just holding L2. But don't shoot. The moment you shoot, your iframes are gone. But 
Yeah, you get the point from here on. Don't need for me to explain it for you anymore. So, yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. I felt like skipping the other Cyclops because they're literally the same example of just be in their face, keep on attacking, and keep on just tricking whenever they try to attack. And yeah, with this guy, is the, the thing is why I'm not willing to explain what happens with this guy is when you meet him, I think you meet him only once in the game. He has puppies with him. Actually, let me demonstrate it way better. In the campaign, when you meet him, you meet him with some puppies, and you can easily abuse his ass with these puppies if you just shoot them towards his ass. Just like God of War 3 servers, but way easier. Look at his health pool. He's gonna get fucking wrecked in a second. Uh, it's about what you wanna do. Just full collision his ass until he's dead. He does not have as much health as God of War 3's servers. Actually, not even close. And he's dead. I think one more kick and he's dead. I'm gonna showcase it with the other dog. That's the one time you meet him, and that's the trick. He does not have a lot of health, and you can you can kill him even without the grab. It's not like Chimera. See, I just killed him without grabbing him, not even once. So yeah, just shoot the dogs and just use some full collisions against them. It's the easiest thing ever, so let's move on to the next enemy. Other than that, then you know the drill. It's just barbarian hammer shenanigans and nothing more, so no need to explain any more of this guy, really. And, of course, the seeds that he lets out, these dogs, they don't really... He doesn't even act, he's not a breeder where he gives you seeds that can transform into Cerberus later on, so no need to really panic with him. So yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. The next enemy we have the Cerberus breeder. Now these guys uh, spawn breeders, and what you want to do is either alternate Orion Harpoon for a nice full collision, and see how he shrinked back there? That shrink is a glitch with the game, and when they shrink like that, they don't take damage, and it can be very dangerous. Now, they have multiple grabs, and they can be good to give you rage orbs, as I just demonstrated. But really, what, something really important that you want to know is that, the, see when you shrink back there? He does not take damage when he shrinks, so do watch out. And the fireballs have better reach. They're not, they're actually coming towards you instantly, and they're much easier to hit you, so there is that. See when he shrinks? I can't damage him. Anyways, he summons little puppies, and what you want to do is, of course, abuse them for full collisions, as I demonstrate right here. So, it is the stuff of life, as, as you can probably easily see, and he's dead. That's about the only tips that I can give about him. And you cannot bounce him like God of War 1 servers, so there's also that. But good thing that these puppies score a full collision when you throw them. Or you can even go for the uh, alternate Orion Harpoon shenanigans like this. Next up, we have the Titan Minotaurs, and I'm not going to explain how to fight him in the in the combat arena right now. Obviously, you want to just keep your distance with him and just attack him with these damaging attacks, and you don't want to take damage, yada, yada, yada. I'm just going to showcase something on the screen whenever I get to it, and it's attacking him with uh, in his sleep spots, because you, you, you fight this guy three times, two of which can be broken easily with, with sleep spots. And the other is an exploit that I'm not going to exp uh, explain right here. It's in the facts video. So this is a combat guide and not a, hey, you can skip this boss fights uh, phase if you do this and that. So yeah, I just wanted to explain. Other than that, of course, the hammer is the way to go. Because look at what you do with the fucking hammer. This thing fucking wrecks this guy's ass. And uh, that, that, that's about it for the God of War 2 enemies. I think, I, I'm pretty sure we're done. This is the last enemy that I'm going to have to explain for God of War 2. And uh, let's move on to God of War 3's enemies right now. Here we are at God of War 3, and of course, with this thing, of course, Archer, you just want to shoot them like this, because they come in a bulk, and they're kind of come in a... They're, not, they're never really alone, and when they're alone, you know what to do. Like, the strategy is obviously just grab them, because one grab kills. Next enemy, we have the... Olympus feed that you only meet twice in the game and you can redirect his Orion Harpoon as I explained in full detail a couple of minutes ago Anyways, uh, you can actually redirect the arches as well, but there's no slam effect. So there's nothing to it. So yeah Anyways with the Olympus fiends what you want to do is of course grab them on the ground and then mash circle to get the Orion Harpoon Because you have iframes you have perfectly set up iframes and you can use it to your advantage and uh it's about it for the Olympus Fiend as well, because nothing more that I can really explain for it. You can grab it, and it's pretty easy to grab. And Yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. The next enemy being the Bronze Talos. Now, these guys might have a visual on their uh, body where they turn yellow. See, like, you might think, okay, I got him way too yellow for now. He's about to bust to his next uh, phase, right? 
I'd like to inform you that this is just a this is just a visual thing. Like you might think, hey, I'm gonna fuck now. I'm gonna have to build up all of his uh, overheating thing all over again. Well, no, as you can see, just a couple of shots gonna build them up again. To hold on, let me just demonstrate it. Like when you get him here, it's just a one-time HP. Like you can really fuck him up pretty bad if you want to. It's not. It's not. It it does seem like it's visual, but as you can see, see how he knocked him out so fast back there. It seems like, hey, you're going to have to overheat him all over again, but it's really not. See, like, he's he's getting broken way before the overheating shit goes on. With these guys, of course, you want to use your most damaging tools, and you know you know what tool are your is your most damaging one. And, of course, grab him at the end because he has a lot of health and he can be problematic. So, yeah, basically, uh, it's, a, it's just a grunt that you want to use a lot of damaging tools against. Nothing more that I can add. Although one more thing is that you can lure one in so that he attacks off screen and then you can be busy with uh, with another enemy if you can be smart about this thing. Like he's going to stay off screen and he's going to keep on taunting and stuff. That is one thing that I need to explain. And thank god I didn't forget it. He's off screen right now and I'm attacking. See if he runs towards you again just go ahead and get busy with the other enemy on, that is on screen on the other side if you kind of have your setup ready and stuff. Just, to start, just something that I wanted to drop over here. Let's move on to the next enemy. Stone Talos are the same except uh, weaker than the Bronze Talos. See, uh, you can you can pretty easily wreck the asses, and they're they're sweethearts, just like the the Hades Juggernauts from God of War 2. So yeah, they, again, use your damaging tools, use everything you have in the arsenal, and they can be taken out way easier than the Bronze Talos. Next up, we have the Centaur General. Now, don't stand behind him because he has a pretty cute attack that can fuck you up if you're behind him, and it's this one. And uh, whenever he rushes, you can make him kind of hit the wall if you dodge to the side like this. Anyways, with this guy, you want to plume. You want to plume to infinity and beyond because it can be helpful. See, I know he blocked back there, but pluming is really the best thing against them. It kind of sub subdues them, and then you can go back to action and just destroy them with other options. But you can even ride them if, you're, uh, if your balance is good enough. Hold on, let me just please allow me to ride your ass. Not literally, but you know. Anyways, you get that point. With infinite torturous rage, you can do a lot of stuff, but it's about it with the with the general. It's just it's just wail at him with with some plumes at the start to set up and then some attacks. Back off. More plumes. That's all that I can give you really. And just grab him because he can give you, he can be very fucking annoying. Yeah. Now, the Cerberus Mongrel can be very fucking important for most spots. I mean, the game conveniently puts him in spots where you can use him. Now, we all know that you can easily damage him, and I just fucking failed. I thought it's Smashing Circle, but no. We all know that you can control him and destroy enemies with him with Square, right? But Triangle, Triangle is this flamethrower move that he does. Now, the thing is about this, you can turn the analog to the opposite side, like Triangle, and then I'm moving it to the left, and then Triangle again, and Kratos does this with him. Now this still counts as one attack, mind you, it's not two attacks. You can perfectly wreck a lot of enemies from both sides. And hell, this fire is flexible, like it sometimes hits enemies behind it as well, like even like this. So go ahead and do that, like it, one triangle is not enough. I know you can get him with, uh, you can get him to do the fire with one triangle if you press it once. Just uh, move the analog, the left analog to behind you and you can easily do it again and it counts as one attack. And it's, it's very good. You can wreck a lot of enemies with this. Look at this. The square is also good and it does a lot of damage, but I prefer this one. So yeah. Stuff against the Hades servers reader are pretty clear. So when, he's, when he goes for spawning his things, these guys don't transform, which is good. You want to easily just shoot them and then buffer a, lo uh, a dodge after. Like while the grab is happening, just hold the analog to the right or left because these guys can explode. Now the thing is, throwing these uh, puppies at him, I think it does 20 damage, I'm not sure, I think it's either 20 or 30. It is the most damaging collision in the game, so you can use it to your advantage, it's pretty good, I think it does 20 damage, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and yeah, it is the best thing that you can do against them, like, other than, you know, taunt provocation, but that's really for the boss fight, so there is that, because his taunt takes way too long, because look, it allows you to cook an attack, to cook a spirit from, like, boom, just like that. And uh, it allows you to kind of destroy him most of the time, but mostly the strategy is throwing his own puppies at him and just taking it easy with him. So yeah. 
Right now we have my favorite enemy in all of God of War, so you know how the thing goes. Uh, these guys can be pretty easily broken with plumes and any kind of slam really, so the Tartarus Rage does some nice job to it. So Even the first, the bravery, see, it kind of knocks him back if he's caught in it like this. It can be very good to damage him, and that's about it for the first phase. Now the second phase, you can destroy his ass. After the grab instantly, you can go for a for a bravery for a full combo bravery and then you can even ride him with the tartarus rage as is demonstrated right here although it doesn't last for long but what i'm doing is holding l1 and triangle in the air and kratos just destroys him you can balance yourself pretty well over him if you can be really uh cash you know passive with it i guess i don't know but it it is possible so see he sometimes approaches forward then you can destroy him in the air Anyways, after grabbing him, in comes the most uh, annoying, really, stage. And I'm going to explain some stuff about that stage. Uh, so, with this stage, you, what you want to do is... Hold on, let me just demonstrate it at the start. Again, triangle, square... Or actually, let's just explain some other stuff. When he does that flamethrower fire... Triangle, and then the full square into another triangle catches him pretty nicely. If you ever see him stagger with the triangle, like if you catch him off guard with this, you know, after he does the fire. Just do the fire. Triangles every square combo until you use the last triangle and do it again. That's basically what you want to do against him with that because it is the most damaging thing. And even on level 1, you can do a triangle and I guess 4 squares into the spirit at the end. Now let me show you something else in his launch. See, see sometimes his launch, uh, it reaches even when he's out of range, so... I just want to demonstrate it. It doesn't seem to want to do it, so do it. Anyway, so let me just explain it. Like, he has a lunge attack that he does, and it can be very deadly. Sometimes you might think he doesn't reach. Well, he gains an extra little bit of momentum just to hit you, and it can be very shitty when it happens. Just a heads up. So, yeah, and uh, this is the best thing against him. See, he's going to dodge to the left, and then you're going to hit him with this. But I, I, he's pretty low on health right now. You hit him once with this after the fire happens. You can even do the Tartarus Rage, but this is actually much better. So when he when he goes for the fire, you can do the Tartarus Rage, which is good. But the much better option would be the just fly over the fire, boom. And then hit him with a full square combo. He gets right into your spirit and you can easily wreck him. Make sure to use it against every Chimera you face because it is the best thing. And he dodges a lot in this last stage. So let's move on to the next enemy. This next thing is a thing with every Cyclops and is that how easily you can ride them. And by ride, I mean just staying on top of them with the Tartarus Rage. Now, it, it can be pretty easy as I'm going to demonstrate. You just need to balance yourself over his head like this. See, I'm going to stay over his head. He's just very tall and your, your jump luckily reaches. See, that's 25 hits. Luckily, your jump reaches over him where you can balance yourself on top of him and wreck him like just as I'm, how I'm demonstrating right now. Your jump, unlike the centaur, reaches on top of him. And you can kind of balance yourself. You kind of do this in the air. You just kind of keep on turning around his uh, heads. Like, balance yourself. Whenever you see yourself falling from one side, just go ahead and go to the uh, opposite side. And you can easily just wreck him. Again, I'm holding L1 and triangle in the air. And this is what's happening. Kratos does this Beyblade move. It is basically pretty good against this uh, Cyclops. And any Cyclops, really, that you can even do the Orion Harpoon infinitely on them. But it can be risky because it is what it is. I mean, you know how Orion Harpoon works. Not Orion Harpoon, sorry. This is the Hyperion Ram. Uh, yeah. This is a very good thing against every Cyclops. Other than that, you know the strat against them. And it's that Plumes kind of makes them really behave. And it makes them go easy about stuff. But even with that, I want to take it to a next level with you guys. And it's the bow. Just hit him with a plume. Give him nearly five bows. And then another plume. And then bows. This can be some really nice damage output, but don't get way too greedy with the bow because sometimes you can really, really get greedy and just kind of overdo it. You, you're going to go, okay, come on, he's very low. I want to hit him with 10 more arrows, and then he just catches you slipping. So that is that. Just do this and don't give him a lot of arrows. Just five arrows max. Don't give a lot more. Because see, sometimes I was about to get hit back there, but I didn't. That is much better than just going around and doing the plume only. While, while it does work, it, it's just going to take lo a longer time. It's not going to be a fun time. So yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. Something I want to quickly note about the Cyclops Berserker. And is that 
you can of course i'm not going to talk about this again I, I just explained how you can balance yourself on top of a cyclops uh but the thing is that i want to explain is that the grab uh that you that you do against him is time is not uh time based it's it's attack based so even if you take for if you stay for way too long and do less attacks it doesn't matter it's just the amount of attacks that you do that makes you reach a certain point where the cyclops tries to put you down or when you know you start killing the cyclops so I, that is just one thing I needed to drop and what are those? What are those? What the hell? That was about it for the Cyclops Berserker and it's the same for the Cyclops Remains. Let's move on to the Olympus Sentry. Actually, no need to, to move on for the Olympus Sentry. Let me just explain it here. Any of these enemies. Anytime you get the circle on top, do the batter and grab and destroy enemies around you. That is literally the best option that you can do. And uh, let me just uh, showcase something simple about the duality of men. You see, the air grab against these, normal, these uh, normal Olympus sentries, I'm sorry. Against normal Olympus sentries, you, you can uh, do something that keeps them bouncing. And it's in the air. If you grab them, they keep on bouncing back up for you to attack. Like, see, I'm, I keep my approach until like I can grab them again. Except with these guys, they lose the bounce effect. See, they stick to the ground. So if you want to keep them back up, you want to just do, do an attack that bounces them back up, as I'm demonstrating. Wow. Anyways, yeah, you, you want to do an attack that bounces them back up, and it is, uh, it is not that hard. It's just that they lose the bounce effect. And it happens with, and again, you get them to the circle and use battering ramp to wreck enemies around you. It is uh, pretty simple stuff. And again, it is a thing with everything. It's like even a Ryan Harpoon. See how this guy's going to keep on bouncing back up? Doesn't matter how many times I do it. Well, this guy loses his bounce effect, leading to him staying on the ground. So you're going to have to launch him again, even though you don't really need a Ryan Harpoon in God of War 3. But I'm going to have to explain it every time I get to it. Come on. And having these guys in any arena is a blessing. And God of War 3 has a lot of them, which is good. God of War 3 has a lot of normal goons in encounters. It's just like God of War. God of War 3, sorry, has a lot of normal goons in encounters. It's exactly like God of War 1. It is a it is an exact copy because it has a lot of them. It's very fucking good. So uh, yeah, just go ahead and do that. And these guys are bounceable with the plume. Don't get the wrong idea. You've seen me back there do the thing. And uh, by the way, if you hold triangle with this, you get the slow motion instead of just a normal thing. But I just want to drop it. These guys do bounce back up with a plume. It's just that when whenever they issue their attack, they have armor. See, otherwise they do uh, bounce up. It's just. Back there, it was just an unlucky thing. Like, like I did it while they were trying to do his... This guy was trying to do his attack, and I was trying to plume. See, that's why he didn't get the, the bounce effect. Now, let's move on to the next couple of enemies. Now, with the Harpies, I did explain in full detail how you can alternate Orion Harpoon them, just like God of War 2, but the, the, real, the reality of the thing is that it's no use, really. In God of War 3, collisions do not scale with difficulty, so there is absolutely no use to really go for the far lengths of just, hey, I'm going to try to alternate Orion Harp on this guy. C is good. It causes hazards. It is the only 360 toss in God of War 3, which is a tragedy that the 360 toss got removed like this, but it's still good. See, it causes a lot of stirs and, uh, and a lot of hazards in the, in the encounters, but overall, you want to grab them because they have the mutilation that gives 10 orbs, so... That is about the only important thing with them. Like, they're not really viable. They they got hella nerfed in God of War 3, and there's nothing more to them, really. It's just ground grabs and air grabs. And now that you have Hyperion Ram, of course, you can Hyperion yourself up to them. And it makes things a lot easier, so, yeah. Gorgons, just like God of War 2, have the same thing where you want to grab them, and they go for the petrification, and you can easily abuse it. So, grab, they go for the petrification. It is going to be something else that I'm going to explain in full length in just a couple of minutes after I'm done with this category of the combat guide. But just know that you can do that and it's very good. And there, the, the Orion Harpoon stayed the same in here. See, like, boom, boom, boom. You can keep on looping it. Especially in here that you have walls. In God of War 3, I'm, it, is, it is not worth explaining really, but just know that walls exist and they do somewhat damage the enemy. And, uh, yeah, it's about it. And it's very good for Orion Harpoon, so you can instantly, you can constantly, sorry, do the thing with them, and it's very fucking good, so. Yeah, and I just failed this for the first time in my life. Because I've never grabbed this thing on the ground in God of War 3. I always go for the false grab. By the way, false grab, as I just explained it, 
it is the one where you grab an enemy that is ungrabbable. So, yeah. Let's move on to the next enemy. Now, the Gorgon Serpent is not one that you can really do the false grab on and get a good reaction out of her. She has no reaction, but the best thing can really be this, uh, where, you know, it's simply just, you can get her in a juggle state, and this flash is also, uh, parryable with the Golden Fleas, that you can, can easily freeze every surrounding enemy with it, and it's good, and don't go for the, uh, for the Orion Harpoon, even though it looks fancy, like, it's a, it doesn't even damage anyone in here that sh where she just dropped, so there's also that. All you can do is really parry her beam and grab her at the end because the grab animation for her freezes all the surrounding enemies and it can be very, very fucking good, so make sure to absolutely grab the Gorgon Serpent. It's not like the... It's not like the... The normal Gorgons where you just grab them and get magic orbs. No, this one actually freezes everyone around you, so... I mean, while I'm at it, actually, let me just demonstrate it. The grab also looks very, very fucking nice, so. Yeah, Kratos takes the head and freezes every surrounding enemy. Wish we kept this head instead of... It is what it is. Look at this. This, this, this is a tragedy that we don't have this. Look at the snakes. Snake! Snake! Scorpion spawns. These guys come in groups and they're dangerous. The attacks are annoying. Just grab them and kill them. This right here is a thing with every Minotaur. Just use the buffered launcher. It can be very good. And then, you know, you know the strat with the Minotaurs. Just you launch him, you Orion Harpoon him, and do your damaging stuff on him. So doesn't matter what damaging tool you use. Just make sure to use it to the to its fullest. Just if you're doing a uh, no upgrade round plus and you're you're at the start of the Hades section. Just do this into bow, and then just basically repeat it. Boom. Orion Harpoon makes their horns stuck to the ground. Remember this. It is very important. So, this is a, this is the thing with every single uh, Minotaur. It's not just this Minotaur that I'm fighting right now. Also, actually, one more thing that I want to explain about it. Now that I did that stupid combo with the Orion Harpoon with the Hyperion Ram. Whenever they do this, just uh, grapple them like that, and and it easily cancels them out. If you're if you're really scared to wait for them, you know where they approach you, block you, do the buffer launcher. There is a much easier strat, and it's that just high premium ram them whenever they go for this. Like whenever he, hold on. Actually, I think it works even whenever he's charging his thing. So let's just test it out. Boom. Yeah, it instantly cancels him out of his stupid animation. It it can be very safe like this. Boom. Again, this works with every single uh, Minotaur. Actually, while I'm at it, I just remember something I saw in a Haristos video. Wall splats can be very good against the Minotaurs in the in the gauntlet near the end in God of War 3. It's just you plume them in sideways and stuff, but I don't think I need to explain it because it's, it's not really something that you're gonna uh, learn in this video a lot, but let me just demonstrate it just for the sake of the guide like if you have a minotaur up against a wall let me just demonstrate it you plume he hits the wall plume again he hits the wall plume again he hits the wall plume see the wall splat is doing 10 damage if i'm not mistaken it's either 10 or 5 but yeah he's you kind of damage you hit him away and then the plume has to hit him and he gets sent back to the wall until you get the circle and of course, the last tip about the Minotaur, thank god I, remind, I got reminded, is that he gives you health orbs. That is something I explained in the grabs, but felt like explaining again. So yeah, let's move on to the next couple of enemies. The dogs, you just want to kick them to other dogs. Nothing really that personal, kid. The satyrs. The satyrs are a very, very interesting thing to talk about right now. So, strap up. You can grab them everywhere, but the grab is dangerous. The ground grab, you can kill them with three ground grabs since they have 300 HP. Every uh, ground grab does 100 damage, and that is literally the best thing you can do if you're left alone with a satyr. Uh, move away from that attack. All right. That is the best thing that you can do. Now, the air grab and the Orion Harpoon does 50 damage against them. And here's I just killed them with three grabs instead of what is it? Like, I think eight grabs in God of War 1 takes them out. I don't know. It's just a lot. Anyways, the Orion Harpoon does 50 damage. No, kick me out of it, please. Thank you for the headbutt. Boom. And that's 50. And uh, I'm, I'm not willing to do this whole thing again. Same thing with the air grab that I just wanted to explain. 
The air grab does 50 damage. Boom, it's the same beautiful grab from the other games. And of course, the wake up attack can be abused. Like when he wakes up, you want to launch him. So stuff that you basically know. Except this guy can also break out and dodge a lot like a fucking... It is what it is. So yeah, if you want to do air grabs, they can take him out pretty easily. But they just take a little bit longer than uh, the ground grab. Or, you know, Orion Harpoon is the same as the air grab. It still does 50 damage, but yeah. Or if you want to do the floor grab, the ground grab, and it's much faster, but it is risky because they can kick you out of it, so. There is that. Olympus Guardians. To make them behave, this and the other yellow ones, is to just hit them with, uh, with your average normal blade. Like, even if you plume them, just to kind of keep them in place. I'm sorry, uh, I'm back. In, anyways, attacking them with the with normal weapons does not really damage them, so there's that. And I did discuss this strat that makes them way easier, you know, when I switch to the Cestus after dropping a plume on him. See, it even keeps them behaved like this, they stay and they don't attack. And then you can easily just do this, switch to the Cestus, and they're broken. So there is that that you can use to your advantage. Other than that, really, there is the pokes that I explained. That can be a nice weakness against them. So like, boom. It's a nice little poke from afar that takes out their shields and you can use it to your advantage, so why not use it? Boom. The Siren Seductress, you can infinitely air grab her in the ear and it's pretty easily from there on. When she gets the circle, you can uh, grab her, of course, and then again launch her one more time. Boom. And infinitely air grab her. Please. Boom. Yeah, you can infinitely air grab her in the ear is what I'm trying to say. And it's done. It gives you magic orbs. Even when she's in the air, you can easily grapple onto her and then grab her after the grapple. So there's also that. Like, if you catch her in the air, you can sometimes do this and then grab her. If she uh, splashed to a wall. Because she does fly away, kind of. The next and last enemy is the Wraith. Now, the Wraith has something pretty special and I'm going to teach you right now. Uh, shooting her with an arrow makes her go underground. Which can be very easy when you grapple her out and you can infinitely Orion Harpoon her. See how everything works together with the Wraith? It is very flexible and you can easily Orion Harpoon it. There's no bugs, no glitches, no nothing. Also, you can grab her everywhere on the ground. Orion Harpoons, air grabs, you can ha it can happen everywhere. But just know that this is very important. Just shoot her with one arrow. She uh, kind of retreats and goes on the ground. And you can easily use that to your own advantage. Yeah, that's about it for God with three enemies as well. We are finally done with every with the enemy wiki that I decided to drop on this video. Uh, we are going to move on to the next category right now. We're kind of nearing the end, but it's still a lot of stuff to cover. So bear with me here, and I hope I've been doing a good job to educate you on this game. These games, combat. This is really taking a long time, and I'm starting to get really, really tired. I've been recording for three days. So I hope this helps and I hope you subscribe and I hope you play these games forever after, I don't know. <laughs> Next up I want to talk about something uh, pretty simple and it's Wake Up Shenanigans. Now, the title might be iffy but I don't, I couldn't really find anything else and yeah, let's get through it. So what are Wake Up Shenanigans in God of War? It's, this is especially prevalent in God of War 1 and it's the most important in God of War 1 as well. So pay close attention. So. I'm gonna knock this uh, legionnaire down and see what happens when he's down and I attack him. Did you see that wake up attack that he did? Now this is not in every God of War and it's not uh, really with every enemy in God of War 1. This is uh, specific to some enemies that, in that are in God of War 1, see that wake up attack? Now why is this important? It is important to know when to attack, like if he's still in a juggle state, like I know, like I can do this anytime, I, I kind of have it memorized. And here I attack him and he doesn't do the wake up attack. Like you gotta, it's kind of, it kind of comes with the muscle memory that you want to have in these situations to really deal with these types of stuff. Now that is the legionnaire, you know, if you, if you don't know when to attack him, if you attack him way too early, you can be good. You can keep him in the juggle state as you saw back there where I instantly Orion harpooned him. Or maybe you attack him way too late where he's starting to stand up. Now that is the important part of this whole wake up shenanigan that I'm trying to explain right here. Let's take for example a minotaur. Now some enemies don't have wake up attacks. What they do is block if you keep on attacking. Like this guy is on the ground. I attack him. See? He's, he wakes up with a block. That's, that's literally what he has to do and stuff. 
If I wait for him to wake up and then go for the launch, it can be way better. Like some enemies, for example, that the legionnaires. Uh, now that I don't have legionnaires, I can't showcase it to its fullest, but it is something prevalent in these games. Like, okay, now here I am back again, and let me just showcase it one more time just to kind of demonstrate to you guys. It's like this guy is in a juggle state. I can easily deal with him and what he's doing, but when I attack him now, he does the wake up attacks. Like whenever they're in neutral position while being down, that's exactly where you don't want to attack the enemies. Because they can get up and do a dangerous attack that is a wake up and you might not even see it coming. When they start trying to wake up is where you try to land your attack or maybe your uh, launch. It is the... Uh, it is not as complicated as you think. It is just about learning the enemy patterns. Like, see that guy's just trying to get up. Then it's safe to really launch him or do whatever with him. This can be way more important later on with the satyrs. And I have explained it with... Uh, in other categories while I'm, while I was doing this combat guide, how the satyr, you don't want to do the same thing. Like, you don't want to instantly start the launching sequence while he's down. Because he has the high chance of not getting launched. And it is basically the same thing with the legionnaires, is that... Except these guys are way too low right now. I'm going to actually showcase this with, uh, with the Gorgon as well. These guys can never die, I think. Pretty sure these guys... Okay. See how... As they're trying to stand up, then it's safe for me to launch them instead of just uh, initiating this while they're down. Because they might do the wake up attack. There are some enemies way more dangerous than the legionnaires. I'm going to explain it right now in just a second. Here's what happens if I try to launch this guy even as he's standing up. He does not get launched. He only gets launched after standing up. So like when he's in uh, his neutral position like this. I'm going to say one more time. Just wait, just wait for him to stand up. That's his wake up. And then you have the chance to launch him. Otherwise, if he's grounded like this, you can never really launch him. Except, see, he, this guy's wake up attack is different. He does not actually attack with his wake up. If you keep on attacking, he starts blocking. So, unlike the legionnaire, this guy starts blocking. And what you can do is nothing but hope for the best. I'm going to move on to the next enemy after this that is also very fucking important. That's another delayed block. The next enemy after this is very important for when it comes to wake up shenanigans and it's the gorgons now i did teach how you can infinitely air grab the gorgons right every gorgon you can even infinitely orion harpoon every gorgon right except for the medusa you know it is what it is you know you know you know the deal with that one it's a boss with the gorgons it's kind of tricky so as i just saw from this gorgon assassin i'm not sure with other enemies see she dodged while she was kind of perfectly in position and it kind of can be dangerous if she claps you with something. With the Gorgon, it's a whole other story. If she, if you wait for her to get on her feet... Hold on, let me just punish this. This is a nice Gorgon punish, by the way. And then you air grab her in the air. If you wait her... For, see? she How she dodged herself whenever she was trying to wake up. With the Gorgon, it's a whole other story than the Legionnaire. So you want to actually start your launching sequence when she's down. That is the safe time to do it. If you wait for her and take your time with her, she has a slight chance where she might want to dodge and attack you. If you're, if you're waiting for her to stand up, even though she doesn't have feet. It can be dangerous because she can do the little dodge that she did at the start and then attack you. I'm not getting it right now because God knows why, but don't try to really always go for the launch as she's trying to get up. Kind of bait her out at first because she can really, really do you in with that dodge that you just saw back there. Except way worse. So yeah, usually you want to launch her when she's down so that you can safely grab her infinitely in the air. That's about it with the Gorgon. The next one is of course the Seder. And I don't know if I showed it on the screen as far as of yet right now. But I am going to showcase it right now. The Seder, you want to start launching him as he's trying to get up. It's actually the same thing with the Punt. And if you want to use the home run technique against them when you know, you're know you fighting 11 Seders. It's much more advisable to launch them first and then go for the punt as they're trying to wake up. Because that is the safe time where you can actually punt them and then get them ready for the ring out uh, strat. This can happen with the satyr and it can be very dangerous. You're trying to punt them and they block and they go with their combos and stuff. It can be way more dangerous than you think. They can really clap you if there's two of them so... Best watch out with them and it's safe to just launch them so that you have a safe punt against them. Hell, even the strategy that I explained against satyrs earlier on in the video. It basically involves the same thing when I said launch them, do R1 and square and then launch them again as they're trying to wake up. It is basically another wake up shenanigan now. Just to kind of put it in the back of your mind. 
Now, there's something about this whole wake up shenanigan that I want to also touch on, and is that it's specific for God of War 1. Like, it, it does apply for God of War 2 and 3 as well, to some extent, with some enemies. Like, maybe the Minotaur, yeah, min the Minotaur in God of War 3, for example. You can try to launch him as he's down on the ground, and he, sometimes he might not agree with you, and he has armor, and he does not get launched. But if he's just trying to stand up on his feet, or maybe he just stood up on his feet, is that is the time that you really want to do your thing with him, and uh, that is the exact specific time where you can launch him safely. You know, he does not have armor, he does not have anything. So yeah, just a really cool little observation that I want, little cute observation that I wanted to do about God of War 1's enemies, and is that... You gotta pay attention to the wake up. With the legionnaires, they have wake up attacks. So you gotta kind of wait for them to kind of start wake, standing back up on their feet. That's when you want to attack or maybe launch or do whatever you want. With the satyr, it is the same thing. Do not attack them while they're down. They have armor. They cannot get launched. It's actually a thing for God of War 3 satyrs as well. If you want to keep on launching them, it is much more advisable to wait for them to at least seldom stand up on their feet. Then that's what you want to do. Then you want to, you know, launch them and stuff, but... It is just a thing with enemies. You gotta learn your enemies and uh, what they're what they're doing and when they stand up and when they just stay down and stuff. See, like the Gorgon is a whole other 360 than what I just talked about. You you want to launch her while she's down. You don't want to wait for her to get in her waking up animation. So yeah, we're done with this chapter. Let's move on to the next thing. The next thing I wanted to talk about is, of course, not, not nothing else than the the positioning that you need to do against enemies. What positioning is, is of course a lot of stuff that can happen, and I'm gonna demonstrate it in God of War 2, and you can kind of take the idea for every other game, and I'm gonna showcase it on the screen as well for God of War 1, 2, and 3. Let's go to God of War 2 for now. Now, what I meant with positioning is a lot of stuff actually, so let's go through some of them right now to, to kind of give you an idea on what I meant with uh, positioning. So, the basic idea is that you don't want to get sucked into enemies by attacking them. See, for example, these guys, what you want to do is uh, not do this where you've, you know, attack towards them. What you, like, you don't want to do this because they either start blocking or you get way too close. Maybe you're fighting a crowd of enemies and you don't want to get that really uh, dangerous with them. Of course, you all have tried this, but I just need to mention it and is that positioning is way more important than you think, so... Instead of attacking towards them, you attack a lot away and then turn around for the one attack that does a lot of damage. They can still be blocked sometimes, but it is much more important to kind of position yourself away from the enemies in some instances and not just face off against them. Like these guys, of course, I'm attacking away. I don't want to get sucked into their uh, battlefield right now. There's like billions of them in the battlefield and I don't want to get see like you don't want to attack into an enemy most of the time. So you get sucked into the crowd. And you might get kicked if you don't if you don't really uh, watch out for your for who's in front of you and stuff. So other than just you know the three triangles attack that we all know, so like this, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have tried this right before. This is a good thing to chip away at enemies, even in pain uh, or pain plus. You want to do this against heavy enemies when you don't have tools to fight them. You just attack away and kind of. Even your full square combo, you kind of attack away to turn around and do the finisher mostly. But other than that, we also have other weapons that can have the same thing. You see, the core of God of War is also about positioning and not just uh, fighting enemies. Like, if I go on for the full square combo on this guy, see what happens. You kind of hit him, and then he starts blocking at the end for a parry or for anything. It's like, it's not something that you want to do the entire time. And that is, you don't want to wail at an enemy for a whole ass combo. You kind of have to space out your shots and position yourself nicely. Like if I only had a square square triangle on him, like like normally for example, like this. See, he can either issue an attack or maybe... I'm, I'm just being... I'm sick right now, that's why I can't really talk that well. See, square square triangle in his face and what it gets me. What you want to do sometimes is hit him with one of the attacks but with the other. Or maybe after CC and block. So you kind of attack away and then you attack with them. That's the thing about positioning in God of War. And there's also other moves that are, you know, move, you know, position based that are way more important to kind of position yourself while doing them. For example, this attack, while not so viable, if you ever find yourself in a position that you want to do it, if you ever find yourself in a position that you want to do it, just go ahead, like maybe you just rolled away, roll backwards more and then turn around, see like this. 
you don't want to go do this and turn around instantly and do this one you want to kind of take a step forward and then turn around that is kind of the same thing that i'm going to explain with another attack right now and is the might of the king uh, fire or the shockwave that goes i have explained it before in full detail that you don't want to do this facing the enemy because a yes you might connect the attack but b the enemy might start an attack and hit you like this positioning is way more important than you think and i'm going to showcase it again with this attack how i'm attacking away and then i'm turning around like notice notice how i issue the attack while facing away from the enemy like this but the thing is with the th with attacks in god of war is that they have a lot of nice redirection i guess like with this one i can turn around at any point and just hit the enemy behind me like sometimes you want to avoid this one last hit that comes at you with an attack and then you do your attack like this did you see that if i attacked into him like this i would have gotten hit but what i did is that i dodged his attack like you know with this simple step forward because the enemy anticipates an attack forward see i dodged it again back there i know i'm getting hit but i'm trying to demonstrate how good it is our positioning thing like if he does the two attacks you can sometimes dodge the second attack like this see how i got away with that simple step and then i can turn around and hit him that's basically what you want to do to also not get close to crowds like if you have a crowd in front of you you don't want to be facing them and do this attack that can be dangerous see how i'm getting clapped sometimes you want to wait for them to do attacks i'm attacking away and then i'm turning around and then i'm just hitting them like this this is literally the idea of positioning same with this attack notice how i'm kind of going forward like this is how the attack is happening like i'm attacking triangle forward like this but what's what's the difference is that after he, kratos takes one step i turn him around it is the thing with positioning with every single uh attack really it's not just this one like sometimes you want to have this happening like where you hit the enemy like away boom and you can also have timing with your positioning it kind of teaches you about timing of your attack so sometimes you want to go like this you don't want to attack him boom striking out of nowhere when he's vulnerable when he's trying to attack like you don't want to you don't want to keep on your approach even while uh, the enemy is trying to attack you and they have armor so positioning kind of teaches you how uh the rules of the game work like maybe sometimes you just want the finisher to end for a half collision you know where he flies and gets launched uh, behind this kind of teaches you the fundamentals of the combat in most spots like the, it, it teaches you to not wail at an enemy with your attacks non-stop because see how he breaks out you want to kind of space out your hits know which attack to hit know which attack to not hit and it teaches you about these attacks like this one or this see I dodged the second attack with the second step like that and then I hit him. That was a perfect demonstration. I hope that was clear. It's about it for positioning. I just wanted to mention it. It's like, it's pretty clear with other attacks that carry inertia. Of course, this attack, the piercing shards in the air. You can, of course, you can keep on the momentum of going backwards, but attack behind you. It is very, very fucking good. As, as demonstrated right here. He, he even clapped me with that one, but... It is a pretty nice demonstration to have. Boom. Just like that. Positioning is very, very important. You don't want to be in the face of your enemy. The blades kind of show that to you. See how, how some of my attacks hit him and not every single attack. You're not meant to be in his face and do a sword-to-sword -sword battle like this. Even if you have a sword in hand, like, like the Blade of Olympus, you don't want to be just wailing at him like this, like crazy. You kind of want to space out your hits sometimes you want to face away for an attack to not hit because it can be your demise if you hit this attack for example it is different it varies and uh it can be different even for the blade of olympus i think it has this where you can kind of reposition yourself to hit him further like you kind of face away and then turn around it is iffy but it does carry the same spirit that these other weapons had so yeah it's, it's basically the same thing with this one as well like you want to Maybe this guy's chasing after you. You jump away and then turn around and the inertia carries you. Positioning teaches you a lot. It teaches you timing of your attacks. It teaches you which attack to touch the enemy with. See how I'm kind of even running away in some instances. Like this attack right here. You know, the, th the fourth square, this one. It kind of drives Kratos away from the enemy. So you want to hit him once, twice, thrice. Then move away. Boom, come back to clap like a bee. I don't know how Muhammad Ali puts it. I don't know. But it's just about positioning that teaches you a lot of things. I'm just going to call this section positioning. And it has a lot more stuff with it, Joe. So, uh, let's move on to the next thing.
I'm sorry, before I move on to the next thing, I know I just explained this only for God of War 2. Just know that it stands for every little God of War game out there. It's not just God of War 2. It's just that God of War 2 has the combat arena and it's it's way more simple with uh, God of War 2 where uh, it, a lot of the weapons, really, you have to care about positioning and it kind of teaches you the ways, the ropes to God of War. Like you want to do this instead of facing the enemy and doing it. Or you want to face away from the enemy and turn around and hit him with the fire maybe sometimes. Like this. Did you see how I dodged that attack by going a step forward? I, I'm not facing him and doing this. God of War 2 kind of demonstrate this, demonstrates this the nicest with uh, the attacks that it has. That's why I felt like doing this in God of War 2 and not 3 or 1. So, yeah. The other games are, of course, same thing with the blades. It's, same, it's the same action. So, yeah. Let's move on to the next chapter. We're nearing the end, thankfully. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to false grabs. Now, what are false grabs? See some enemies where you can't grab them, and you go for the grab, however, like this. Now, what is the importance of this? You might be saying, okay, Zesty, you cannot grab some enemies. So what, right? Well, there are a lot of uses to it, mainly just, you know, baiting enemies into whatever you want. Like, for example, the Minotaurs in God of War 1, you false grab them, and they go for this uh, thing where they try to attack you, but they... You know, you can block it perfectly on time. Now, this can be very nicely punishable, and it can be applied for a lot of enemies. I'm going to explain it further when we reach God of War 2, where this thing really, really shines. Anyways, and God of War 1, I guess the Minotaurs? Nearly every Minotaur. See how easy I could have uh, grabbed them back there? What I'm doing is grab, then block this, and then I attack from behind with this. It's, it's much more advisable to just hit him with this one. You know, attack this away and then hit him with the, with the bravery. This attack is called Bravery, by the way. So yeah, you kind of... You, you just know the weaknesses to some enemies. Some enemies, you false grab them and they punish you heavily. And we're going to get to that with the God of War 2 Legionnaire Captains. But for now, we're still on God of War 1. Anyways, this can be very useful to punish uh, some Minotaurs. Like, uh, I, it, doesn't kick the, it doesn't kick them out of every animation, but it can be viable. See, he was trying to do an attack and I... See? Sometimes they try to do something and you can cancel them out of it by grabbing them. But see, some attacks are not cancelable, so... Yeah, then you use your punish and just wreck them however you want, basically. It's just about it. And now if you grab them, of course, you know what happens now. We both know what happens if you grab them, so... Don't grab them. <laughs> Actually, this transition is good. I don't, I don't even need to cut the video because this video is going to be hell to edit, but... Let's try it on the, Gor on the Gorgons. Now, with the Gorgons, I don't know how this uh, thing works. I don't know if it's a consistent bait that you can use to your advantage, but I will try my best. So, in God of War 2 and 3, you can false grab a Gorgon and she, it, it is a 100% chance where she does the the beam. See this beam that she's doing? And in here, yeah, she's, she, she sometimes does the attack and see that time another attack, that one does an attack as well. So in God of War 1 is not consistent. I've seen them sometimes do the beam. Like they back off and they start doing the beam. See like right there. And you can punish it of course with uh, square square triangle and holding the triangle to launch them. By the way let me just teach you this real quick. What I'm doing is not square square hold triangle. This gives you Gretos doing this. What I'm doing is square square triangle and then I hold triangle right after. So what I'm doing is square square uh, triangle triangle. Triangle, I press triangle two times, like, once I only press it, the second time I press it, I hold it so that we get, we get this, basically. This can be a very nice punish to the Gorgons, as I've explained before. You can even punish the beam, like, if she's trying to beam you, hold on, let me just demonstrate. Come in, lats. Trick once, and then, uh, square, square, triangle, and hold the triangle. And I just died. <laughs> Again, this is only good to punish, uh, a single Gorgon, and not... A bulk of them. See now, now let's get back to the false grab. See how it's sometimes, I don't know. And you have to be time perfect with this one. Like, let me just demonstrate one. I want to demonstrate the punish. You roll away and then you do your thing so that you have full. Uh, you're not com easily frozen, you know. So it has to be kind of perfect to punish with this one. Square, square, triangle, and then hold triangle right after. You don't hold triangle after the plume lands. Although that can work as well. You, well, you want to hold plume, uh, triangle after you even input the triangle for the plume. Anyways, back to our subject. The false grabs. Now, 
as I demonstrated, the Gorgons are inconsistent. Like that time she does an attack. Another time she's doing an attack. The third time she does a beam. Let's just try it out again, actually. I think there's a formula built into her. Like every three times she does the beam, maybe. Let's do this. Oh, so it's, so it's completely inconsistent. But you still might get the beam sometimes if you want to. And I'm dead. I'm not. Yeah, that's about it for God of War uh, 1. You don't have a lot of false grab punishes. So I'm going to move on. To, wow. I'm going to move on to God of War 2 where it has one or two more false grab cases that are going to be very, very useful for you if you try them out in combat. So let's go to God of War 2. Now in God of War 2, it is a given that you false grab one of the Gorgons and you get the petrification. It is confirmed every time you do it. You go for the grab. She backs off and does the petrification beam. So... In here, it's 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 a confirmed thing, so there's nothing to worry about. There is no chance for her to do any attacks or anything. Any grab makes her go for the beam. So, this stands for every other Gorgon as well, Ashley. And you can kick her out of any animation, by the way. So, even if she's going for an attack, grab her and she backs off and does the beam. And this goes for every Gorgon. Let me just uh, demonstrate it with the, with the Assassin and the Queen, Medusa. Except uh, everyone does a different reaction, but it's still the petrification. So with the Gorgon Assassin, you get the you get the flash. This one basically that she just did. Let me just demonstrate it. False grab, and there she goes. She does the flash. Anyways, you can still punish it easily with this. So nothing to worry about there. And same thing with the Queen. The Queen does the the kind of petrification balls. It's, it's a small little petrification thing that does AoE damage. Basically, it's basically this one that she does this. And uh, let me just... I, I just learned that this thing fucking bounces enemies. I didn't know that. Damn. Alright. False grab. See what she goes with. And these are, of course... Uh, these can be returned with... By the way, these guys are the only ones that... The only Gorgons that don't get shattered with the triangle of the hammer. See, even at max level... What you want to do is L1 and triangle. So I just want to drop that here. Anyways, this has the same case where it is a confirm. It is a given. It doesn't matter when you grab her, where you grab her. She does the thing where she backs off and does the petrification thing. It doesn't matter uh, what attack animation she's doing. See? In God of War 2, it's confirmed. In God of War 1, it is a bit iffy. You don't know. Sometimes she might attack. So there is that. But in God of War 2, it's confirmed. And you can use, it to, use this to your advantage pretty well. So... Make sure to use it. There's also other enemies now. I really don't want to cut the video while editing, so <laughs> let's just move on. I think the Minotaur Grunt has the same reaction, or even the Erebus Minotaur has the same reaction. See, just like God of War 1, but I don't know how viable it is since, as you saw, see, I, I can't react in time. I'm holding L2 to trick and I can't do anything. I'm holding L1 and I can't block it, so I can't even roll away from it. So in here, it's not advisable to use it. You can do it. And it's the same reaction every single time. But it's useless since you can't really do anything. Now, speaking of Minotaurs. Good thing we spoke of Minotaurs. Because we have a whole new Minotaur in here. And this is one of my favorite designs for a Minotaur. He's just so, I don't know, so destructive. So, I don't know, wild and monstrous. I fucking love this design. Anyways. With this Minotaur, uh, he has a very nice false grab case. Where you can trick and go behind him and wreck him all you want. And it is very, very fucking good. Just grab him at any point. And what you want to do, you can block, but Kratos is going to parry. Now, this is not something you want. Maybe if you have small enemies around you, you can parry anytime you want, right? The main play here is against these guys. is a big weakness that they have with the full scraps. And is that you can get behind him and wreck him after that, but you have to trick through his uh, thing. Like, after full scrapping him, hold L2 and then get behind him and wreck him from behind. It's, it's the stuff of legend. It is so fucking good. Now, I demonstrated with this guy as the best as I can. It's just you can grab him at any point. Like, maybe if he's doing his long wind-up, uh, see this attack? Boom, this unblockable attack. I know you can trick through it and stuff, but grab him and then trick, and you, you interrupt him. Now, here's why that trick failed. I was holding the analog somewhere, and what Kratos does is, see, I'm, I might be pulling out the bow, but why I'm getting hit is because I'm moving and pressing L2. You can't do that. You gotta only press L2. In your place to get this animation. Same thing with the Uriel's hit. See? It's like that. And I did explain this type of tricking. Even though it's way too late now to explain it. But pretty sure I showcased it while I was explaining tricking. Anyways. It is much better where you can knock him out of his animation. And boom. Get behind him. Boom. 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 And he's dead. 
Now with the level 1 hammer, this can be very nice punished as well. And it's pretty much the way to deal with these guys. Just hit him uh, with this, trick through that, get behind him, fucking wreck his ass. As easy as that. This guy is getting demolished with Kratos. One more case I just want to try out right now. I, I'm just as uh, curious as you guys. Does this work against Erebus Minotaurs? Now these guys like to run towards you a lot. And I don't know if that's going to cancel them out of the animation. Like they got, they really like running towards you. Let's see. Do your thing. Do your thing. He's taunting. Come on. There it is. You can't cancel him, but again, just like the other Minotaur, it's sad that you cannot... Actually, hold up. Let me just turn off my infinite health. Let's just do an observation here with you guys. Now, now I don't know how this works. This is my first time trying it. I'm pretty sure that thing that he does does no damage. This? Oh, it does damage. I never thought this does damage. It's pretty god, I've seen it not do damage sometimes. I guess it's God of a 1, or maybe it's a whole other animation. But anyways, this is useless against these normal Minotaurs. You don't want to do that. But yeah, let's move on to the next enemy. Yes, there's actually one more enemy, I think, that we can false grab. And I'm mistaken. There's no other enemy. What I meant with next enemy is I'm pretty sure I meant with the Legionnaire Captains. These guys don't give a fuck. You false grab them and they, they grab you. They're like, how dare you grab me when you know I can grab you. See? Boom. He grabs you. Such a nice grab animation. Look at the Undertaker. It does cancel him out of his animations. Maybe if he's attacking, like, like let me demonstrate. Hold on. Boom. Bam. He instantly goes for the grab. You don't. You do not want to false grab this guy. It can be very iffy. So, yeah, that's about it. God of War 2 is consistent with the false grabs. So, especially the Gorgons is very important. And uh, yeah, I'm not gonna move on to God of War 3 because. Uh, in God of War 3, I, I can only recall them, the Gorgon's case, where you can grab them and they go for the grab. But then again, you can't do that with the Uriel knockoff, you know, the Gorgon Serpent in God of War 3. You can't do it with them. You can only, you can only do it with the normal Gorgons, like these fellas right here. They're, they're, I'm pretty sure these Gorgons exist in God of War 3. And same thing, you can just false grab them and they go for the petrification and it is it's so good, you can use it to your advantage. You meet these guys not not a lot in God of War uh, 3, but when you do, you can use them for your for your own advantage. So, there is that. I'm gonna leave this guide and I'm gonna finish it right now on the main menu of God of War 2. Oh my god! Lads, I'm gonna be real. I don't know how to finish this video. I don't know how to come up with a with an outro to this video. I just know that this video is gonna be long and it's gonna take long to edit. Just how it took long to record and long to write down this stuff. I'm pretty sure I missed some uh, intricate stuff here and there. Some important stuff maybe. But it is just a given when you're watching a channel like mine where I do miss some stuff sometimes. But... I'm only human and I can miss stuff, but I still hope this guide helped you. I hope it made you learn. And as you guys, I'm going to put on some encounters on the screen right now for you to kind of learn. Not learn, but just ha see how many. Now that you know what you know, you can you can see it in every encounter. What I use in my stuff, what Haristos uses in his stuff, what, what the professional players do in their uh, encounter approaching. I hope this guide helps you and I hope it finds you and uh, you learn from it and you go ahead and play these games infinitely because that's what they are infinite fun and challenge and uh, greatness I guess I did try to uh, do other stuff but I didn't want to you know you know I, I did try to record other videos and to make other videos uh, but I really wanted this combat guy to be pushed out there and I'm pretty sure this uh, nobody has made it this far but if you did and if you somehow was watching this whole entire time thank you so much and I hope you learned something and this is a video that you can always return to I'm gonna make sure to add chapters and stuff and then I'm gonna add the table of content in the description so that you can always skip to the part the specific part that you want and to, maybe you, you want something explained and of course, the chapters are going to help with that. So it's not going to be a video where you're going to sit down through and watch just like maybe a, a funny video of mine or whatever. Just it's a combat guide. So you know how it is. 
And now, before I finish the video, I want to say something about this video that you saw that you saw me mention at the start of the video. I advise you still watch that video because it might have one or two things for God of War 3, mainly the jet dash or maybe mainly some other stuff. But that is just something, uh, the, vid the whole video is useless right now. I'm going to tell you flat out the gate, just like I said in the start of the video. It is for it is for one-on-one -on -one scenarios. It's not very important, but you can also still watch it to learn extra stuff. It can still work like that. I even removed it from my uh, combat guide playlist because I really did not want to stir away your kind of your mind process about how to approach encounters in God of War. I didn't want to give you the wrong idea of, hey, style, 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 cancel, crazy, infinite magic, infinite items. And that's about it for the shittiest outro on YouTube. I hope you learned something in this guide. I hope it helps you and you return to these games and I hope they get ported to PS4 and PS5. With that, we come to the end of the guide. It has been your Extreme Gamer Zesty. Peace.